Hello, everyone, and welcome to Season 3 of the Focus Group Podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and we're kicking off 2023 by talking about 2024. I'm sorry. So I got to tell you, I was not planning on bringing the show back this early in the year, but I basically couldn't not tell you guys what I have been seeing in my focus groups since the 2022 midterms. Future episodes will drop on Saturdays per usual, but I couldn't wait to get this episode into the world. Now, ever since summer of 2022, basically around the January 6th committee, we noticed a real drop in enthusiasm for Trump's 2024 candidacy among voters who had just voted for him in the 2016 and 2020 general elections. And that phenomenon has accelerated since Trump and his gang of election deniers whiffed the 2022 midterms. So we're going to listen to a bunch of those kind of maybe Trumpers today. But I knew that there was still a cohort of Trump diehards out there. So we started to screen for two-time Trump voters who also viewed him very favorably. And those voters, they are partying like it is 2015. They still love Trump and no other GOP candidates are turning their heads. We're also going to hear from those voters today, the always Trumpers. But there was also this question that was nagging me. I wanted to know just how large this group of always Trumpers was, because the size of that number matters a great deal when assessing Trump's ongoing political viability, even at this moment of real weakness for the former president. But I couldn't get that number with focus groups. So to answer that question, I turned to today's guest, Whit Ayers, a Republican pollster who is the president of North Star Opinion Research. He just did an exclusive poll for the Bulwark on the 2024 Republican primary. Wit, thanks for being here. Sarah, great to be with you. So Wit, you are one of my favorite pollsters, and you've done a lot of survey work in order to understand Republican voters. And you did this cool thing that I've always liked, where you bucketed Republicans into three different camps, always Trump, maybe Trump, and never Trump. I just always found that framing really useful when thinking about the gradations of Trump voters. Can you just give us a quick primer on those buckets? Sure. We first came up with that in the middle of last year when you started seeing the same numbers pop up poll after poll. There's a never Trump contingent that is about 10 percent, maybe 12 percent, but really no more than that. We are small but mighty. Yes, yes, small but mighty. That's right. There is an always Trump contingent that in this latest poll looks like about 28 to 30 percent. These are people who believe that Donald Trump hung the moon, that they will walk through a wall of flame for him. You cannot criticize him with these people. Criticizing Donald Trump with the always Trump voters is like criticizing Jesus in a rural evangelical church. (laughs) You're not going to change the view about Jesus, but you're sure going to trash the reputation of the person who criticizes Jesus. And that's the situation you're facing with the always Trump group. But there is a larger group, a majority of the party now, that believes that they they liked his job in office, maybe not his behavior, but they liked his policies, but they just want somebody else, or at least they're open to somebody else. Now, keep in mind, these people would vote for Trump again over Biden if it were a two-way race in a general election. But they're skeptical that Donald Trump can win. And they also believe that he's too focused on the past rather than on the future. So they're open to somebody else. And the question is whether that somebody else can consolidate the roughly two thirds of the Republican electorate that is still open and still available to be persuaded. So I came to you because you'd done a poll previously that I had seen where you'd done this bucketing between the never Trump, always Trump, maybe Trump. And I kind of wanted to recreate that uh, now post midterms uh, because I really wanted to understand the always Trump number. And one of the ways we tried to get at this was to ask, you know, how many people would follow Trump on an independent 
run if he were to lose the Republican primary, but then go ahead and run as an independent. We were like, okay, that's a good way to to get to the diehards. And as you just noted, that was 28%. Is that the same number that you had before when you were looking at always Trump the last time you did the poll? Is that roughly the same? It's a little less. Uh, When we were looking at it before, we were placing it in the 30 to 40 percent range rather than the 28 percent that we see today. He's definitely weaker than he was before the midterms. The poor performance of the Republicans in the midterms really did a number on him and the perception that he is a winner and can bring winners along with him. So it is lower, but it is not insignificant at all. You know, if you've got a lock on 28 to 30 percent of Republican primary voters, that'll go a long way in a multi-candidate primary. Yeah, and we'll dig into that a little bit more because I I totally agree with you. Um, It is interesting to think that people who were always Trump have kind of, you know, moved away into maybe Trump, which sort of goes to the idea that this number is a snapshot in time and not necessarily where it will be always, which is, I think, important to keep in mind that this stuff is fluid. But you did a bigger poll for us. And one of the things that I think, you know, for the purposes of this show was interesting is how closely what you found in your polling reflected what we were seeing in the roughly 10 focus groups that we've done right. with the the sort of maybe Trumpers and the always Trumpers since the midterms. But can you just walk us through the top lines of the poll that you just did and some of the other findings? Sure, sure. First of all, let me say this was a national online survey of a thousand likely Republican primary and caucus voters. And it looks like what we know to be today's Republican Party. It's overwhelmingly white, 93 percent. 3% Hispanic, 2% Asian, 1% Black. There's more non-college voters in this sample, 57% than college graduates, 43%. And that's a function of the kinds of folks that Donald Trump has attracted into the Republican Party. 38% are evangelical Christians, 63% support the GOP more than Trump, 26% support Trump more than the GOP. But the key point here is that 85% of these people in the sample voted for Trump in 2020, 85%. 7% for Biden, 3% for a third-party candidate, 5% didn't vote or wouldn't say. So that's the sort of never Trump group somewhere around 10, 12 percent. But 85 percent of these folks voted for Trump. So we are talking about Trump voters and Trump supporters. Several key highlights. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis holds a substantial lead over Donald Trump on three different ballot tests. Trump is locked in consistently at 28 to 30 percent. So if it's just a two-way ballot, DeSantis leads Trump 52 to 30. Uh, The rest are undecided. Uh, On a three-way ballot, we did Trump, DeSantis, and another candidate. DeSantis has 44 in that, Trump 28 again. Uh, We did a 10-way ballot with DeSantis at 39, Trump 28, Mike Pence has nine, Nikki Haley and Liz Cheney 4% each, and five other candidates are at 1%. So you see a consistent Trump number throughout all three of those ballots. One interesting tidbit, Sarah, is that for those people who say they support the GOP more than Donald Trump, Mike Pence has overtaken Trump. He's still in second place. But I thought that was an interesting point from the crosstabs. You mentioned the 28 percent of Republican primary voters who, in a general election between DeSantis, Trump and Biden, would still vote for Trump. DeSantis would take 56% in that. uh, These are Republican primary voters. Trump would take 28. Biden would get five. And the rest are undecided. So DeSantis still gets a majority of those. But if you lose a quarter of the base vote, you've got a situation comparable to what we had in 1912 when former Republican President Teddy Roosevelt ran as a bull moose against Republican nominee William Howard Taft, and the Democratic nominee Woodrow Wilson split the Republican vote and ensured that Democrat Wilson would win the election. In order to try to get a sense of why people may be reluctant to support Trump, even though they supported him in the past, we did two different examples 
with a split sample. Half the sample got one, half the sample got the other. Donald Trump is the best candidate Republicans can nominate in 2024. That comes in at 35. I supported Donald Trump when he was president, but I don't think he can win the presidency in 2024, and I want a different nominee who can win is 52. And I did not support Donald Trump when he was president, and I did not want him to be the Republican nominee in 2024, was 13. So a majority to say they want a different nominee who can win. We asked that again, but the second option was a little bit different this time. We said, I supported Donald Trump when he was president, but he now seems focused on the past, and I want a nominee who's focused on the future. That gets 57%. We asked him an open-ended question, Sarah, about what doubts do you have here for a Trump candidacy in 2024? Now, a lot of the people who support Donald Trump more than the GOP said they had no doubts at all. (laughs) He was the best president we ever had and can't wait till he's back in the White House. But the other answers of the people who are looking somewhere else refer to his personal characteristics, not his policy positions or his record as president. So they talked about his behavior, his mouth, his age. He was too old. They thought maybe like like somebody younger who could serve two terms rather than one, that he's a loser, that he has baggage, and that he's too divisive. The the open-ended questions were really interesting just because they totally reflect what we hear from the focus group participants about why they think Trump is not electable. And that is, it's not that they dislike Trump. They're not even saying that they disagree with his behavior. They think other people disagree with his behavior. They think his baggage makes other people not vote for him. And so they have these concerns about his electability. I hear it all the time in the focus groups. Let's listen. I'd like to say flat out that I would vote for him because I do think that he does what he says he's going to do. But at this point, there's so many people that don't like him. And I have friends that have the same feelings that I do when it comes to politics, but they despise him. You know, and it's not because of what he did. They like what he did. They just don't like his attitude. You still got a lot of people holding on to the election was stolen and uh, blah, blah, blah. Maybe it was, but, you know, you can't move on until you let go of this. You know, if he was president, that'd be great because like, I like the policies. But honestly, I, I consider that he's lost the last three elections. I mean, midterms for him, whether or not he does a good job when he's in there, part of his role as leader of the party is getting others elected within the party. We lost a lot of seats in 2018, uh, 2020 he lost. Uh, a lot of his candidates that he endorsed lost the midterms. Don't get me wrong. I, I love Donald Trump and everything he stands for. But, I mean, you look at him and people just across the U.S., and even some Republicans, I mean, they just look at the guy and just discuss it by him for stupid reasons. I love Donald Trump, but I think DeSantis would be better for the country as a whole. If you ask people about the 2020 election and if they're sort of tired of hearing about it, they'll definitely say yes. As time's gone on, they've gotten more and more annoyed by Trump focusing on like looking back on 2020. But when they offer reasons, it often has to do much more with electability and their concerns that they don't think that Donald Trump can win. And one of the things that that I noticed, like when I saw the drop off begin to occur, it was during the January 6th committee, like prior to that, we had always had in any group of two-time Trump voters, you'd get at least half the group wanting Trump to run again. But during the January 6th committee is when we started to see groups with zero people, like multiple groups with zero people who wanted to run again. And that was really unusual. And it really raised some bells for us. I don't think it was the January 6th committee per se, because it wasn't like they were sitting there watching the January 6th committee hearings and being like, oh boy, Trump did some really bad things. I'm not going to vote for him anymore. It was raising the specter of this idea of Trump has too much baggage. But the other thing that was happening was the rise of Ron DeSantis. There was like this Ron DeSantis boomlet. And I feel like these maybe Trump people, it is both, they they don't think that Trump's necessarily electable, but they have somebody else that they do think is electable. Like, I think you and I would like it to be that people see Trump for who he is and they're breaking with him, but it's pretty clear that's not what's happening, no. right? The drift is more, I want somebody like Trump but I'm not sure Trump the man is it anymore, right? Yeah, there's no question DeSantis had a great year. 
in 2022. I mean, a thumping reelection in what had been a very close swing state. And he is very, very popular in Florida. So a lot of the people who like Trump, they also like DeSantis. And so some of them believe that with DeSantis, you get the policies that they liked about Trump without the craziness, so that he is a more electable version of Donald Trump. Now, that being said, a lot of them don't know very much about Governor DeSantis, and we're going to have to see how he performs in these sort of living room to living room discussions that occur in Iowa and New Hampshire. Uh, but he has had a very, very good year. He's raised a ton of money, and he's developed a very effective national reputation among the Republican Party base. Yeah, boy, do I agree with you on this point that they really like him, but it's also sort of like a shallow commitment to him. Right. Um, like, they don't know that much about him. They're looking for a Trumpy alternative. They like what he did on COVID. They've seen YouTube clips of him, like, yelling at teenagers in masks yelling about Disney, you know, yelling at reporters in his state. And they think, yes, like that's, that's what I like. And this like DeSantis, Trump without the baggage. I always think it's interesting how they all always frame their interest in DeSantis in relation to Trump. Right. Because Trump is still very much at the center of everybody's political worldview with these voters. But let's listen to how some of these folks, the folks who are talking about DeSantis being the, the cure to what ails them on electability, uh, hear what these voters had to say. I think he's Trump, not on steroids, is, is how I like to explain it, because he does basically the same type of things, but in a whole different level. And I think that's more appealing to people. Even if Trump said the same thing that he did, they would like DeSantis better just by the way they communicate. Trump doesn't bother me at all. I mean, sometimes he does. Sometimes I feel like he's being like a child. But as long as he's saying something that is worth saying, I'm OK with it. But. Oh, 95% of the people I talk to don't feel that way. I like that he, he can get votes from a big range of people and doesn't scare people away so bad as Trump does sometimes. I, I know a lot of people just love Trump. I like him and I would vote for him again as president. But I don't think the Santas would drive out the vote against him as bad. He does a good job of taking Trump's strengths, you know, the, the, how he deals with media, how he deals with people who are combating towards him, but he does a better job of communicating it. And he's much more refined. And when he, he comes with policy, policy decisions, you know, he's not just going off the cuff. Um, I mean, he took also a purple state and turned it blood red. I mean, he turned Miami Dade, which has been blue ever since I've been born. So I think he can do a better job of garnering new votes to his cause. I have a lot of friends. My son worked down in Florida for a long time. He was down there for almost a year. So, you know, oh yeah, they call him like Daddy DeSantis or something oh. like that. That's creepy. Um, so the, the guy who said he turned Florida blood red, I've heard a lot of variations on that sentiment about DeSantis, where there's sort of this mythology that's grown up around Florida, right? Like the free state of Florida. DeSantis took it from a swing state. You know, people are like, Florida, that was a place with hanging chads. You know, his first gubernatorial election against Gillum was pretty close, actually. And now he's winning it by 20 points. It's a solidly red state. They're picking up a lot of Hispanic voters. I think, and I'm, I'm interested in what you think, that there's something in the psychology of Republican voters where Florida has taken on this sort of like mythic proportion. It is their version of California. It is the place where their policies thrive and their way of doing things thrive. That's right. And he has made a real success at promoting those kinds of policies, talking about Florida is a place where woke goes to die and freedom lives. Uh, it's a very effective message for the Republican base voters. And Republicans know they've got to have Texas and Florida to counterbalance California and New York in the Electoral College. So if you can put Florida firmly in the Republican camp along with Texas, then you've gone a long ways toward winning a majority of the Electoral College vote nationally. I think in your poll, he had like a 73 percent favorability rating among all GOP voters, which is really high. But how durable is that favorability rating. It's like it's one thing to have like a high favorability because Trump voters like you. 
the dynamic of going head to head with Trump and not being able to sort of run alongside him as a Trump acolyte, like, can he do that? Have you been watching him closely? Like, is he a talented enough politician? Because it looks just the based on your poll, the analysis from that is DeSantis is winning head to head. And not all the polls show this. There's other ones that show, you know, that Trump is still maybe because of his 100 percent name ID that he's still winning in some of these head to head polls. But like once DeSantis goes head to head with Trump, can he sustain? How does that work? It's going to be really interesting to watch him operate. He's very savvy. For example, he's talked about promoting election integrity in Florida, starting an election integrity task force, but he's never actually said the 2020 election was stolen. And I've watched what he said about that, and he's walked a very fine line there. So he's he's keeping the door open to bringing in some people who would not go for Trump and his stolen election rhetoric. But it's going to be real interesting to see how that works. You're right, his his favorable rating overall is 73%, and 54 of that 73 is very favorable. So that's way up there in Trump territory. Trump's overall favorable rating is 68% in this sample. 34% varies, 34% somewhat. So it's a much more temperate evaluation of Donald Trump than it is of Ron DeSantis based on what they know about him today. Oh, hey, speaking of the favorables, I also noticed that Nikki Haley and Glenn Youngkin were both about 30 points above water with the Trump first crowd, like the people who identify more with Trump than with the Republican Party. And I found that piece fascinating. We're going to drop the poll into the show notes so anybody can go look at the crosstabs. But what do you make about that? About are Nikki Haley and Glenn Youngkin, are they sort of sleeper candidates? Oh, I think so. I mean, I've, I think they've both got real potential. Nikki Haley has walked a very fine line, you know, pulling back from Trump and coming closer to him. Glenn Youngkin has not had as much contact or comment about Trump. And he still has a third of the Republican Party or more who don't know who he is. But he's got a very strong 35 to 7 favorable, unfavorable rating among these Republican primary voters. So I think both of them have real potential as candidates. The best case scenario for Donald Trump is that these all get in, obviously. And we have a 2016 scenario again where Trump wins, as you pointed out, winner take all primaries with 28 percent or 30 percent. But these other candidates have some real potential, and I think that's particularly true of of Nikki Haley and Glenn Youngkin. Yeah, it's funny. You know, Glenn Youngkin never comes up in the groups, in part because they don't know who he is. You have to be pretty Beltway focused. But Nikki Haley does come up, um, though it's interesting. She comes up much more among swing voters. That's what part of the reason I was so interested in this is that she's the kind of person that the swing voters remember. She like reminds them of the normal GOP. I know you said she walks a fine line. I would say she's walked back and forth across the line. Um, I'm trying to say it uh, nicely, Sarah. I understand. You you would be nice. I'll be how I am. It is funny. The swing voters who sort of have what I always call the Reagan hangover, they sort of view the party in this way that is like 10 years old. She's the one they like. So she surprised me a little less than Glenn Youngkin, who I just never hear come up because of name ID. But but I think part of what was interesting to me or what I was trying to explore here with this poll is if that always Trump faction kind of implodes, that you get more of an open primary scenario where if the bottom kind of falls out from Trump, DeSantis is a clear front runner, but then like Haley and Youngkin sort of have a chance because otherwise, if you're in the I'm scared about the 2016 repeating itself, you sort of have to consolidate around somebody not to repeat the, the sins of the past, like by January or by early February, you need people to be dropping out. Because last time what happened is they went into those early primary states, they knifed each other, not Trump, Christie knifed Rubio, knifed Jeb, whatever, and they all bled out slowly into Super Tuesday where Trump's just like put the whole thing away. And, and that primary calendar, I'm going to do a whole episode on the GOP primary calendar because it is so important to how the cadence of 2024 is going to go. But anyway, I'm sorry. I am, I'm I'm getting myself off track. So, I think our always Trump groups, they reflect 
the DeSantis admiration. Like, they're sort of DeSantis curious. They like him. They're polite about him, even though they're sticking with Trump. Let's listen. I am in the great state of Florida, and I like the way DeSantis basically put Disney on notice, changed everything there, put in a government board instead of letting Disney run the county and run it into the ground. And the fact that he has basically made the statement that Florida is the state that woke comes to die. And it's huge here. And if you look at the last election here, there was three small pockets of blue. You know, he's doing what people want him to do. I also have friends that live in Florida and they praise him up and down. I like that he took the immigrants that crossed the border illegally and sent them to, what is it, Martha's Vineyard? Martha's Vineyard, yeah. Yeah, that was that was right. That was a good thing to do. You know, I could respect him for that. If I had a second choice, it would be DeSantis. But I, I think, ideally, I would like Trump to run and DeSantis to be his VP. And then DeSantis run for the next eight years. Boy, do I hear the Trump DeSantis VP thing get floated a lot. So I want you to put your Ron DeSantis strategist hat on, Wit, and tell me, how do you win these types of people over? Because we're going to, in a minute, I'm going to play some some more from them and just to show you how ride or die they are from Trump. But like, they're DeSantis curious. They like him. They think what he's doing is good. How do you move them from the always Trump category to the pro DeSantis category? I'm not sure it's possible to do, Sarah. If you look at the people in this survey who support Trump more than the GOP, Ron DeSantis has a towering favorable, unfavorable rating of 79 to 6. But if you pit them against each other, the people who support Trump more than the GOP go with Trump 70 to 20. That's the exact opposite of the people who support the GOP more than Donald Trump, they go with DeSantis 70 to 12. So it's like you have these two groups in the party that reflect mirror images of each other. And frankly, I don't know as long as Donald Trump is living and breathing and upright, I think it's going to be really tough to peel a lot of those people away. Yeah, that's right. On on a side note, this thing about while he's upright, man, McKay Coppins has this great piece in The Atlantic right now about the Republican Party's magical thinking. And he's talking to a bunch of elected officials and he's asking them like, well, what are you guys going to do about Trump? It's like goes to this question of how do you sort of pull the always Trumpers away? What do you do about them? And a whole bunch of the elected officials off the record said he's just going to have to die. Like that's the only way we get out of this conundrum, which to me... They called it something like an actuarial strategy. I I just like, that does not seem to me, I don't know, like a sound strategy. But let's jump in. Let's jump into these always Trumpers. I think people have a good sense of kind of the generic two-time Trump voters, but they more identify with the Republican Party than with Trump. They want to move on. They like a guy like DeSantis. But I don't think people have as much of a sense. I know I didn't until we changed the screen to the very favorable group, have a really good sense of why the always Trumpers were always Trumpers. And so let's listen to what they had to say about why they want to stick with Trump. I'm just ready to be proud of our leader again. Like I feel embarrassed a lot when I see the current administration speaking because they'll like read from a teleprompt and then confuse like really simple things. And I just, I feel embarrassed and afraid that we don't have like a solid leadership in place. So just looking forward to having that again, hopefully. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing, basically, that we need somebody who actually knows what they're doing and is going to put their foot down. Like Joe Biden can't even form coherent sentences and it's just a disaster. So we need Trump's leadership back. He accomplished a lot in the construction building industry. And he was able to get through and get things done. Now, the reason I like the guy is because everything he says is true. I can't see anything that he makes a claim about that's untrue. If they could say, oh, that the pipeline, let's say, prime example, was bad. No, they're coming out now and saying it lost a lot of jobs and it cost a lot of money to cancel it. So... Everything the guy says is straightforward and it ends up being true. 
you know, he may embellish a lot of things just to promote himself, but that's his business. They can't get anything on him. I like him because he's not a politician and I don't like the way they sugarcoat everything and fruit and they talk down to us like we're idiots. I like that he spoke like we did. He says it like it is. He doesn't care who he makes mad and he's not establishment because the problem is we keep getting these lifetime politicians in that are establishment. They're all in coots together. He was an outsider and look how much we're finding out about how shady our entire government is now because of what he brought to the forefront. What he said he was going to do, he did. You know, nobody else can say that. Right or wrong, I believe him. I'm sure he embellishes. I'm sure he stretches the truth. But if he says he's going to get something done, he gets it done. I also like the fact that he's the only one that really has something to lose, right? He's a billionaire. It's not worth his while to take on the presidency. You know, he has all the money. He has a supermodel wife. He has a great family, et cetera. It's a, more of a burden and a hindrance for him to take on the presidency. So th- that makes me ask the question, well, why would he give it all that up unless he was definitely motivated to do so? So the last three people you just heard in that clip were from a group where everyone said that they would vote for Trump as a third party candidate, even if DeSantis were the nominee running against Joe Biden. So our poll Wits poll clocked 28% of Republican primary voters taking that same position. And that was the most interesting part to me. As we've talked about, that gives Trump like an enormous base to work with. But one of the things that struck me as I've listened now to several groups of these people who are ride or die for Trump is the way they talk about Trump is basically the only person that they can think of that is against the establishment. Like even Ron DeSantis, who they like fine, But basically, they talk a lot about this idea that there's an establishment Republican Party that they hate and that Trump is the only one who's taken them on. And that's why they will follow him, even if he runs an independent bid. And, you know, uh, I got some pushback when I put out the poll from people like Ross Douthat being like, you know, 28 percent are not going to follow Trump to a third party if he runs against DeSantis. And I think that's probably true. Like, I think this 28% number probably continues to go down somewhat. But there's a number. Is it 20%? Is it 15? Is it 10? Any of them are enough to crater, as you said, to split the vote, just like I can't remember what historical year you threw out there. You, your history is better than 1912. mine. 1912. Yeah, okay. 1912. So what do you think? Do you think Trump would – run as a third party candidate? Like, because that was the other thing. Not only would that many people not follow him, but Trump won't do it. Now, my response would be, maybe, maybe he doesn't run as a third party candidate, although Trump loves to raise money. That's a great way to raise money. And he does not care about the Republican Party. Not one bit. Trump only cares about himself. He does not care about the Republican Party. And also, if somebody else gets the nomination, won't he just trash them endlessly and drive down, maybe just diminish enthusiasm for whoever the the candidate is. So like, how much damage can Trump do with this sort of lock on this percentage of voters? Sarah, we need to mention one other consideration that we haven't talked about, and that is some states have sore loser laws, where if you run for the nomination yeah. and don't get it, then you cannot get on the ballot as an independent. But I think Donald Trump's reputation and standing is sufficient so that his forces could go to work and get him on a lot of ballots. And as you said, it doesn't take 28 percent to split the Republican vote and put a Democrat in the White House. Any significant percentage is enough, given how closely balanced Republicans and Democrats are in the country as a whole. But it's, it's fascinating to me to listen to your focus groups basically verify the numbers that we found in this survey of the people who like Trump more than the GOP. 98 percent have a, a favorable view of Trump and 78 of that 98 have a very favorable view of Trump. That is a solid base, a rock solid base that I think is not going to go anywhere, even if he ran as an independent and got on the ballot in a number of states. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing that I think sometimes maybe some of the political observers who don't listen to these voters maybe don't understand is the intensity of their commitment to Trump and the fact that they don't really care 
about the Republican Party. Like some of them might make some strategic calculations. They might sit there and think to themselves, well, I don't want to reelect Joe Biden. You know, there's definitely some percentage is going to do that. But there's a percentage of them that are like, no, you guys are a uniparty. Uh, you're all the establishment. I'm with Trump forever to the grave, prying for my cold, dead hands. And whatever that percentage is, it's not 1%. It's not 2%. Like, it's a bigger percentage than that. And I think that presents an existential threat to Republicans. And I guess my question for you and to anybody else who wants to answer it, because I'm not sure that people will sort of know what to do with this, it gives him this, like, weird leverage, right? Like, your poll found, and so many other polls have found, the majority of the Republican Party wants to move on. But they can't move on while 30% or 28% have that deep level of commitment to him because he can wield that in a lot of destructive ways. And so isn't he kind of holding them hostage with that 30% or that 28%? Well, that was the fear of a lot of more establishment Republican types in 2016, was that, that if they tried to block him or keep him from getting into debates, that he would run as an independent and split the Republican base. Uh, so yes, I mean, I have never seen in my many, many years of doing polling, Sarah, the commitment that a particular political figure has garnered from his supporters. I mean, Trump famously said he could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and not lose any supporters. I think he's right. Yep. <laughs> I think he's right. It, it is. I mean, he could certainly stage a, a mini coup uh, and not lose too many supporters. <laughs> like, I haven't heard a single person say January 6th is their reason for being out on Trump right. in these last uh, focus right, groups. Right. And that did not show up at all in, in the open ended responses for what skepticism they had about Trump in 2024. So, in closing, ish, because actually there's like more I want to ask you, but I want to turn back to this electability question. So the always Trump crowd may not think Trump is less electable, but that doesn't mean they're not worried he won't win. They are worried that the election could be stolen again from Trump or from some other Republican, and it removes the roadblock to supporting Trump that the maybe Trump crowd has had lately. So to be clear, what I'm saying is, is that the maybe Trump people, they don't say that they don't think the election was stolen anymore, but they talk about electability a lot and winning, which means there's some tacit admission in there that Trump lost the last couple of elections. The always Trumpers are deeply committed to the idea that the election was stolen. Oh, yeah. So let's listen. I think in the next election, I'm going to do a mail-in vote as early as possible. I think that is a major problem with Republicans because I vote in person and I've always done that every time I vote. But this time I'm thinking, since they're playing this game, Oz lost because of all the mail-in vote. If they had voting on election day and they saw that one debate, he, Fetterman or Festerman would have lost. There's no way the guy has any capable talent. Anyone with no behind their name is going to have a problem. There will okay. be cheating in all the blue states. Not they the hate problem. the sin as just as much as they hate well, them. My- Unless it was a rhino, you know, Unless it was a McCain or Liz Cheney that they are willing to put up with, then they're going to try and crush it. They're doing all of the forensics on this and they're watching the votes get flipped. They're going to China until somebody gets all of those machines. In Pennsylvania, we had those nice big machines and you just went and pulled the lever and there was a piece of paper that was a trail. Until we go back to that, it will always be a problem. You know, the fact that they believe that these Republicans are actually winning and that Trump actually won it helps them not have to have that electability concern, which is, I guess, makes some intuitive sense when you think about it. If you think that they're just going out there and stealing elections from all these Republicans, then you just vote for the person that you like the best and you're not doing the armchair analysis about electability concerns. I I was surprised. Originally, the number of people who said that the election was stolen, it kind of peaked around 70 percent. But after 2022, it seems to be ticking back down. Have you seen that? Yes, it's down in our poll, 52 percent overall say the election was stolen from Trump. But once again, there are dramatic differences between the people who support Trump more than the GOP and those who support the GOP more than Trump. Among Trump voters, 85 percent say the election was stolen and the rest say they're not sure. Virtually no one says that Biden won fair and square. 
among the GOP more than Trump voters, they're split into thirds. A third say Biden won fair and square. A third think it's stolen from Trump. And a third say they're not sure. Now, I don't know what more you would need to be sure, but a third take refuge in that not sure response. So once again, you have a radically different perception on whether the election was stolen, whether you're more Trump or more GOP. So technically, that was supposed to be my last question, but I want to circle back, actually, just pick your brain about a couple more things. Unfortunately, because I haven't done this show in so long, I've got like an enormous amount of pent-up analysis I want to get through, and I've watched 10 groups since 2022 midterms. And one of the things I, I want to go back to this question of DeSantis. One of the things that was interesting to me that happened recently was watching DeSantis during the RNC election to see who would be the chairwin. Would it be Ronna Romney McDaniel again, despite some consternation from her own party that she has presided now over many losing elections? And she was challenged by this woman, like a real crazy person, Harmeet Dillon, who has hung out a lot with the My Pillow guy. She's did a lot with Carrie Lake. And Ron DeSantis endorsed Harmeet Dillon. And I couldn't understand why, because I was like, this guy has become a master at strategic silence. He stays out of a lot of the big Trump-related controversies. And it was pretty clear Dillon was going to lose to Rana, that Rana had the votes. But when I listened to DeSantis explain why he was doing it, he said things like, we need new blood because we've been losing too often. He was really hitting the losing. He talked about we shouldn't have an RNC in Washington, D.C., in the swamp. And he was doing this thing where it seemed to be painting Donald Trump, Rana, as the establishment. And I talked about this a lot. You know, we at The Bulwark have a phrase, Tim Miller came up with it, called the MAGA establishment, which is kind of the the Kevin McCarthy, Donald Trump, Marjorie Taylor Greene, unholy alliance, like forms this MAGA establishment. And so do you see Ron DeSantis lining up like an outsider strategy? Because it's funny, there's this tension between the way a lot of the the sort of maybe Trumpers view DeSantis as a more electable, more polished, maybe more mainstream version of Trump, but that DeSantis seems to be building a profile that is meant to be as base friendly as possible, that he is trying to sort of outflank Trump, not on the right per se, but like on the outsider, fringy stuff. Do you see that or am I making that up? No, no, I think you're on the money there. I think he's developing a sort of outsider versus the establishment type. And when you've been the president of the United States, I guess that makes you the establishment, doesn't it? Not in the eyes of Trump voters, but I do think that's it's an interesting strategy that he's starting to develop. Yeah, and it's interesting just because listening to the always Trumpers, what they love about Trump is that he took on the Republican establishment. Right. The deep state. And so I get – that's right, the deep state, but also Mitch McConnell, right? Like the number of ads Republicans ran in 2022 against Mitch McConnell, against leaders in their own party was pretty weird. And I guess I see DeSantis kind of trying to – get at the always Trumpers by being like, no, Trump's the establishment now, and I hate the establishment more. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's funny because actually a lot of the swing voters or even the the sort of more maybe Trumpers, they see DeSantis as more mainstream. They don't use the word establishment. I don't think anybody's used that word, but I think they would see him as more of a normal politician. And so I guess I find that dynamic shaping up very interesting. I I agree. Uh, And I think... uh, As I said, uh, Ron DeSantis is a very smart, very savvy guy. And if it's possible to peel off any of those always Trump people, I think he'll figure out how to do it. I'm just not sure it's possible. Okay, last sort of hot seat question. And then I really will wrap up. I've been struggling with the DeSantis-Trump matchup. Because if I were my 2015 self and Ron DeSantis was acting the way Ron DeSantis does right now, when he was running for president, I wouldn't like him one bit. I would have no interest in seeing him become the nominee. Now, I got away right now the fact that Donald Trump did a coup, tried to overturn an election, and Ron DeSantis has not done that. And so while I think Ron DeSantis is really, really a bad candidate, I don't see him as the same kind of existential threat 
that I see Trump as. But do you feel like an election of Ron DeSantis, and don't let my opinion, forget my opinion of this, does in your opinion, the election of Ron DeSantis represent the moving on to something better than Trump? Or is it just moving on to kind of Trump without the same kind of baggage, like a slightly more, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Like in the frame of those voters, like, is he like Trump without the legal problems? Or do you think he represents a significant shift away from the dangers that Trump represented? Like deep down, he's a relatively normal guy that you don't have to be so afraid of. I think that Ron DeSantis has an unerring ear for what motivates base Republican voters today. And I think he is the kind of candidate that if he performs as well at the presidential level as he did at the state level, that could really unite the Republican Party. Now, I need to tell the story that my first presidential candidate, Lamar Alexander, told me. He said going from a statewide race to the presidential race is like going from eighth grade basketball to the NBA finals. It is a completely different level of scrutiny. But if he can successfully make that transition, I do think he's got the persona and the ability to unite the party. And as I said, he has been careful not to say that the 2020 election was stolen. He's hinted at by his election integrity stuff, but he's never said the election was stolen. So in that sense, he would be a more, quote, normal, unquote, kind of Republican candidate. Yeah, like I agree. I, I think he's shrewd enough that he tries to keep his his avenues open. But he he's like the only one who went and campaigned with Doug Mastriano the most insane, and that was like a lot of competition, but the singularly most insane candidate in the 2022 cycle, he went and he campaigned with Carrie Lake, but you know, so did Glenn Youngkin. I mean, there there didn't seem to be too much from a lot of these candidates, uh, a sense of like, boy, I need to stay away from Herschel Walker. I need to stay away from Carrie Lake. I need to stay away from Tudor Dixon. Like they all went all in. And so I don't know, I don't quite give him the pass on well, he's managed to, to not utter the words, the election was stolen. But I take your point that he is playing a different game. He is trying to give himself room to maneuver in a general election, for sure. Right. Wit Ayers, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you all for listening to the Focus Group podcast. Please go rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. These Wednesday episodes are not going to be a regular thing. Like I said, we'll be back on Saturday, February 11th, and we will see you then. Sarah, thank you very much. everyone, and welcome to the Focus Group Podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and this week we're talking about the State of the Union and Joe Biden's 2024 re-election prospects. Now, I got in some internet trouble a couple of weeks ago for saying on Pod Save America that I think Joe Biden would likely lose to a Republican presidential candidate not named Donald Trump. And it is just my basic observation about somebody who is in their early 80s, running against somebody who is in their 40s, 50s, or 60s. Even when Ronald Reagan ran for re-election and much was made about his age, he was only 73. Now, in focus groups of both Republicans and Democrats, concerns about Joe Biden's age is a constant refrain. And according to a recent Associated Press poll, a majority of Democrats don't want Biden to run again in 2024. And yet, and yet, old Joe came out swinging in his State of the Union this week. And despite a little rhetorical mush, he did some real-time negotiating with Republicans and came out on top. So how did this energetic performance land with swing voters? Well, you're about to find out. My guest today spends a lot of time around the Biden White House, Peter Baker, chief White House correspondent for the New York Times, and also the co-author of The Divider, Trump in the White House, 2017 to 2021, and the second person who is a 
part of a husband and wife team <laughs> who have appeared on this podcast. The other <laughs> one is the Vindmans, uh, who have had both of them. But now I have had Susan Glasser and Peter Baker, an impressive uh, team. Peter, thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you. Sorry you're stuck with the worst half today. <laughs> uh, you know, I'll take whichever half I can get for this. <laughs> this is great. I'm, I'm so glad you're here. And because... You know, one of the things that I was so struck by in the Joe Biden speech is I think because we don't actually see that much of Biden, yeah, yeah. especially the way Trump is like always in our faces. Like Biden is just he's not out there all the time. And sometimes that can allow people to like input upon him a presentation that might not be, you know, you just see like clips of him stumbling over things or whatever. But you see him all the time there as the White House correspondent is what we saw the other night in the State of the Union. Is that the Biden you see all the time or was that like Joe Biden with like a big B-12 shot? <laughs> well, he was definitely on his game. Oh, I mean, not in the first few minutes. I mean, let's let's not judge him too much on a curve. The first few minutes, uh, he seemed to be racing through the speech. He mangled some words. Yep. He demoted Chuck Schumer to minority leader. <laughs> in fact, there was kind of a, oh, gosh, are we watching a car wreck quality to the first few minutes? Is it going to turn out? that he can't really make it through. And he actually then seems to rally. And I think partly because he gets into the back and forth with the heckling Republicans that actually energizes him a little bit. But broadly speaking, I think you're right. He's not in our face a lot. And that's intentional. They don't want him out there too public. They're trying to make a contrast with Trump. I mean, I remember a pollster at one point interviewed somebody, I think in North Carolina early in the Biden presidency and the, and the voters said, the thing I like most about Biden is I don't have to spend my day thinking about Biden. Totally. And that's a conscious effort by the White House. Now, if you talk about questions of age and energy and wherewithal, you know, look, I think what you see on TV is what we see too. Just, you know, he's slower than he was at 80. I think everybody is. And I think that that's an issue he's going to have to deal with. I don't have any evidence in doing a lot of reporting that it has affected his decision making, right? Nobody has yet to me cited a decision he made as president that he might have made differently had he been 10 years younger. But there's no question he doesn't have the same energy level. There's no question his presentation is often not as energetic as it was when he was, you know, even just vice president a few years ago. Right. Noted. But I guess that like, like if you do a Republican focus group, yeah. it's not that they think Joe Biden slowed down. It's not that they think he's missing a step here or there. Like they think he has full on dementia and that, you know, he is being controlled by the left wing of the party. And th so there's a whole dementia Twitter. I just went, went scrolling through dementia Twitter after the speech mm -hmm. and dementia Twitter didn't have a lot to say about that performance. Yeah. You know, like, like he, I felt like, he did a lot to sort of quiet maybe some of the like pundit class on the, I don't know, I think he's too old to do this. Or do you think, look, this is just going to be omnipresent. There's no way for him to sort of take this concern off the table because that number is just going up. If I were the Biden White House, you know, you could see why they might want to send a bouquet of flowers to Marjorie Taylor Greene, because obviously it gave him the foil in which he could engage in a back and forth in which he did look pretty good, right? Not spry, but he engaged and he seemed uh, able to handle it. In fact, he had the best position. You're up there on the podium, they're down in the audience. You are still in command and he didn't lose command of it, which is a pretty important thing in politics. He seemed to be the guy in charge. So I think... I think you're right. It, I quieted it, maybe, I would say, but briefly and not for long. I mean, the problem for President Biden is that the biggest political liability he has is one he cannot do anything about. He cannot make himself younger, right? And so none of us does, of course, and that will always be a, a liability and an issue for him that he will have to address. And to me, though, that the issue isn't even how is he now? Okay, you can make the case that 80, he's doing pretty good, especially if you know some other 80-year-olds who aren't. And, he, and what he would say is, look at my record. Look what I've done at age 78 to 80. I've gotten this pass and that pass, and this is getting better and that's getting better. That would be his argument. The bigger issue that is harder for him to deal with is the fact of what he will be like in six years, yeah. because that's what you're asking the country. You're asking the country to accept that he can be at the top of his game, or at least close enough to his top of his game until he's 86 years old, the last day of his presidency. And it's one thing if you have an 86 year old senator or congressman who may not be fully where they once were, you know, they roll out on the floor, they take a vote. The world isn't going to end, but we're having a nuclear edge 
conflict right now with Russia. And that's a different thing for a commander in chief. So that's a concern he's going to have to address. And again, as you point out, it's not with Republicans because he's not going to get their votes anyway. It's with Democrats. Yeah. And like when I got in trouble on Pod Save for saying what I said, it's based on my own analysis after listening to a, tons and tons of groups of Democrats yes. and swing voters who they'll say, but like, you know, at the end of his term, he'll be closer to 90 than 80. Like, you can't have that. Yeah. And so that's been really my fear is just the optics of. If it's not Trump, you put him up against a 46-year-old Ron DeSantis, even if he's like glowering and just talking about how kids are using litter boxes in schools and you need to fire all the gay teachers, like whatever he's saying, you could still see how those optics are really bad for somebody who's 82 years old. That voters are just going to be like, I don't know, man. I mean, especially if you have a stumble, right? And then it's going to be interpreted wildly and magnified. And, and of course, the, the trick is that Biden has been a gaffe machine by his own words. He called himself, I think, the ultimate gaffe machine once. He's been like that since he was in his 40s or whatever. But the trick is that if you make gaffes now, if you stumble now, it will be attributed to age, whether it is age or not. Against Trump, it's going to be fine. I think the people who don't like Trump or really don't like Trump and are not going to suddenly return to him necessarily because of Biden's age. There may be other reasons they do. But what's striking about Trump and age is if you go back and watch some of his interviews back when he was in his 40s or 50s, he had a much broader vocabulary. He was actually much more articulate in a way he's not now. Like now he just keeps relying on the same words over and over again, right? Strong, strongly. You compare where he was then and now, you, you see some diminishment. But the difference between him and Biden is he does it so loudly. Yeah. You know, he's so bombastic and so energized in his speech that it seemed more vigorous, right, than Biden does. Yeah, although I just got to say, we haven't seen Trump in a while. Yes. Like we haven't like really seen him. He's out there truthing and calling into shows, but he is not doing a lot of public appearances. Not too much. Yeah. And when he does, you know, it's like he sits down with Sean Hannity or someone's going to treat him with kid gloves and tons of makeup and everything. But like, I, I have real questions about his diminished stamina as well. But I don't for Glenn Youngkin, Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley, Brian Kemp. Right. I think those optics would be, would be tough for Biden. And yet, I got to say, I was surprised both myself in watching the speech and then listening to these voters talk about the speech. I don't know. I, I, I mean, I want to, I want to get into it, but before I do, I want to give to both you, Peter, for your edification, then also for those of you listening who maybe haven't listened to the last two seasons of this show or a lot of them about swing voters. I want to give you a quick crash course in how these swing voters talk. So at the start of every group that we do with swing voters, we ask voters to walk us through why they voted for Donald Trump in 2016 and why they switched to Biden in 2020, because that's how we're sort of defining swing voters. So and what you're about to hear, this group of swing voters sounded exactly like every group of swing voters we do who answers the question, why did you vote for Trump in 16 and switch to Biden in 2020? Let's listen. I was looking for something new. I was hesitant with Hillary Clinton, I'm not going to lie. I was very hesitant with everything, with the Benghazi situation, everything that was on the table. And from what I gathered, I and I even promoted it, I said Donald Trump was, would have been a valuable asset to the country because of the business mind he has. Granted, he has effed up a lot, excuse my French. When Biden came up, I was like, okay, that's it. I can't do this again. No, 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 no. Uh-uh. I'm switching over teams. I voted for Trump initially because he felt like someone different. I thought he was going to be a really honest. It seemed like he was always going to say out loud to us as the people what was really going on. And that kind of changed towards the end. And it got extremely dramatic to where I've never seen politics swing so far one way or another with families as well as the pandemic combined with everything. And so, again, I just wanted to change. And so I voted for Biden. He just seemed really mild. I voted for Trump just because, like everyone else was saying, we needed to, you know, drain the swamp. Just some new blood in there because I felt that the politicians were too disconnected from their constituents. I have a special need child, so whenever he mocked the the reporter by tapping his mm-hmm. chest, that was kind of a a real turn off for me. And then with just the Twitter, you know, the constant Twitter alerts that he that he would put out. He was an embarrassment after the four years of Trump. I mean, they could have put anybody up there. I mean, a mop with, you know, googly eyes and two gloves. I would have voted for that. 
So that's very typical for voters who sort of like took a flyer on Trump the first time, took a chance on him, and then decided they did not want to take a chance on a second term. But these swing voters are often pretty grumpy about Biden as well. Uh, I would say going into the last election, or the midterms, we just did swing voter group after swing voter group. And they were super down on Biden. They're worried about the economy. They're worried about inflation. They wanted to vote for Republicans. They just didn't want to vote for the Republicans that the Republicans were putting up. They didn't want to vote for Blake Masters or Doug Mastriano. But if you've given them sort of a normie Republican, they might have gone for that. But this group, this group, and we screened for this swing voter group by people who watched the State of the Union. And I don't know, Peter, were you surprised by how pro-Biden this group was? I was struck by that. Not one of them had any second thoughts about having voted for Biden in 2020. Not one of them it was even open to the idea of thinking about Trump again. They were all completely through with him. There was nothing that convinced them to vote for Trump. They could be convinced to vote against Biden, right, for reasons you just said. I mean, some people are still talking about inflation. They're obviously concerned about that. They're concerned about issues like immigration or what have you. And they're concerned about his age, but they do not regret their vote for Biden over Trump. And they, too, a person, I think, if I remember your group correctly, when asked if it was a rematch in 2024, they all shot their hands up for Biden. Not one of them was interested in changing their minds about that. And most of them, by the way, you know, were still Biden over DeSantis or some of the others, too. And what is it they'd like about Biden? It's instructive, right? It's about his personality. It's about who he is, their idea of who he is. It wasn't about policy, although a few of them brought up this or that. Most of them, they're saying, he just seems like a guy that you would like to spend time with. One of them said, I, I like the pictures of him going down the hall with Obama when he was vice president. I feel like if I saw him in the hall, he would ask me how I'm doing and Trump would tell me I was a slob. <laughs> You know, I mean, their sense of him as a person, and one of them, I think, was particularly talking several times about his stutter that made him very human, relatable. So that's always been Joe Biden's uh, superpower in politics, of course, is that he is, you know, he's Uncle Joe, right? Everybody knows somebody like him or feels like they know somebody like him in their family. And for all his flaws, and he has many, and they all identified some of them, they, at least they believe that he cares about them and that he wants to do the right thing or wants to help them out. Yeah. All right, I want to play some reactions to Biden's State of the Union. I'll note up front that we asked our group to give the speech a grade. Two gave it an A, one gave it a C, and then six gave it a B, which I will tell you from our focus groups, Bs, high marks. And so you'll hear some nitpicks, but but actually quite positive reviews. Let's listen. I deeply appreciated the clip that is now, you know, documented with the national audience of the like GOP standing up and arguing that they support Social Security and Medicare. Like that was like a, a very masterfully done. I mean, he showed his, it, somebody else mentioned it. Like he, he showed that the fact that he has been in this a long time and he is extremely experienced. It's not always obvious, but I mean, last night it was clear, like master politic or negotiator. That's what really was the highlight for me. I like how personable he is. You can tell that he gets along with the other constituents in the room or with even with the ones that he don't. He still has that rapport where, well, let's talk this way. Let's angry talk and we'll get something done if we can't reasonable talk. So I, I like that. But he threw out a lot of keywords, buzzwords, but he didn't touch in depth on any t one topic as much as I would like. I appreciated how he brought in the family of Tyree. I appreciated the bridge steel workers. I like how he's touching on topics that are really important to different parts of the state. I think he's doing a good job in trying to get people to work together, especially the two parties. So I'm not the person who's voted Democrat all these years, but I tell you, it really makes you think twice. Where he was coming from in his entire speech is, I'm here with you. We're all together. And I'm, I'm going to protect you. I'm thinking of you. You're of the utmost importance to me. He really didn't talk much about the, the balloon going over the, the U.S. Like I, I thought that was going to be brought up. I mean, and not to say anything you know, negative about him, because I know, you know, you know, 80 years old, and he's a good guy, and you know, that stuttering problem. And her name wasn't really easy to, to pronounce, but the Ukrainian ambassador, he was trying to get it out. You know who you are. I thought it was very, like, uplifting. He wants 
us to be better. And you can feel that. Like he wants to work with his counterparts. He wants to make the country better. And the four years previously, nothing got accomplished. So he's trying so hard to convey that he's for the people. As he says, he's a president for everyone, those who voted for him and who didn't vote for him. You can just feel that from him. I mean, I don't know. I've been listening to a lot of voters over the last five years, and I just about any president would wish for people to take away from a speech what these voters took away. Like that one guy who's like, he didn't talk about the balloon. Like that was the guy who gave him a C. Also didn't think he talked enough about police reform. Uh, So he had like his specific things. But when you say things like, I think he's doing a good job. He's trying to get people to work together. I think he's there for the people. He's going to protect you. I'm thinking of you. I mean, that's what voters want, right? They want somebody who cares about people like me. And I feel like Like that really came through. And Peter, you wrote before the speech that in the last 75 years, only Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump had had worse approval ratings at this point in their presidencies than Biden currently has. You also said that Reagan, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama all started their rebounds to reelection with a good State of the Union address. So was this that was this the kind of speech that could start the Biden rebound? It could. I mean, you know, you don't want to go too far on any single speech. You know, fewer people watch this than the State of the Union in the last 30 years, except for Biden's two years ago. So, you know, your audience is limited and it's harder to make uh, a breakthrough today than it was in Reagan's time. Reagan had an audience that would have been twice as large as this one with a smaller population. We don't have everybody sit down, must see TV anymore, right? So in that sense, there's limited possibility for him. But I think, yeah, if, if we see that he does rebound, that does run for re-election and wins, it may be that people look at this moment as a place where he began to build on that. Now, the difference, of course, between Reagan at his midterm, Clinton and Obama at their midterms, is that they all came out of it somewhat smack upside the head, right? You know, for Bush in 06, he called it a thumping. Uh, Obama called it a uh, shellacking. Shellacking. Right? Yeah. And Clinton was just down the dumps for months. He was just a hangdog. And they all felt like they had been rejected by voters, which they had been. Biden didn't come out of last November feeling that way. And whether he should or not, I mean, they did lose the House, but obviously not by the numbers that they expected. They kept the Senate and even gained a seat. So they came out of there at least with the narrative, whether it's justified or not, that they did okay. And that that was even kind of a victory against expectations. So he didn't come into the State of the Union feeling a need to pivot. And he didn't pivot. He said, look, I'm all for bipartisanship as long as you do what I want. (laughs) Bipartisanship means you support my priorities. He didn't give any inch to the Republicans who are now in charge of the House. And I think that was a strategy on their part because they don't feel like he needs to to switch gears that as the economy gets better, as inflation comes down, that his numbers will eventually start to come up again, at least as long as they're in relation to Trump. Yeah. Well, in relation to Trump and then also (laughs) the Republicans provided him some interesting contrast during that speech. And in fact, this group had some pretty choice words for how Republicans conducted themselves during the speech. Let's listen to that. I was really hoping somebody showed the door to majority Taylor Green. Like she was the Mm -hmm. worst. I couldn't take her on screen. I was like, please, please ask her to leave because she was the worst of all. I agree with that completely. Like it just goes to show like as a mother, I see this generation um, and how the kids treat teachers Mm -hmm. and authority in general. And when they do that, what kind of kids are they raising? Like, that's what I think of like, you're the problem because Even if you don't like the president, I was always taught to respect the office. And so it was just so disrespectful for her standing up there. Liar, liar. I mean, you know, it's just what what does that prove? They should have showed her the door. So Marjorie Taylor Greene, absolutely horrible. George Santos as well, too. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, Mitt Romney comes out of his mouth and says to him, you don't belong here. You don't need to go here. And George Santos is you're, you could basically see he's b- being defiant. Now, wait a minute. This is a senior leader in your party. First and foremost, respect. There's no respect in that party at all. That party is going through a massive shift. And it looks like you can just tell by how last night played out. They have no decorum. It's just a free for all. It's literally a free for all. I, I guess here's the thing with the Republicans behaving as they are, to your point, 
they are coming out of these midterms, and I would say just from an expectations game, they crushed it, the Democrats. I mean, I think the Republicans went way too far, you know, with their red wave certainty. And as a result, their majority looks, it looks like a loss. Like, that's how it feels. So Biden's bouncing out of a great midterm. He gives this good speech. The Republicans are providing this insane contrast. Yeah. If Joe Biden was 73 years old, I think he would crush re-election against a lot of people. Part of the reason that people are going to obsess about his age, and I think a lot of voters, Democratic voters, mm. who are not obsessed by his age are going to get really annoyed about how much we talk about it. But it's because that is, that's his Achilles heel in a scenario where like otherwise he is doing pretty good. Cause like, and I'd, I'd like you to react sort of to this idea of the Republican contrast, you know, McCarthy's trying to shush people, but they're yelling and Joe Biden maybe has the best case scenario where yes, yes he's the Republicans own the house, but now they're providing that contrast that voters get to be like, God, I didn't like Donald Trump. I don't like this Trumpy version of the party. And I hate this. Like, isn't that what's allowing Democrats to overperform? So isn't that maybe help Joe Biden? Absolutely. And no question about it. And that's how Clinton and Obama both bounced back to win re-election two years after they take that shellacking in those two midterms. And I think this is exactly what the White House wanted. When they drafted the speech, they identified two places in the speech where they thought Republicans might heckle Biden. And they told him, here are your two places where you might expect that. Guess what? The Republicans did exactly that and exactly those two parts of the speech, giving them exactly what they wanted. And I was struck that your group, I was so interested in this, your group, I think, strikes me as politically engaged, but not politically obsessive, right? They don't, they're not reading playbook in the morning. They're not paying attention to, to the ins and outs the way, you know, obsessive people like you and me might, but they know Marjorie Taylor Greene's name, right? They know who she is. They don't know, by the way, the chairman of the appropriations committee or the armed services committee, people who are really in theory important on Capitol Hill. The name they know, the personality they have seen is Marjorie Taylor Greene. She has made herself a face of the Republican Party to the party's detriment, right? Because you, you see their reaction to her. And that's striking to me. That's Biden's biggest advantage going into this next two years is, in fact, the notion that this Republican majority in the House will come across as over the top, you know, just, just performative and, and radical and rude and what have you. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of like, Joe Biden ran from his basement in 20. And I'm not sure that that contrast, if he ran from his basement again, and he kind of kept the age thing on the DL a little bit, these guys will beclown themselves left and right and say like, listen to all these swing voters, they do not see themselves in the same coalition with Marjorie Taylor Greene. No. Like, base <laughs> voters, sure. But the swing voters do not. Okay, so... I will say that if you listen to these voters' reactions to the speech and their visceral reactions to the Republican Party, they're all set to vote for Biden again. But when we asked our group, two people wanted Biden to run again, two people wanted him not to run, and the rest were undecided, kind of somewhere in between. Let's listen to some of the concerns about Biden running again, and I think you're going to hear some obvious themes that we've already touched on. I mean, as far as the speech goes last night, I could tell that, you know, he wasn't really reading from it. He remembered a lot of it. He seemed very coherent. But then there was moments. And I mean, I have a grandfather that lived to 98 years old. And I work in a nursing home. And I recognize clarity of mind. It, I, don't even, I don't even think it's a speech impediment. I think that he just disappears from when he's speaking sometimes. And that scares me. And a little bit because... It just shows that maybe all the people around him really are running things a little bit more if we have someone that is lacking that kind of thing. It's not because I don't want a Democrat in there again. It's not because I don't like Biden. I think we need a younger, more vivacious person in there. I think I, I want him to run, but he's going to need a stronger VP support. Me, I don't want him to run with, how do we say this, a lackluster VP there, because then he's going to lose. So might as well have a better president candidate from Democrat side. So I think there's a lot to be done by Democrats in the next two years. Uh, I do want him to run, but I think he's going to need a lot of support from his VP candidate. 
So all but one person in the group thought Biden's age was a concern, but you brought this up before. When we asked people to choose between Biden and Trump and Biden and DeSantis, like, Biden got a clean sweep from this group. And so even though age is the most obvious roadblock, the, I guess the other things that he could have that, that are coming down the pike, and you must be covering this, are like the two years of investigations into Hunter. We asked them about the documents. That's We don't have sound from the documents thing, but but everybody was just like throwing up their hands. Like, well, clearly the whole documents thing is, you know, ridiculous and we don't really know how to evaluate that. I mean, one person did say, you know, it depends on what's in there. We don't really know yet. Um, but do you think that the Republican investigations, wh- which way do you think that's going to go? Is that going to bounce towards sort of chipping away at Biden's viability or is that going to, again, highlight Republicans caring about things that most voters don't care about? Yeah, it's a great question. I don't know that we know the answer. We should be careful about predicting, but I think you're right. Look, it is Fox News chum. It is red meat for the base. They're going to love it. It energizes them, which seems to be the goal. Does it convince people in your group, that group, the, the swing voters, that something bad has happened? I mean, I guess it partly depends on what they turn up. But the problem for the Republicans is they look so, to these kind of voters, they look like they're just partisans out to make a, a partisan a show of it. And if you're a Republican who's doing an investigation, you might have some interest in actually trying to do it in a way that doesn't come across that way and, and be taken more seriously. We'll see if any of them actually take it up on that. Having said that, I was struck by one of the things, Sarah, that a couple of your focus groupers said one reason they didn't like Hillary Clinton, they just didn't like her, is they cited Benghazi. Mm-hmm. And that suggests that sometimes these things kind of get through to people just got through that something bad happened with Benghazi that was Hillary Clinton's fault and that that tarnished her in their eyes. So that's always the danger for Biden is it may not be that something is substantively proven to be genuinely wrong, but just the preponderance of the, the conversation of it changes their image of him. Yeah. Were you surprised by how much this group disliked DeSantis? Very much. Not, not surprised by it, but I'm very struck by I that. Was. Yes. Yeah. Again, DeSantis is a base candidate at this point, and that may be enough to get the nomination, but he would have a very big challenge in the general election to change his image because he's not likable to these swing voters. Now, your point, though, is he is younger, and that's going to be a huge advantage if it's a DeSantis-Biden race. There's going to be a lot of people who pick him just because they see him as a new generation guy, even if they're not thrilled with his politics. But I haven't seen enough of him to know. My sense from people who do know him is that he, you know, he's not exactly Mr. Magnetism for the middle of the road folks, right? And it would be interesting to see if he has the agility to pivot if he were actually to get the nomination. Yeah, I mean, one of the downsides to having really high name recognition among Republican voters is he's also got pretty high name recognition among swing voters and Democratic voters who sort of don't like what they're seeing. So it's going to be harder for him to pivot out of this later to run as kind of a, a general. And as concerned as I am about the optics, I was struck by this group, how much they were just absolutely not for DeSantis. I will say, though, that this group And I think it's because we screened for people who are going to watch the State of the Union. And I think that led us to maybe a a scotch more pro-Biden of a swing voter group. So, well, one of two things is happening. Either the speech itself made them feel more pro-Biden in that moment, or Hmm. they are a scotch more pro-Biden than your average swing voting group because they're the kinds of people who wanted to tune in to hear Biden give an hour long speech. A lot of swing voters weren't watching. That's the speech, right. right. I think that's right. And I want to tell you that what we heard last fall from swing voters about Biden was way more critical. And so um, just to not be all like happy talk, I want to play some Trump Biden voters from the vault that we heard between August and October of 2022, who were literally talking about going back to Trump. Let's listen. Hmm. Well, if it's between Biden or Trump, let's get Trump back to make things better again. He came with a lot of pros and cons, but the inflation, the prices, everything that's going on with us, we didn't have those issues with Trump. Trump made these worse, and then he went back and corrected them. This president is just making it worse. It's just like, okay, deal with it. And I hate that. It affects everyone. I just thought the country was in a better place. It seemed like we're scrutinized now. Like everything, like... I watched certain news and they said, we're going to be like in trouble with our taxes. We're going to be in trouble with everything. And I just felt better when Trump was in office. I just, I have to vote for him and my family's going to be mad at me, but I don't care. 
I hope to God we don't have Trump versus Biden in 2024. But if that happens, I'm probably going to vote for Trump because I'll take a lot of the crap that Trump does. But I know I'm going to get a strong economy, you know, and I'm going to get someone that, you know, at least is, is passionate. You know, it sort of brings up for me, you know, voters are like a lagging indicator on how the economy is doing right now. Like there can be a lot of news stories about how the jobs are doing really well, like great jobs reports, core inflation's coming down, the market bouncing back some, but like voters still will talk about the cost of bread and eggs and housing. And like until they are feeling it, they will not feel like this economy is working for them. And they will do this thing where they're like, it was just better under Trump. And so I'm going to go back to Trump. So here's my question to you as somebody hanging around the White House. I I get the sense that part of the reason Biden's going to run again is because he thinks Trump will still be the nominee. Do you think they like want the rematch with Trump? Like that's not something anybody would say out loud. Oh, they they do. They definitely want (laughs) want the rematch. No question about it. That's definitely their approach to this is it's going to be a rematch. Biden is the Trump killer. He did it before. He can do it again. And I don't think they're sure that he can, can beat another candidate or not because they haven't really got enough uh, data to work from on that. But they do think that he can beat uh, Trump. Now, interestingly, the argument that has been selling with Democrats about why Biden should run again is that, which is that he's the guy who can save us, quote, quote, from Trump. But that Washington Post poll, interestingly, I think, is a danger sign for him. The Washington Post poll showed Trump leading a matchup 48-45. Now, let's, that was margin of error. Let's just say that was an outlier. But the idea that Trump is even competitive in, in one of these polls, and because polls are always wrong on election day anyway, questions whether or not Biden really you know, has such an extraordinary advantage over Trump that, that he should be the only choice for the Democratic nomination. That There is now another poll since then, I forgot it, you'll know it, that showed Trump down by six or seven to Biden, which would, I think, be more what the White House would expect. But he has to be able to keep up that idea that only Biden, or at least Biden, is the most likely to beat Trump in order to keep the Democrats behind him. Well, it brings up one additional wrinkle that is flagged very often in the focus groups. And so you already heard in one of the clips earlier, there was a guy who was very concerned. Uh, He didn't name Kamala Harris, but he just said he needs a stronger VP. And so you and two of your Times colleagues are out with a story about Harris this week. Sounds like Harris's team gave you all names to talk to for supportive quotes, but it turns out that privately they weren't so uh, confident. And we'll put the story in the show notes, uh, but that's a tough place to be. And I got to say, I'm going to play it for you. The focus groups have been really tough on Harris. Let's listen. There was this like press interview or anything and Somebody was asking her, you know, can she support giving support to Ukraine? And she just like smiled and giggled and laughed. I mean, yeah. that that is a war torn country and you're just you're just laughing. She's kind of invisible. Like we don't really even I think there's potential, but I think that he maybe picked her just because she was a minority woman. Do we want to elect a president and then have him die in office? And if he runs in with, with Harris again, and then he dies in office, and then you know, she's our president now. If it is Harris Trump. Who, I know, you guys. Who is going Harris? Who's going Trump? Can we move? Not to sound like some of these other people who went, oh, if Trump gets elected, I'm leaving. I mean, just going by the way Trump ended, I, I would go with Harris, but that's the lesser of two evils. Okay. So in the head to head, that was the moderator saying like, who's going Harris, who's going Trump. And so eight out of nine people did say they would choose Harris over Trump if there was a matchup. And one person said they would abstain, but like they had to think about it for a really, really right. long time. Uh, <laughs> and so this question of age isn't just about Biden, right? Like, it's like it's uncouth to talk about it, but like actuarial tables being what they are, who the vice president is becomes extraordinarily important in this yeah. conversation. And to have a vice president who's as unpopular as she is, and I got to tell you, we in the focus groups, and I'm not just talking Republicans, I'm talking swing voters for sure, and then also a lot of Democrats. That's she is not popular mm-hmm. with voters mm-hmm. right now. Yep. No, and it's really very striking. And what your your listeners here can't see is that when your your focus groupers were asked Kamala Harris was the faces they made 
the faces they made were just demonstrative, right? Like, oh my God, castor oil. You've just made me eat something horrific. You just fed me sardines. You know, <laughs> they were not uh, reacting in a, in a positive way to her at all. And this is what we try to capture in that article is that she's had such a problem establishing herself and rising to the occasion, according to fellow Democrats, that they don't have faith in her. They don't have faith that she would be a, uh, you know, a successful nominee if he were not to run for some reason. B, that she wouldn't be a liability to the ticket if he does, for the very reason you said. Republicans are going to make an obvious attack on him, which is if you vote for Biden in 24, you're really voting for Harris because implicitly there's a good chance he might not make it to 2029 and therefore she would become president. So she has this challenge now of at the very least not being seen as a liability for him on that ticket, even if she's not, you know, an asset. You know, just dig in on Harris with me for a second, because I guess one of the things that, that the focus groups say all the time, and I I have internalized this as well, is like you just don't see yeah. her that much. Like even watching the State of the Union, I was struck by like, oh look, there she is. You know, she yeah. looks great. But they always talk about, they say she's invisible. I never see her. I don't hear her. And the Democrats who are much more, you know, they talk obviously much more favorably about like her possibilities. They're like, I was really excited about Harris. I really wanted to see what she was about, but I just feel like I don't see her at all. Like what is going on there? Is she being intentionally kept out of view? Is she keeping herself out of view? Like what is the well, problem? Well, first of all, being vice president sucks. Okay. Let's right. just start with that. <laughs> it is really the worst job in Washington. You know, Thomas Marshall, who was Woodrow Wilson's uh, vice president once said that there were two brothers. One of them went out to sea and the other became vice president. Neither was ever heard from again. Um, <laughs> it's just a terrible job. And it was terrible for George H.W. Bush and Al Gore and, and so on and so forth. So start with that. Second, add on the burden of being a first, right? Being the first African-American vice president, the first woman vice president, the first Asian-American vice president, and the burdens and the expectations that come with that. You cannot screw up. And there's a double standard, I'm sure, in a lot of different ways that, that's probably unfair to her. It certainly feels unfair to her, I know. Having said all that, it is reality. You're not going to change the job and you're not going to change who you are. So therefore, you have to deal with that and make it as success as you can. She hasn't been able to do that. Now, her allies, her most sympathetic people would say Biden hasn't helped her, hasn't given her jobs that would give her much of a resonance with the public. She has seemed to crack through a little bit with her passionate defense of abortion rights that has, uh, you know, energized the Democratic base a little bit. They do like her voice on that. So look for her to do a little bit more of that. She now looks at this next two years as an opportunity where she may be able to do more because she won't be quite as tethered to the Senate. She's actually cast more tie-breaking votes than any vice president since John Calhoun because of the 50-50 tie. And now that it's not a 50-50 tie, it may be 50, 49 and a half. I don't know where you count Christian some of these days, but it's not a 50-50 tie. And so she's telling her staff, get me out there. I want to be out on the road at least three times a week to be more visible. But you can't be too visible because you're vice president. If you show up the president, that doesn't work for you either. So it's kind of a kind of a damned if you do, damn if you don't situation. But she hasn't made the most of it. A lot of Democrats... You know, we don't quote any Republicans in the story. All the, the disappointed people in the story are Democrats, including some who helped put her on the ticket and feel like she hasn't risen to the occasion. Yeah, but you just made a point I'd never thought of before, which is that if the White House is consciously keeping Biden low profile, which I heard you say in the beginning, and I didn't want to like push back exactly because you're not, it's not your calculation, but there's a little, something a little bit convenient about being like, no, 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 our strategy is to keep him super mm -hmm. low profile. <laughs> Because Trump was always in your face when actually there, you know, there's part of it that's like, yes. well, he's 80 and, you know, he needs a yes. nap and like, you know, there's only so much you can run him around. But like, I guess I've always had this thing like, well, what is the White House doing? Like, are they telling her like, no, don't make a lot of a public appearances. But if there's just sort of a rule, which makes total sense or like a norm that the vice president cannot be much more visible than the president and the president is just being kept not super visible on purpose for a variety of reasons, that that significantly diminishes just her ability to be out there talking to people. Right. Fewer opportunities because, yes, you don't want to outshine. You never want to outshine your president if you're vice president or seem to do that. And you're right. He does keep a low profile. So it's kind of a tough situation in that regard for her. But ha having said that, I mean, you don't want to let her off the hook too much either. I mean, you know, she has struggled to find her voice in a way that has captivated people. She struggled to keep a staff. You can tell things with staff come and go. That's a, usually a sign of a 
of a problem in a politician's office. And remember when she ran for president, she didn't even get to the Iowa caucus, right? So she, she ran a campaign that didn't go very well. And so all of that's on her. And so on the one hand, she has factors that are beyond her control that aren't fair. But on the other hand, you have to live with that. And she's got an opportunity now, but we'll see if she can take advantage of it. So I saw an Atlantic headline that I liked. It was called Biden's Catch-24. And I'm going to admit, I just only read the headline. I didn't read the rest of the article. But what I would assume his Catch-24 is, is that he's very old. So he needs a vice president that people have a lot of confidence in. He doesn't have that right now. But he also can't swap out no, Kamala no. Harris, right? Like no. you, like there's, I think a lot of us who sort of game out these political decisions are like, well, you could just do that. That would solve this problem. And, but she'd have to sort of make that decision herself, right? Yeah. I, you can't do that. I mean, you know, look, if she decided she wanted to leave and it was genuinely her decision or at least appeared to be her decision, that would be one thing. But you cannot appear to be dumping her from the ticket for a couple of reasons. One, just historically, it hasn't worked since FDR did it, right? The only time it's happened since FDR was when Ford dumped Nelson Rockefeller, a moderate to liberal Republican in favor of Bob Dole because he was trying to fend off the, the concerns on the right as represented by Ronald Reagan at the time. Didn't work for him. I think, I think that every other president since then has thought about it, or at least their staff has thought about it. They, should they get rid of Biden in 2012? Should they get rid of Cheney in 2004? It, it's come up. But most of the time, they, they conclude that it would be more damaging than it would be helpful, that it would, first of all, call into question your judgment in, in the very first decision you made as a presidential candidate, right? Who to pick as your number two. And second of all, you would offend people without necessarily gaining anything. So here, you literally would be potentially offending the most important constituents in your party for what gain? And it's not really clear who would get you more then you would lose, at least in terms of enthusiasm and energy and and goodwill. So that's the real trick. And I think that's probably what they mean by the catch-22. That was the catch-24. But And actually, and I have no idea if that's what the article's about. It's just (laughs) a title that I thought encapsulated my theory of what Biden's sort of facing here in terms of some pretty complicated dynamics. Because I got to say, as somebody who, and I'll just say this kind of as we wrap up here, I guess I've been... It's the reason I said what I said on Bad Save America is that I've been kind of like, man, I just really think there's a timing issue here and that Joe Biden's been a great president and he should go out on a high. You know, Michelle Goldberg had a column about this uh, yep. that I was quoted in uh, just talking about the focus groups. But I, I mostly agreed with it, this idea that he he could step down and he could also, if it wasn't Kamala, he could signal toward a different successor. And, and he could do some work in advance of that to help that person get elevated in their profile, et cetera. I don't know. I don't know what all the mechanisms would be, but like, all I know is that it would have to be fast. It would have to be soon. And that if you sit around and wait to ensure that Donald Trump isn't the nominee, like that's too late in the timeline. Yeah. And so like, that's the other sort of catch 24 is that by the time you know whether or not it's Trump, it's too late to do anything about it other than. Biden to run. And so I guess I'd nominally been on this idea of like, man, dude's just got to get out and got to try to tap somebody else. But you know, that's not super straightforward and no. super easy because Kamala Harris, I don't think ends up being the person like you still have that problem to deal with. And you're then running a primary like, and the one big advantage you have an incumbent is that you're going to let the other guys tear each other apart while you stand there and look presidential. And that's a big thing to give up. And I don't think it's fair to ask you as a reporter what you think you should do, but what's your, what analysis should he do? Or is it, they're just, you got to run. That's it. Yeah. I thought there was a chance a while back that he might choose the I'm stepping down statesman-like kind of approach. He, he got a high because he did do better than expected in the midterm. It wouldn't be like he was being driven from office. He did say he was going to be a bridge to a new generation when he ran. And the implicit message in 2020 was, I'm going to run for one term and then bring along a new generation of leadership. That's not a bridge he's ready to cross, <laughs> clearly. I think that the extent that we thought that might be his calculation, that seemed to be wrong. There is no indication, not even a hint or a whisper among anybody close to him that he would consider anything other than running again. And if you think about it, I suppose that makes sense. You spend your entire life, your 80-year-old life, trying to be president of the United States, and then you're going to suddenly step aside because people tell you you're too old. No, screw that. I've been trying to get here my whole life. I got stuff to do. That's, I think, where his head is really at. 
And I've got, of course, the Trump challenge, uh, it gives him a justification. And the fact that there is no obvious successor gives him a justification. But here's the other trick. So yeah, I think you're right. If they want to groom somebody else, they're getting late in the game here because they don't have somebody who's an obvious other candidate. But what happens if he does, of course, run for re-election as we think he's going to, but something happens next year? What oh, if yeah. something happens in the summer or fall of 2024 where suddenly he decides he can't make the race? Some, you know, and again, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but the reality is that 80 and what will be 81 next year, things happen fast at that age that you don't expect. And therefore, what is the party going to do? How do they prepare for that possibility? They have to at least think about that and what their contingency plan is. And I haven't heard anything about that yet. Well, and it doesn't even have to be, he doesn't have to get like, fatally sick oh no but he could just like need a big surgery or you just think about how hillary clinton you know the conspiracy theory about her her being sort of sick in some way and like that time she had pneumonia and like like if you were in a an election cycle and you are running against even let's say trump but like very much possibly somebody younger and like you start needing a bunch of help yeah you need a bunch of procedures or something like that that is catastrophic in a campaign environment. Uh, I, well, I really appreciate you working all this through with me because it is <laughs> it is not straightforward. It is not straightforward, and yet it feels like we also know the answer. Like there's just not really – you can game out some of these things, but it looks like just looks like we're doing the thing. We're going to do the thing. It looks like we're doing the thing. <laughs> Peter Baker, thank you for coming on the Focus Group podcast. Sure, of course. And thanks to all of you for listening to another episode of the Focus Group go over to iTunes and uh, give us a rating and we will be back next week with more focus groups. See you guys. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Focus Group Podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and this week we're doing a deep dive on Ron the Meatball DeSantis. Now, you might ask, hey, Nikki Haley just got into the race this week. Why not do an episode about her? That's fair. But when we ask voters who they'd vote for if not Donald Trump, the answer is never Nikki Haley. It's almost always Ron DeSantis. And polling regularly bears this out. In fact, the poll we did a few weeks ago with GOP pollster Witt Ayers had DeSantis beating Trump both head-to-head and in a three-way ballot with somebody else. And our poll isn't an outlier in this regard. Lots of reputable polls now have Ron DeSantis beating Trump in head-to-head matchups. And while some have speculated that Ron DeSantis may be the Scott Walker of this cycle, meaning someone with lots of hype that he ultimately can't live up to, Nate Cohn of the New York Times points out in his column this week, Mr. DeSantis is no Scott Walker. He would start the campaign in a very different and far stronger position, even if there's still no way to know whether he has what it takes to succeed against former President Donald J. Trump. So I basically agree with that. Does Ron DeSantis have what it takes to beat Trump in a GOP primary? Will he live up to the hype? My guest today is someone who is well-sourced in the simmering war between Trump and DeSantis, Tara Palmieri, Senior Political Correspondent at Puck News. Tara, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Sarah. Okay. So you're like the person who knows all this stuff. You're deep, (laughs) deep reporting on both the Trump camp and the DeSantis camp. Mm. Just to like level set, can you give us the 10,000 foot view of DeSantis? Like who is he? Does he have good political instincts? Is he as cranky as he always looks on TV? Just like tell us your big picture on him. I think there's just so many unknowns about DeSantis. I think that Republican voters who don't want Trump anymore, I think Republican leaders, consultants, et cetera, they're kind of projecting a lot of their hopes and dreams on Ron DeSantis and what he can do. Right now, he's a governor with a good track record. We've seen that before. But I think the big question mark is about whether he will be good on the debate stage, and whether he'll be a good retail politician. All indications so far show that those are his weaknesses. And so it's kind of a moment where 
he's being dragged into the debate by Trump, who wants him in the ring. Trump is lonely out there as the front runner, and Trump is best when he's fighting. It's not clear that Ron DeSantis is really best when he's fighting. I watched some old DeSantis uh, videos from debates, and he's not really the strongest on the stage, even up against Andrew Gillum when he was running for governor the first time around, uh, Charlie Crist. And, you know, Trump plays below the belt. We can only imagine it'll be petty and childish like the meatball, right? Kind of dumb like the sanctimonious, and then just like sleazy like the groomer innuendo. And, you know, I'm told that they'll keep going until they can really get him in the race. And I've been told that they're already looking at DeSantis' wife, Casey, who he's very close with, as the person and the topic that will eventually pull Ron in. Because if you don't defend your wife, it doesn't look very good on you either, right? I mean, if that's anything we've learned from the Ted Cruz, Heidi Cruz attacks, that he was punished by voters for not defending his wife enough against Donald Trump's attacks. So Trump wants DeSantis in the ring because his gut matches the fears of the Republican Party that DeSantis perhaps is more reflection of the hopes of the party rather than what is actually there. And he might not be able to stand up to Trump because he also needs Trump's voters and Trump knows that as well. Yeah. I mean, this is just not as straightforward as people seem to think it is. So I agreed with Nate Cohn's piece in The Tilt this week that DeSantis isn't really Scott Walker in the sense that a lot of Republican voters want him to be the president. And I can't tell you, you know, I've been doing these focus groups now for years. And when we started getting into the question of, do you want Trump to run again in 2024? That has evolved. It's just been diminishing over time in terms of people's enthusiasm for Trump running again. But the biggest differentiator, the biggest thing that changed was that they had somewhere to go, somebody that they liked. And that person has been around DeSantis now really consistently. People have been sort of growing in their enthusiasm. It's reflected in the polls. But their relationship to him is also a little shallow. They have seen him on a bunch of YouTube clips and on Fox News. They see him at the podium yelling at the media in Florida. They see him yelling at teenagers in masks. They know he took on Disney. They like how he handled COVID. So they have these things that they like about him. But there's also, as you note, the question of his political talent. There's also a question that I've had, which is like, what does he believe about a whole bunch of other stuff, like national issues that are going to come up once he's on the national stage? So just for one example, where do we think he is on, you know, Ukraine? This is a huge dividing line within the Republican Party. Right. And so, like, the one thing I would give him I've seen as a political instinct has been his, like, strategic silence, mm. like his ability to not engage and not get pulled in. But at some point, he's got to answer, would you keep supporting Ukraine if you were the president of the United States? And that will be a thing that may very well turn off some of the populist base. Do you have any sense of where he stands on some of these big national issues? Ukraine, Social Security, Medicare. Um, there are a lot of things that DeSantis is not wading into. And he really can kind of hide behind the I'm a governor of Florida position for now because he hasn't fully announced. And I mean, he's dealing with the Florida press. He hasn't actually faced the national press corps, when I think you're going to get those answers or you're going to get a lot of defensiveness and that might not be enough for voters. Based on the fact that, you know, he was a member of the House Freedom Caucus and a lot of them are against aid to Ukraine, I would assume that that would be his position. Um, but he might be poll testing it. He might be against aid to Ukraine when he's in the primary and then when he gets into the general, he may soften on that, right? Right now he feels comfort in culture war issues, as you can tell, and he's leaning into that. He's sees himself as like a anti-vaccine warrior in some ways. Uh, of course, Trump's team says we've got clips of times when he supported the vaccine. They also say they've got clips of when he called for Medicare and Social Security reform for when he was a House Freedom Caucus member. You know, obviously, when you're a member of Congress, the governor, your positions change. But you're right. There's just like a lot we don't know about it. We don't know how he's going to weigh on the issues. I have a feeling that he's going to change his positions based on what he thinks is going to win him a Republican primary versus a general election. You know, it's interesting. It's like I was talking to my dad. He's a, he was a fan of Trump. Didn't like him as a person, which I think you hear a lot from voters, but appreciated his policies and would probably vote for him again. Although the attacks on DeSantis just aren't like sitting well with him. And I've actually never really heard him bring up DeSantis before until he mentioned that Trump attacked DeSantis and he didn't think that was right, that he didn't think that he should be attacking 
another Republican. And I just wonder if you're right, like maybe Republican voters have just so much hope in DeSantis that they don't want to see him getting destroyed by Trump. It was like kind of a group of people built on grievances, but now perhaps that they're out of power, they're building their dreams on hope that somebody can help them. Do you know what I mean? I do know what you mean, and I think it's 100% true, and I actually think you just landed on what I think is kind of an essential question that I have, which is we're all assuming that DeSantis has to be super careful about attacking Trump because he needs his voters, but like the reverse can also be true, that Trump attacking DeSantis is the kind of thing that causes voters to sour on him because I will tell you from the focus groups, electability has become the coin of the realm in the way a big swath, not everybody, but there's this big middle of the party that they voted twice for Trump. They like Trump. They're not breaking with Trump, but they want to win and they think Ron DeSantis is the more electable choice and seeing Trump tear him down could actually rally people to DeSantis as opposed to causing people to flee from DeSantis. I just don't think we know that dynamic yet. So- I want to play, I want to play some clips on this, but I do want to start, I'm actually going to start with Nikki Haley, because one of the reasons I'm bearish on Haley and more bullish on DeSantis, besides all the polls and indicators, is because I've listened to voters talk about Haley like this. She's just going to be a return to what everything was before 2016, you know, status quo politician, basically. I don't think she's anything different than, you know, Republicans that we've seen in the past. I think she'd just be, you know, more of the same cookie cutter conservative views. She would just be right back to the Paul Ryan, John Boehner kind of a thing. Yeah, that's a no-go for me. So Nikki Haley has a lot of attributes that would make her sort of a fresh, new, forward-looking kind of candidate. She's young early 50s, so relatively young to all the other people in elected office right now. You know, she's a minority. She's a woman. She'll likely be the only woman that's in the Republican primary. Great foreign policy chops. So why does everybody think that she's a throwback? And the reason is, is that there's like a dividing line, like a before Trump and after Trump. But she is a pre-Trump politician. And people basically write her off as establishment. They, They like her okay. They don't hate her. Like they do often, you'll hear some real hate for Mike Pence or Liz Cheney. They they like like her fine, but they're not that interested in voting for her. And so I'm trying to puzzle through, like, what is Nikki's play here? And I guess I wonder, and I want to know what you think about this, if she places a respectable but somewhat distant third in Iowa and or New Hampshire, New Hampshire's probably a better fit for her. Could she have leverage over either Trump or DeSantis? Like, let's say they're both in the high 20s, low 30s. They're kind of slugging it out. And you're headed into South Carolina, her home state, where she was a two-time governor. Is that a place where she can cut a deal for a VP slot with one of the two front runners, Or is the party so far gone that Nikki Haley's actually a drag on a ticket like somebody like DeSantis? What do you think? Yeah, I don't see what Nikki Haley offers, even in South Carolina. I, a lot of the polling shows her behind DeSantis and Trump in South Carolina, where she's from. Not to mention that we're pretty sure that Tim Scott is going to jump into the race, right? That's true. I don't know exactly. She might help Trump in terms of winning over suburban women who he's lost. Maybe that's the VP play. But I think the animosity between them is like just so palpable. Between Nikki and Trump? Yeah. I mean, from what I know... He talks more about Tim Scott being a possible VP. I think he dreams that he can win back African-American voters. That's that's super interesting to me. I guess he has been beating her up a little bit. But I guess for Trump, I guess I felt like it's kind of a light touch on her. And I, I feel like strategically, and you can tell me whether or not they think this way, Somebody like her, she she doesn't cut into Trump, but she could cut into some of the normies who like DeSantis, right? And so to the extent that Trump benefits ultimately from a larger field, it's not that I think she could win South Carolina. It's that I think maybe she's getting a gentlewomanly 12% and the two front runners are locked in tight and they want that. <laughs> they want that 12% to come out mm. of South Carolina to bounce into Super Tuesday because Super Tuesday for the Republicans is such a massive delegate grab Mm. that you kind of got to go in with some momentum. I don't know. I mean, I could see her thinking like that. I don't really know. 
what about the idea that she would eat into Ron DeSantis versus Trump? Like, does Trump want her in the field? Yeah, I think he does. She does eat into Ron DeSantis. I think everybody does. And Trump wants to encourage others to get into the race with him, right? If he attacks Nikki Haley too viciously, you think Mike Pompeo wants to jump in? You know? Right. Do you think Mike Pence wants to get in the race? You think Tim Scott? Everybody's already thinking about getting in late anyway, right? To sort of play it out. And and it's only an advantage for Trump to have as many people in the ring as possible, right? I think he's actually being strategic about this and just kind of like letting her exist and as a way to invite others to get in. You know, you make such a good point, though, about the timing of people getting in. This is the one thing I kind of give her props for is she got in early because she knows she's got to define herself. She's got to build her profile. But everybody else is kind of going to wait. But what do you make of the timeline? Like, when do you think is an optimal time for Ron DeSantis or even others to start getting in? You sort of want to get in early enough that you get some news cycles to yourself and not become an also ran. But you also kind of want to wait to see if Trump, I don't know, gets indicted, just dies on the vine. Like what's, and I don't mean that literally, I meant that figuratively as in terms of waning with voters, but anything is possible. (laughs) Anything is possible. So like, what do you think the sequence is, the optimal sequence is for people getting in? Okay. So I think the only person who really has pressure to get in by late May, early June is DeSantis. Uh Uh-huh. Because I think that if he doesn't get in, there are going to be more questions about why he's not in yet. There are going to be, you know, stories about, is he dithering? Does he really want to do this or not? There might be lack of confidence in him, just like from voters, donors. Like, he's already presumed to be in the race. So if he pushes it past that late May, early June, I think it's just not a good look for him. So he needs to get in. He's the only one I think needs to get in then. Others are just going to be, like, anxious to build their profile and see, like, a news vacuum. Like, I bet you Mike Pence gets in, like, April or something. You know what I mean? Or, like, Mike Pompeo, they get in in April. And Tim Scott probably could wait a little later. I mean, there's a whole other other group, (laughs) the third rung, I would say, that are sort of like, let Trump and DeSantis kill each other, duke it out bloody, perhaps suicide, murder, mission, maybe only one goes down, but the one that survives is weakened, right? People are turned off by the whole thing. The other few, they can't even make any noise because they're so overshadowed by the fight, the slugfest that's going on. So, you know, they become really non-factors if their campaigns even last until the fall, right? So you're saying people, they get bloodied up and and Chris Sununu is just like, and now... Come August, people just are going to want some Sununu. Exactly. Like suddenly that's what they're going to want. That's the thinking? Yes, exactly. Like great stuff. I'm hearing (laughs) this from Chris Christie land. (laughs) Okay. From Rick Scott world. You know, he's got the money and he's using all his time building his profile. He could jump in, get on the ballot. It's a lot about money to get on the ballot, you know, at that point. And yeah, there's a feeling of like, can you be the Rick Perry late entrant and jump in and, and surge and, Sure, you missed the debate, but it doesn't matter because everybody's lying on the floor dead. This is a this is a thinking right now. I I can see that. I just Rick Perry never became president. (laughs) Exactly. None of these people (laughs) ever became president. But at the same time, every cycle is different. And I think there's a feeling that does it make sense to jump into the pen? You're probably not even going to be heard if you if you get in there. I I really agree with you on this idea that there's going to be like Mm. heats. Like there's going to be this like early heat and there's going to be this like meh middle tier, your Pompeo's, your Pence's, maybe Christie. They don't have anything else that they're doing except books and whatnot. And then there's going to be like the governor's heat. Like everybody gets done with their legislative session. I'm interested in this idea that you actually think there's like a tail heat of people who are like, oh, are you all running it? Nobody can break 25%. Uh, I'll get in and be the last man. That's interesting. If you're rich enough, you can pull it off, I think. Sure, sure. I don't know that Republican primary voters are clamoring for that Rick Scott. No, no, uh, I don't think so. But like, if there was, you know, an opportunity for anyone, it it does seem like the wealthier candidates get in later. Remember Bloomberg got in later. Again, they never win. Totally. They never win, but you have that luxury of sort of feeling out the field. 
Yeah, totally. All right. So listen, I want to dive in to how our groups talk about DeSantis. So your colleague and a previous guest on this show, Peter Hamby, reported recently that two people in DeSantis's orbit are starting a super PAC, one of the most concrete signs yet that he's looking seriously at running, which I guess, as you keep saying, we all presume that he is. So we're going to hear from some maybe Trump voters we talked to over the last couple months. So these are Trump 2016 and 2020 voters that are considering a move away from Trump. And if you've listened to any of the previous episodes of this show, a lot of the themes here will sound really familiar. Let's listen. DeSantis right now has a lot of momentum. And ideally, I'd love for Trump to get it now. We have eight years of DeSantis after. But we need the person who has the momentum now if we really want to go for a win. And the fact that he can't, with his endorsements, can't even get Congress people elected, that doesn't do well for us. We need somebody who can get not only presidential, but also get House and Senate seats elected. I'm not going to pretend to be that versed in his policies, but to what Michael said, I think he handled COVID and the pandemic just in a stellar way. I think he appeals to sort of that all-American family. You know, he's got a strong core, his family units intact, all of that. That's something that appeals to me in addition to, you know, his political viewpoint. So I think what DeSantis has managed to do is to say things in a a more polite stance and has managed to not offend as many people as Trump has. So I think if he were to get in the race, I think he would definitely have the stronger card. I think about what about if there were a Trump DeSantis ticket? And I think it would be a good idea because I think, you know, One thing of why we don't want anything to happen to Biden is we know what's behind him. And Lord knows if we don't want Biden, we sure don't want the next one in in office either. I'm a little hesitant, but but yeah, I would vote for DeSantis in a heartbeat. I'd like to see Ron DeSantis jump into it. I think he has a lot of the same ideologies and views as Trump and relates to people in that way, even though he is like a career politician, he doesn't come across that way. And I just think he's a lot more polished and relatable to people who like Trump, but not how he sends his message. Trump doesn't bother me at all. I mean, sometimes he does. Sometimes I feel like he's being like a child, but as long as he's saying something that is worth saying, I'm okay with it. But 95% of the people I talk to don't feel that way. They just, they're done with them. And I feel like, DeSantis wouldn't have as much riff. Like the Democrats wouldn't always be trying to catch him in something. I mean, they will, but they won't as badly as they're still doing with Trump. Uh, We just grabbed a random five. They always say the same thing. Like this is Trump without the baggage. He's more electable. You know, Ron DeSantis is still a fighter. It's all there. So Tara, you and your colleagues, you know, when you talk to DeSantis world, how does DeSantis run against Trump? Is he going to like gold watch him to death? Like Trump was the greatest president of our time, but you need somebody electable because you can hear how receptive the voters are to the electability message. Or does he need to take him on hard? You know, I'm watching Nikki Haley do this weird strategy where she never criticizes Trump. He's great, but we just need generational change. And I really am talking about Joe Biden, but obviously I'm also kind of talking about Trump. So how does DeSantis take him on? Yeah, I think electability is huge. When you're out of power, electability becomes a bigger issue. Republicans are out of power and they, they're coming off like a very bruising election that I'm actually surprised to hear from the focus group that they attribute that to Trump. I wasn't sure if voters truly understood that he was picking candidates and endorsing the wrong type of candidates, but it seems like it has. And so that's a huge asset for Ron DeSantis. That is going to be DeSantis' strong suit. Like just calling Trump a two time loser, which, you know, you hear Democrats say it, but like Republicans have suffered because of it electorally. So I think it has a bit more of a punch now. So you think he'll take him on directly? Like you think you'll say, look, this guy is losing things for us? Because like Nikki Haley is saying, hey, we've lost seven out of the eight last popular votes, but she's not saying because of Trump. Like, do you think DeSantis has the gumption to say, look, Trump's been costing us elections. We can't keep going down this path. Or do you think he'll elide it kind of the same way I expect a lot of these other candidates to do it? 
I think the rubber is going to have to hit the road at some point. And I don't think it's going to happen now. But I think eventually, Sarah, like when they're in the debate stage, like he saves that for that moment. You know what I mean? So I agree with this sort of, except for the idea of being sure Trump's going to debate. <laughs> like, uh, I guess he does if he thinks that DeSantis is crappy at it. Yeah, that's Trump's like strength. It would be like ridiculous if he didn't get on the debate stage. Like, What is he doing this for? Right. I think you save that ammo for when you're on the debate stage. You know, it's already out there. You can have other people say it. Like, it's just so obvious. But then you actually, like, nail him with it when he's going after your wife and, like, God knows what. Electability is huge. It's way more important when you're out of power. I agree with this. And I agree with it mainly because I've listened to voters say it over and over again for, like, the last six months. They think, look, not everybody, but there's a big chunk of voters, the ones that watch a lot of Fox News, where they have heard other Republicans, other people on the right talking about like, man, we can't keep losing. We've lost three elections in a row. And they are internalizing that. They are frustrated by it. And especially the way that the right sort of catastrophizes around Biden. Biden's an existential threat. Like if you think Biden's an existential threat, then you want to win. And so I think that DeSantis's electability argument is his best one. It really comes through with the voters. But I will say, I also hear like the beginnings in the groups of what I think DeSantis's vulnerabilities are. So Donald Trump came up with the nickname Ron de Sanctimonious, yeah. which is not his best work, no. <laughs> uh, as, as these nicknames go. Although his meatball, I don't know, is that racist? Is it an Italian slur? Oh, is, it, is he Italian, DeSantis? I don't know. I should know this as a fellow Italian-American, right? I think it's more of a meant to be a physical slight, <laughs> but, uh, you know. He's always kind of made fun of Ron secretly for being, like, overweight. It's funny to hear Trump mock someone for being overweight, but he does it anyway, right? And he's always kind of thought that Ron was not that tall, which is another hit mm. on, on Ron. So I'm not surprised Meatball kind of makes it make sense. I'm sure he's just testing it. You know, he has the luxury of that. You know, I think that Meatball tends to be sort of closer to the mark in general. But I did think the sanctimonious, that's a big word for Trump to pull. And honestly, I think it's pretty on the nose. Like, listen to Ron DeSantis's ad that he put out that felt like kind of like a beginning of a presidential campaign ad. And on the eighth day, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a protector. So God made a fighter. God said, I need somebody willing to get up before dawn, kiss his family goodbye, travel thousands of miles for no other reason than to serve the people, to save their jobs, their livelihoods, their liberty, their happiness. So God made a fighter. God said, I need someone to be strong, advocate truth in the midst of hysteria, someone who challenges conventional wisdom and isn't afraid to defend what he knows to be right and just. So God made a fighter. Oh, God. Oh, God is right. Sorry. That, I thought that was a spoof. Honestly, Sarah, it took me a minute to actually think that was real. Have you not seen that ad? I think I got a whiff of it, but had not listened to it like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. You know how sometimes when you're in this business, you read about things, but you never like actually watch it or listen to it? I do. And then I when do. you actually take it in as if I was a target of that message, I have a different emotion. Well, so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is the cringiest thing I have ever heard. And it's one of the things. Yeah. I've got a few little markers that I've laid down over time that have made me really question Ron DeSantis's political instincts. There's a lot in the column of these are good political instincts. Like he's doing this correctly, but like mm -hmm. every now and then, like he drops an ad like this and I'm like, who goes for this? But you know, I always say, you know, I found Trump completely repellent and lots of people find him charming and charismatic. So I don't always have the right nose for this in terms of these voters, but you alluded to this earlier and your colleague, Tina Wynn wrote last summer about how Ron's wife, Casey, is a top advisor of his and a driver of his political mm. career. I think in the piece she said, helping to package far-right outrage over masks, vaccine mandates, and critical race theory for a MAGA light audience. It also sounds from that ad like the DeSantis's can be a bit high on their own supply. So from the totally. newsletter you published this week, it looks like Trump may be attacking Casey soon, and you alluded to that earlier. You also wrote, if there's one thing everyone in DeSantis' world knows, you never cross Casey. So can you just pull tease that out? Tell us more about that. Okay. So 
I mean, there's already a, like a whisper campaign going on right now about perceived scandals around Casey DeSantis, which I don't really want to go into because some of them go pretty low and I don't think are worth airing, although I'm sure eventually they will make it onto the debate stage knowing Trump, right? But I think they see her as a target and someone that, that Ron can't step away from. The most obvious, she's a puppet master. She's the one who created him. Ron doesn't do anything without Casey. And there might be a little bit of truth to that. Maybe not the puppet master thing, but that it's a package deal more so probably than most presidential candidates and their spouses. Then there's just like the kind of stuff that they're spreading around. But I think there's a real feeling that Casey is a way to ignite Ron and to goad him and to get him into the ring with Trump, which is what he really wants right now. He wants to fight with Ron DeSantis. And so they've sort of targeted that. I think it's a strategy. It hasn't happened yet, but it will. They will eventually go after her. They are already putting out info on her now. I have a question on this idea that Trump wants to go DeSantis into the race. Let's say, hypothetically, DeSantis didn't get in the race. Isn't that better for Trump? Like, DeSantis is the only one mounting any opposition. And I got to tell you, we're going to get into some of the group's criticisms of DeSantis. But one of the things I wonder a lot about is, let's say DeSantis doesn't live up to the hype. Do those votes go to Nikki Haley? Do they go to Tim Scott? I don't think so. Right now, I think they go back to Trump. And so... Why would Trump want to goad him into the race? Like, explain that thinking. Okay, so I think it's pretty clear that he is running. So I don't think it's an option of not getting in. I think the earlier he gets him in, the earlier he can sort of take him out. I think Trump doesn't think that Ron can really take him on. Trump, like, needs an enemy. He thinks that Ron is not as strong as he is. I think his instinct is to get him in the ring. He knows he's going to run anyway. So I think that's his feeling is get him in now, not on his time, not on his schedule. Do it now and do it early. That's super interesting. I mean, I guess I could see that, right? If you are Trump and you look at DeSantis and you think, I made this guy. This guy's whole career is built on an imitation of me. The second he gets in, I'm going to reduce him to rubble. What you want is to make that happen as quickly as possible as opposed to – What's happening right now where Ron DeSantis is not running and climbing in the polls and being seen as the best alternative to you. That makes sense to me as a theory, I guess, if it's obvious he's going to get in. So with that in mind, Trump's attack on DeSantis, I got to say, we did a group this week that was a weird group because it was these two-time Trump voters. And anytime we just do a straight screen for two-time Trump voters – They, for months now, have been basically saying the same thing. Don't really want Trump to run in 2024. Think it should be DeSantis. Trump has too much baggage. DeSantis is Trump without the baggage, and we really like him. But this group was kind of down on DeSantis, and I wondered if, like, it's starting to get in the water some of the attacks on DeSantis. Um, Because listen to how this group was talking about him. As they started to learn more about Ron DeSantis and where he really is on the political spectrum and how he's voted in the past. Now, yeah, I'm not sure I would vote for the man. I like the way he interacts with the press. I like the way he handled the COVID thing in Florida. But yeah, not so sure. He was one of the number one advocates for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which would have absolutely completely destroyed our country. If that's his philosophy, he seems more like a, an open borders, globalist, Paul Ryan kind of a guy. Yeah, I have a lot more research before I would ever vote for DeSantis. I'm a little concerned from a perspective because he's still an establishment. And the media gives him extra credit when it's against Trump, which kind of gives me kind of the sneaky suspicion that they know how to play him or something. I don't believe he handled the COVID situation in Florida. You know, if you wanted to get COVID, you went to Florida kind of thing. But, you know, I also liked his little bit of uh, aggressiveness, if you will, by sending flights to other states with people on board, including here in Massachusetts, because, you you know, share the wealth. You know, if the borders are open and there's cities that can take them, send them off. Big points for the Martha's Vineyard play, by the way, uh, typically for Ron DeSantis across focus groups. But this group was like kind of down on DeSantis. And it was weird because they were calling him establishment, which is not a thing I've heard a lot of. And I've wondered if Trump's 
machine on the right has started to seed this or whether this was just an outlier group that happens sometimes or whether like this is the beginning like Ron DeSantis has faced no actual attacks and they're starting to come and both Trump and DeSantis are going to try to like outflank each other on the right DeSantis is trying to do it to Trump on vaccines and things like that Mm -hmm. and Trump's doing it by saying no 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 this guy's a rhino globalist cuck which Donald Trump loves to run against those Is that where Trump's going with the attacks? Yeah, I think so. And I think, can you be more Trump than Trump? You know what I mean? He always wins on that. He can pinpoint someone as an establishment rhino. That's his thing, right? Although DeSantis is subtly doing it. And I think there's just like a lot of whisper campaigns going on with influencers. Oh, DeSantis kind of planting the idea some people were vaccinated like Trump or pushed the vaccine, you know, et cetera. So I think the thing is that Trump cannot really afford to sit on his hands right now and let Ron DeSantis soak up the glory and rise in the polls and not try to chip at his veneer. Planting those seeds right now, that's what he's doing. Sowing doubt about DeSantis, because you don't hear a lot of doubt about him, besides in political circles, about his ability to be a retail politician, to raise money, you know, et cetera, his charisma, his ability on the debate stage. I don't think voters think so much about that, but if you start like planting seeds about personality flaws, issues, who is the real DeSantis, that's what Trump should be doing, I guess, if you see him as a real Bible challenger. And I think in the meantime, encourage the Nikki Haley's, the Mike Pence's and the Mike Pompeo's of the world to get in the race. Do you think that Ron and Don hate each other? Like when did the relationship go south? Because I remember the moment that I started to dislike Ron DeSantis intensely. And it was when I saw the commercial where it's this whole thing is just a testament to Trump. He's with his toddler daughter building a wall out of blocks saying build the wall he's reading the art of the deal to his baby in a trump onesie like it's very gross casey's in it and trump endorsed him and like when did the relationship start to sour and like how sour is it now how good oh it's so sour it's really bad i mean also think about this the person running trump's campaign is Susie wiles who DeSantis like had an epic falling out with and she has no love for him either. So it's like even at like a staff What's the level, deal with the Susie Wiles like, thing there. actually? Do you have a do you have any any goss on that? Uh, what do you mean? Like her status in the campaign or Do you know what the falling out was about or why she went to Trump or how that's manifesting? He accused her of leaking something back in the day when she was working for him. He tried to also get her fired from Trump's campaign. I think temporarily did so, but then he brought her back. He was like on a real mission against Susie. He doesn't like consultants. He was on a war path against Susie Wiles, essentially. So it's it's a strong thing when you've got someone on your team at the highest level who also has very little use for your your opponent and also worked for him. You know what I'm saying? That's the thing. A lot of former Ron DeSantis people work for Trump now. That is so strange. You'd think it would go the other way. No. Because Ron burned a lot of people. I mean, I wrote about this for Politico a while back, that there was like a support group for scarred Ron DeSantis staffers. It just has very little use for staff. He treats them terribly and he burns them out. And they all have like ridiculous stories about what a jerk he can be. And Casey's always been his person anyway, right? That's Casey has been his general consultant and he's dismissive. He's a bit arrogant. He's kind of what you see, (laughs) but to your own staff. So Yeah, you've got a lot of former Ron DeSantis people floating out there. How does that work? How do you staff a presidential campaign that's serious? You can't do it with your wife. Like, that's not enough. She can certainly help. But like, you need a whole apparatus at that point. Is he capable of having that? Or Yeah, yeah. People will come to him because he's like a front runner and he has a ton of money. So, but having a consultant is not the same thing as having people that have been with you through thick and thin for a long time. You know what I mean? Yes, that's, that's true. I, I think he does. He lacks loyalists is what I would say. So yeah, I mean, Ron, Ron's prickly. Like there's a reason why that's out there. Like Trump, I know you said he, you find him detestable. You know, most people do. Um, even people who vote for him, but there's a, the showmanship. People think he's funny. There's something to watch. I mean, there's a lot of questions about whether Ron can also perform. You know, he didn't have his own show like The Apprentice. He's not a natural performer the way that Trump is. But we'll see. I mean, this is all stuff we have to see. And I think Trump's gut is that Ron is a lightweight. Yep. He did endorse him. He barely won the the governorship the first time around. Sure, he won by 20 points or 18 points this last time. But yeah, Trump's like, I made you. I know what you're made of. And I can crush you. So 
let's talk. You know what I mean? Um, but Ron also still has to be governor. He just got elected. That's why the baiting of Ron DeSantis to get in earlier, like he just sort of can't until May. It's not even like you have to get in earlier. You want to just like encourage the dialogue and the fight and get yeah. things out. And I think Trump wants to sow doubt about Ron, not just to supporters, but to donors. He wants to get rid of the appearance of electability and show him like, I can own this guy. So don't think he's a better version of me. Mm-hmm. Don't think he's more electable than me. Do you think Ron DeSantis has always hated Trump or did he start hating him once Trump started attacking him? Probably when like Trump took on Susie, I bet. Uh huh. Got it. You know, and that was right after the January 6th, after the election. You know, Ron was still going to fundraisers at Mar Lago as of like this time last year. And there was a lot of tension and friction there. And now they're not doing things together, I bet. No, not at all. But, but like, it was starting to get to the point where they were like, okay, Ron, enough's enough. Stop coming to Mar-a-Lago. I think the more the talk was about Ron running, him partnering up with Phil Cox, all the stuff, like, it just started to get to the point where Trump was like, no, you don't get to hang around with me if you're going to run against me. Uh, well, obviously, I, I know they're not hanging out together because if you're online the way some of us are, you know that recently Trump had this like real doozy of an unprovoked attack on DeSantis where he truthed a photo of DeSantis when he was a high school teacher drinking a beer with two possibly underage girls. Our group largely shrugged it off. Let's listen. I feel like if it's true, take accountability and say sorry. Like, you know, honestly, like, I don't know. I mean, you never know. Cause like, I feel like a lot of these politicians or rich people have blackmail and stuff on each other. And so, you know, everyone does some stupid things. Yeah. And I feel like, especially around politics and election time, they bring all this out. And it really just depends on how you respond to that. I mean, it's not like Trump probably doesn't do anything inappropriate either. I don't know. I mean, everyone does bad things, I guess. Especially well, he's in tough fall when it comes to that. He's done it all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I just think it's also he's been, a, he's, he's been attacked on every level and he's still yeah. there. They hadn't really heard about this attack on DeSantis because you really have to be on Twitter to have, I think, picked it up. But when they did, they were kind of like, oh, yeah, this is the way that people are going to smear each other. No big deal. What is the deal with this Ron DeSantis picture, though? And can I just say before we go on that this is what you call a groomering, which is when you're somebody who constantly accuses people of being groomers, as Ron DeSantis does, and then somebody accuses you of being a groomer. I'm going to call that a groomering. <laughs> That's a great line, Sarah. Um yeah, it's amazing that Trump would go there, like, especially with his close friendship with Jeffrey Epstein, <laughs> his former friendship with Jeffrey Epstein. The groomerang, uh, you know, affects everyone. It's very low hanging fruit innuendo. I'm not surprised. I think he's going to go lower than that. You know, I think this is just the first taste of what's to come. I think this is an escalation or a downward decline. <laughs> it's like a very sharp slope as to what we're going to get from Trump. But you know, it's interesting that the the focus group said, why did not deny it? And I kind of felt the same way. Like, why wouldn't you address the the issue? Why not deny it or address it? I, maybe that I've got bad political instincts on that. But I think that was sort of what I was expecting. Well, do you know what the story is? I guess, like, are they underage? Like, was he a 24-year-old teacher drinking with underage students? Well, that was what the New York Times sort of wrote in their piece. Did you see that long piece they wrote no. about? Okay. It's all coming from a Times story, which I'm sure... Someone in the Trump universe planned it. You know, you should look into to Ron's time as a teacher. Part of it was that he was known for drinking with, with underage kids around the school. That was what they kind of allege, or at least like soft imply, as the Times does. And so I'm sure Trump team was holding on to that picture, ready to go. Is that you, Ron? You know, who knows? It's pretty, pretty early to run with that piece of oppo. I mean, I guess if it's already out there, he's just going to dig at him with it. But this was a good example of Ron DeSantis not, what did he say? He His response was just like, oh, I don't attack other Republicans. Yeah, exactly. And he just tried to take the high road. But I don't know how long he can do that. Well, exactly. And I think it goes back to this idea that, like you said, and which I really hadn't thought about, how much do Trump's attacks on Ron hurt him with his base? And how much do they hurt Ron? And that's where I think this whole idea of a suicide mission comes in. <laughs> 
you know, a murder suicide mission in which they kill each other and the base is turned off by both of them. Yeah, you're right. You know, talking to you, I think one of the things that strikes me is how important it is to know that the dynamics are not baked. You know, sometimes you can look at this polling and you can think, I don't know, Trump's pretty weak. DeSantis is surging. It's DeSantis is to lose. And like that can still be true. And there can still be a lot of other dynamics that are left to play out as this thing really heats up. Tara Palmieri, thank you so much for joining us today on the Focus Group podcast. And thanks to all of you for listening to the show. Go give it a rating on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen. Uh, And we will catch you guys next week. Thanks, Sarah. This was great. I'm so happy to be on. Everyone, and welcome to the Focus Group Podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and this week we are talking about the future of the Democratic Party. Now, we recently heard from swing voters who had watched Biden's State of the Union speech, and while they thought he knocked it out of the park, they had major reservations about him running again in 2024. And yet, when it came to Biden versus Trump or Biden versus DeSantis, they all took Biden without blinking. Our friend Peter Baker, who was just on the pod, is out with a New York Times story this week about Joe Biden's 2024 strategy. And it boils down to three words, competent versus crazy. And it's possible that may carry the day. But it does seem like Democrats at some point are going to need a better pitch than just, hey, we're not these lunatics. And they're going to need candidates capable of making that pitch that their party is the one best equipped to take America into the future. So what is the future of the Democratic Party? My guest today is someone who knows a little something about candidates who can make an optimistic pitch for the future, former White House press secretary during the Obama administration, and co-host of one of my favorite podcasts, Hacks on Tap, Robert Gibbs. Robert, thank you for being here. Happy to do it. Thanks for having me. So Robert and I both have COVID, uh, (laughs) and so we're just going to have a a political COVID party here, and um, we're going to apologize in advance for some throat clearing, (laughs) maybe a little coughing, our voices being a bit off. Just if you're if you're listening, just we want to emphasize we're we're quarantined. We're not in the same place. That's true. Very distant. (laughs) Even though it would be okay, it'd be okay. We'd just be infecting each other at that point. (laughs) I guess right. We're like the only people who should be hanging out together. So. I'm super excited to have you here because Mm -hmm. one of the things I want to talk about is just like a DC gossip thing that's happening. So Politico uh, this week reported that Biden is delaying his decision and maybe waffling on not running for re-election and that other Democrats are keeping their engines warm. I buy this like zero, not at all. But do you? What do you think? If I hadn't read sort of the headline and the lead, and I read most of the story, I would have come to the conclusion largely that he's running, he just isn't announcing in February because of the State of the Union and all the stuff now that we've seen in the last week with Ukraine. But there didn't seem like there was anything in the article that led me to think that he wasn't going to run. So I read it a couple of times that I missed something. And it just seemed to be like, hey, let's have something out there in case he doesn't. But it didn't to me seem like there was any proof point that would have made me rethink that he's going to run. Yeah, totally. I think there's a little bit of, there's not exactly a news vacuum, (laughs) but it's like Trump made everybody feel like the news had to be like insane, like all the time. And it just feels like people are sad that there might not be a Democratic primary. And there's like just only so much coverage of Nikki Haley they can do right now. (laughs) And so like they like need a dramatic story on the Dem side. But I mean- I have seen nothing, heard nothing that would lead me to believe that Joe Biden's not running. You know, that SNL skit about all the other candidates who might run to me has been the most trenchant observational piece about the state of the Democratic non-existent primary. Because at some point, you look at the 82 years old, you listen to voters talk about what a problem that is for them. And then you say, okay, let's play out the alternatives. Mm -hmm. and. It's not going to be Kamala. Her approval ratings are lower than his are. 
like it seems it seems on one hand impossible to contemplate the idea of an 82 year old running for president. And yet on the other side, it feels impossible to give up the benefits of incumbency, right. run a messy primary when that's one of the biggest advantages you have against your opponents. So what do you think should happen here? Giving the president time and space to make the decision that he wants to make is important. And I say that not because he's Joe Biden or any external factor other than you've got to wrap your mind around the idea that you've now got not just the White House and the country and the free world to worry about, but now you've got a campaign. So getting into it in the right frame of mind and in the right time period, I think is really important. Give everybody the space to do it. They've got to feel comfortable about when they announce because that starts a whole different set of activities. Right. I agree with you. I think there's the power of incumbency. There's the power of the kind of non-messiness of of an intra-party primary. I think there's no doubt that if Democrats were to get into a primary, it would be significantly ideological, as we've seen the past couple of times. I think ideological primaries tend to be harder to put the coalition back together than when I think back to sort of Hillary and Obama, they agreed on almost everything. Maybe, uh, obviously, the, the one big thing was going into Iraq. But all things being equal, that was a coalition easier to put back together because it wasn't a real deep ideological rip. So look, let's play the hypothetical out. I think that Harris would probably go into a a hypothetical primary, at least in the beginning part, not unlike she did in the 2020 race, as the leading candidate, probably. I think, and you and I have had this discussion even on hacks, I think the Democratic bench is fairly deep. I think there's a lot of talented future leaders in the Democratic Party now that have emerged. I'm a huge fan of Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan, but I think you could add in Jared Polis in Colorado, J.B. Pritzker in Illinois, Josh Shapiro in Pennsylvania, Wes Moore in Maryland. I don't know what Stacey Abrams' future is, but it's always been fairly sky high. I think there's just a lot of different candidates that are very exciting out there. So I'm less worried about our future than I think some people might have been. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, and I'm glad you mentioned Gretchen Whitmer because she's a name that actually comes up. A lot of the other ones don't when we talk to Democrats. And let's be clear, right. we've spent the last couple of weeks talking to Democrats, not swing voters, not mm-hmm. Trump voters, not any permutation of Republican voters, but just strictly Democrats. And one of the things that I've sort of observed about Democrats over the last year or so is that while they don't sound like Republicans in the way that they sort of blame Joe Biden for everything, they kind of do sound similar to Republicans in terms of how they feel like things are going in the country. When we just ask people, and we do this sort of at the top of every focus group, how do you think things are going on in the country? It's kind of that right track, wrong track question. Let's listen Mm -hmm. to how they respond. These times are very rough right now because inflation is killing us. So hopefully maybe it'll get better one these days, but we all just need a break. As far as our economy, I'm scared, too, because every time I go to the store, things keep going up. The oil change I'm scheduled for tomorrow went up $10. I'm like, oh, you know, it just nobody cares if you can't pay it. Life isn't normal anymore. And I, too, am so afraid for my granddaughters because they're going to grow up in a society where they have less rights than I did. It's just not right. I didn't want Biden, but I'm glad he was in to be Trump. I feel like the good things is that he's really moved us forward with the pandemic. And honest to God, if Trump were still president, we would have had a larger death rate. It was already large, but it would have been even larger. And no one would have known what was going on. So I think that Biden handled the pandemic quite well. And I'm grateful for that. I think that he is old And we need younger people with new ideas. I don't feel like he takes great stances with climate change. He's done a little bit, but not a lot. He hasn't done a lot with reproductive justice. I think he could have rallied more there. I feel like he hasn't let his vice president take on enough to make sure that her voice gets heard and is respected. He hasn't done much with guns. And that's a problem. He has done some good things. I mean, he's inched things along here and there, and that's good. 
but I do feel like I can't imagine if he's going to run again. I just like, no, I don't want that. You know, it would be really disappointing to me. I'm a single mom as of the beginning of COVID and, you know, no offense, but this whole situation has completely fucked my life. You know, what happens when the executive mom has to go home because they send her kids home for a year and a half? And what happens to me? You know, what happens when both my parents died during COVID and I'm left with nothing? I'm like fighting for my life right over here, hoping that somebody does something to help out the people in America. Trump's not going to do it. Thank God I don't have to see him every day on the TV and hear his lies. But my daughter's almost 17, you know, fighting for her rights, fighting for my rights. My kids can't go to college anytime soon. I can't afford that. They're in public school. Are they going to get killed next week? So those are the type of things all of us are worried about. But I don't see any significant change. So, you know, on one hand, Biden's getting a lot of credit on a lot of fronts. The job market is strong. He's done a really good job handling America's relationship with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And yet people's lived experience still seems to pivot around inflation and feeling like things are just all around bad. Now, these are progressives. It was actually quite a progressive group that we had. We had two Democratic groups, and just by the sheer nature of them, one was kind of more progressive than the other. Mm -hmm. But they still feel like very doom and gloom. And, and some of it is because of what they see Republicans doing. It's around reproductive rights. It's around gun violence. But this seems like a tough environment for Biden to run the second time, especially against let's say like a Ron DeSantis who would have like a good optimistic story to tell about Florida. What do you think about that? I mean, Biden's still hovering kind of around 44% in his approval rating. Do you think he's going in strong and that these voters that, that when push comes to stuff, they'll still vote for him anyway. So like, it's okay. Or do you think that people's feelings about the country bode poorly for him? Lots to unpack. So let me start. Yeah. So I, I think first and foremost, important for the listeners to know that in each of these focus groups, whatever doubts they started with, whatever doubts they enumerated in the Biden versus Trump or Biden versus DeSantis, everybody was for Biden. Yep. Right. So and I think that's an interesting facet that's baked into the cake. You know, what I took away from watching almost two hours of this was that there's both a challenge, but a huge opportunity for the Biden White House. And that is, it, it has to more forcefully tell its story about what it's done to begin to change the circumstances with which these voters are expressing pessimism about the present and potentially about the future. And that is to really give strong lift to the things that he did pass in Congress and how that will singularly impact their lives on health care, on prescription drug costs, on cutting inflation, building roads and bridges, the, the types of things that we know voters want to see. And I think there's a way to tell this story that helps some of the concerns and challenges that Biden does go into this election with. And that is, this is somebody who had the experience to be able to get this legislation done, right? So it's interesting that you heard it a couple of times on guns. You heard it once or twice on climate. He's got to go tell people the biggest investment in impacting climate change in our world was passed by Joe Biden because he had the experience to be able to get it done in a very fractured system. Guns, the first time the United States did anything significant as it related to guns in 30 years happened because he was able to help get that done. Again, using that wisdom and experience. I think he's clearly got to do that. I will say, having spent two years in the White House, trying to get people to understand the intricacies and the benefits of healthcare reform and knowing how hard that is, telling that story is going to be a job for the campaign to take a billion or so dollars in paid media and make sure that people understand it. It is going to be in a very small number of states. Uh, but the only real way, I think, to change that, and, and again, this isn't a Biden thing. This is a bifurcated media challenge thing. And he's going to have to do this with paid media. And I think the second thing is he's obviously and clearly going to have to make this election very, very much the choice 
that an incumbent wants to make an election, right? If it's a referendum, just like in 2022, a referendum is not a good thing, right? As Biden used to tell Obama, as you've heard Biden say now, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. That comparison to the alternative is the match that he wants to get into. Okay, totally agree that the the contrast uh, play is good. The contrast play is especially good if it's Trump. I have been more worried for him if it's basically anybody other than Trump. You're right, though. I, I'll say you're right about the, what's baked in and the head-to-heads. I mean, the swing voting group and both the Democratic groups, like, there was no question about it. It is so funny to see almost everybody say Biden shouldn't run again and also have almost everybody say they would vote for him. Everybody. Yeah, everybody's like, oh, yeah. I'm everybody. In. Yeah. No, because, but this is why, you know, let me ask you a question. I mean, yeah. why do you think that, let's assume a few of these candidates run, Mike Pence, Nikki Haley, Ron DeSantis, Mike Pompeo, what if that candidate group gives that group somehow an inherently different advantage than, say, a Donald Trump? And, and let me give you, my, my theory of this is, I think for all the challenges that Democrats have, and we've heard them in these focus groups, I think the image of the Republican Party right now, and we see this in polling, is quite frankly more challenged than the Democratic brand. And so, yeah, Ron DeSantis will be new. Nikki Haley, to some degree, will be new. But walk me through how they go through a primary and beat Trump and don't come out sort of feeling like an updated Trump. Well, I think it depends. So first of all, I mean, there's a few dynamics I would massage into that. One would be that I'm not sure that Nikki Haley gets through a Republican primary, although we are starting to see hints of how she's going to run. And one of the things I've I've talked about a lot, both on this podcast and just in general, is completely agree with you, state of the Republican Party, and especially what its base voters want, right? One of the things I talk about a lot is the gap between what base voters want and what swing voters will tolerate. Totally. I think that swing voters would love a Nikki Haley. I just don't think a Nikki Haley can get through a Republican primary because what Republican primary voters want is somebody who's going to own the libs, make them cry, be a culture warrior and a fighter, fighter, fighter. And we're going to talk more about fighters because I think Mm -hmm. we're seeing more and more, I think, on both sides sort of wanting this fighting posture. But to me, most of us know Ron DeSantis as this woke warrior governor of Florida. But before that, he's like a semi-normie congressman who like liked Paul Ryan. And this is actually how Trump's planning to attack him. Mm-hmm. Trump is planning to attack Ron DeSantis as a normie establishment guy and that you can't trust him. And I do think that Ron DeSantis has a plan to kind of try to run to the right of Trump and chip away at his base and then find a way to like reposition himself as somebody that swing voters can get behind. And I, I think that's more true to who he is, actually, and that he would be capable of doing it. And if you want to run through all of them, I actually think Pence and Pompeo, I don't know, I haven't seen that much of a Pompeo, but also there's like literally no constituency for Pence. Yeah. Mike Pence will not be the candidate. Mike Pence will not make it out of a Republican primary. I don't know what he's thinking. Like, if he goes to a Trump event, he would need security to protect his life. (laughs) Like, if he thinks this party's going to elect him, he's insane. So so forget that part. The contrast of a 46-year-old governor who just won by 20 points, who's telling a story about Florida and how he kept things open and how they have this gangbusters economy and everyone's moving there. And I'm not sure he's this good of a politician. I just think that contrast is so hard for Biden. Just the energy difference. Yeah, it it certainly could be. But again, I think we're playing out Biden, you know, all the challenges that he has and not sort of attributing that this process that DeSantis is about to go through is going to hang different challenges on him, much like ornaments on a tree, right? And you mentioned it. It's impossible to get through this process. He's going to have to out-Trump Trump, Trump, right? That's exactly where Trump wants to get people, right? Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz all tried to out-Trump Trump. Trump. We figured out Trump plays Trump better than anybody else. So I think it will be interesting to watch what DeSantis does and how that starts to color him in with those swing voters. And what does he have to say? And and are the things that he's talking about or capable of talking about going to be the things that they most care about on the economy, on inflation? And, and I think that's what's going to be interesting because I think right now, and nothing aggravates me more than seeing a national poll 600 some days before a presidential election. 
But, uh, you know, I, I think we're taking somebody who's got name recognition, but not a lot of the sort of challenges that going through a campaign are going to put on that person and somebody who's been in the public eye for decades. I would just caution anybody to make sure to understand that the world's going to be different next week. It's going to be vastly different in 2024. I love that you're pushing back on this because I actually don't hear too many people doing it. I think a lot of people kind of be like, it's going to be hard with Biden being that old against somebody who's younger. But I, I think you're making a great point. I kind of turn this over in my head a lot. The one thing that gives me pause, and I'm just going to play it for you yep. right now, is listening to voter after voter just be like, this guy's too old right. to run for president. Let's listen. We need somebody a good 30... 35 years younger, uh, he needs to, or she, whoever, male or female, I don't care, needs to appeal to the demographic that has really now propelled the Democratic Party to the success of the midterms that we enjoyed. We need to court the demographic that's represented quite a bit in this group right here in front of me. That's really my feeling. But he was the only guy that could save the Titanic from sinking. Mm -hmm. And I'm forever grateful where he's at and what he's done. But God love you. Enjoy your dog in Delaware. Enjoy your wife and your life. <laughs> and, and thank you. But it's time and to say aloha or goodbye, I guess. Not aloha. It's just electability, right? Like, so in age is the reason he's already the oldest president. Add another four years and right or wrong, whether you agree or disagree with him being senile, like the perception is out there and the other side will attack that. And like his gaffes, whatever, they don't bother me because like, look at the last president. I feel like the other side has no room <laughs> to say anything there. However, it's definitely more of his age and the fact that I don't think that he'll be electable. For the last 30 years, I did assisted living across six states and I'm retired now. And I've worked with some amazing, amazing individuals. You know, there's people that I've worked with that have been in their hundred and they've done awesome. I don't necessarily see age as a negative, but I think the rest of the world does. I see it as his electability. If he were to run, I would support him. I just think it's going to be a, a rough hill to climb, even with all the accomplishments that he's had. So and this is just what I hear yep. all the time. That number is not going down, right? It's a it's an immutable truth and <laughs> it's just going to keep going up. Right. Much of the perception around his age is like performance based. Mm -hmm. It's what they see. And so to your pushback, which I think is totally fair, like how will they run a campaign? Because last time yeah. he got to campaign from his basement, he's got to be out there this mm -hmm. time. He has to be giving speeches. Right now, the way that they handle him at the White House is like a very staged performances. But like, it's not a campaign. You run a campaign. It's like the most brutal thing in the world. So just tell me how it works. How do you strategize through that? Great question. Uh, the one thing I'd start with is, and I said this at the beginning of our tenure in the White House. The worst day on a campaign is not nearly as bad as a, a really bad day in the White House, <laughs> right? So the psychic energy and the mental energy and the physical energy of a White House is not something that we can completely discount. I would say a few things. I think he's going to, and this is fairly obvious, but let me give it some texture. He's going to have to prove every single day that he's up to the job, that he's capable of being president of the United States. And I think when he's at his best, let's take this recent trip to Ukraine. I think that gives people the view and the understanding that this is a job that he's very good at and very capable at, right? And not to get too inside baseball, but I thought to myself, man, I cannot imagine having flown into Iraq and Afghanistan a few times with President Obama. I cannot imagine the planning and whatnot that went through getting him on a 10 hour train ride to go through a war zone with no American troops. So I think when he pops up in a place like Ukraine, when he gives that forceful speech in Poland, and one of the things that I'd put over on the side is I think it's pretty clear that Russia and now China, and they're looking like they're going to help Russia more, is going to make experience and foreign policy a big part, I think, of this campaign. Again, I think that goes to the experience and wisdom part that he's got to 
put in front of people. But I think every day he's going to have to show people that he's capable of doing this and doing it effectively, right? This isn't going to be like a one-shot thing. You're not going to say like, hey, let's go jog for a day. And people will be like, oh, okay, he's there. They're going to have to be comfortable with his ability to both do the job now and to some degree in four years of the future, right? So I think that's going to be extraordinarily important. And when the job looks too big for any president, that's when things get really sideways, particularly about how people view them and their ability to do it. We saw this when I was in the White House, whenever things felt a little out of control from the economy or whatnot, we could see our approval ratings start to tick down, even in a very polarized world. I think if you look back, the moment that that Biden struggled the most with in the first two years was that sort of late July, early August, the uptick in the Delta variant, and then the withdrawal from Afghanistan, the job looked too big, right? That idea of competence was really challenged. And so I think they're going to have to make sure, whether it's in a campaign, whether it's in the White House, that every single day they're showing him in a way that makes people feel good about his ability to to do the job. And I think the State of the Union is a great example. He jousted with the Republicans. You saw this in the focus group. He basically baited them into this Medicare Social Security fight. I think that's great. And I think, you know, to your point on, as we were talking about Ron DeSantis and the others, he's going to have to use, and you see this again, State of the Union, drawing that contrast first with House Republicans. We're not going to have a Republican nominee for another 12 months. So, He's got to set up the contrast with House Republicans, use that foil, take that negative image they have and really, really seize on that contrast, contrast, contrast to begin to, I think, make himself uh, into a stronger candidate, particularly vis-a-vis them. Look, there's no doubt that people want, particularly Democrats, I saw this a lot too in the White House, they want change faster, Yeah. right? Yeah. And I think that's part of going to tell that story. That's the fighter I think we're going to get to in a bit. Yeah, well, let's do that. I want to play some sound. Again, this is like from the slightly more progressive group where they were like unhappy about the way the Democratic Party is just handling itself because they feel like they're bringing a knife to a gunfight. Let's listen. We're seriously up against fascism, like a fascist creep. The Republicans are like, they're going by like the dictator, like in Hungary, like they're going by his playbook and like they're going after trans kids. And I was just so angry and feeling like this is like getting dystopian. I mean, Roe versus Wade was, that felt very personal, even though it doesn't affect me here. And then a friend of mine from California He has a lot of Republican relatives that I remember he's like always fighting with on social media, like defending Democrats because, you know, he's progressive, but he's like fighting against his Republican relatives. And then he reminded me, he was like pointing out these good things that Biden did, but now I don't remember any of them, honestly. It was that spending bill or whatever. It was like they did a Trojan horse where they put in, you know, environmental stuff in this bill that they called it like American Rescue Act. But um, I just feel like they're working within the old paradigm of like, you youngsters, you gotta like take it slow. We gotta inch forward. Like, and it also really, really troubling, like disturbing when I see them like bite back against like the progressive quote squad when they like bite back more against them than the actual Republicans. I know he's done some good things, but it's like stuff that's in the background and kind of boring. I don't see any alternatives for Biden really stepping out and possibly running for president. I think they're all kind of sitting on their hands with that. I don't think Biden should run again, but I don't see any, anyone really coming out and supporting some Democratic candidates. I think the squad is, I love them, but I think they're you know, losing power. And I think they're conforming more towards their democratic peers, because I I think they realize that if they don't have some sort of union, that the Republicans are just going to get worse and walk all over them. I love the idea of the Democrats taking the high road. I kind of think we need to like get down in the mud with them and start slinging because I feel that desperate about the direction of our country. And I think 
many other people do too. And I think if we just kind of go at the pace that we're going, we're just going to keep losing ground. Okay. So, you know, Republicans are very clear Mm -hmm. when I do their groups that they want a fighter. That's like the number one thing. Someone who's going to punch back because, you know, Mm -hmm. they believe Democrats are an existential threat to their way of life. But like, I heard a lot of that in these Democratic groups too. And it's not the first time where they see the Republican Party also as an existential threat and they want someone who can really take them on. Now, I think Biden's pitch, right, was that he was going to bring things back to normal against Trump. And that that worked. But do you think that they want something more now? And who do you think the fighters are? Well, first of all, I I was struck by the sort of explanation of the enormity of what the country faces. I mean, look, the the power of a focus group is you hear the personal story, right? You're struck by the depth in which people feel like and worry about basic rights and basic norms disappearing. And we hear this every election, right? This is the most important election of our lifetime. I do think that the reason we're hearing that more or it feels truer more recently is because of what each side feels like are as you said, really existential crises, right? And look, credit to the White House. Back in the fall of 2022, when I felt a little bit of angst around it, I think others felt a little bit of angst around it. Inflation is high. It's really taking up a lot of space. And they're still giving a speech in Philadelphia about democracy. And I think some of us were kind of scratching our heads. But I I think that was an important set of messages and an important set of moments to let people know, yes, there's inflation. We've, we've got to figure out how to make big progress on that, but we can't forget the basic set of rights and norms that we feel are challenged. Again, this is where I think the Republican Party going through this election, they're going to have to grapple with the fact that you know their standard bearer and their president has talked about how this whole thing was stolen from him. And election denier after election denier lost in 2022 because of that position, not because of the vulnerability around inflation. Now, that's not to suggest that inflation, and you heard it in the focus groups, isn't real, right? And I think the administration has to understand that even if the economic statistics look better, it's about how people feel in their daily lives. It's not about where the CPI is relative to the last six months. People have to live where they live. So again, to me, I think you've got to position Biden as the protector And as I said earlier, you've really got to force this choice, right? You've got to say and suggest that what Biden is trying to protect and what Biden is trying to do has to end up being greater than the value set that Republicans are trying to protect and what Republicans are trying to do. We did this, I think, pretty effectively in 2012 on the reelection campaign. We were pretty clear pretty early it was going to be Mitt Romney. So we forced this just push against making what we wanted people to understand about Mitt Romney in a forceful way. I don't know that this White House is going to have that clear of an indication as early as we did in 2012 about who their nominee is going to be. But you can use writ large, I think, the kind of quilt of what the Republican Party is and is pushing for now to begin to really force that contrast. And and again, I think this is where getting into a campaign of Biden versus something else will benefit Biden because they'll see in a way that's different than trying to pass legislation. They'll see a contrast and they'll see a fight. And that fight, I think, is really important for people to see. I think that's right. And actually, I'm going to have these voters back up the perspective you just shared by listening to how they talk about Ron DeSantis. He's smarter than Trump is my impression. Like he'll, he just goes with whatever he thinks will make him popular. I think DeSantis actually believes in, you know, the stuff that he tries to push for. And that is more dangerous. And he knows what he's doing compared to Trump. Yeah. I think DeSantis is worse because he has a more respectable veneer. I don't know. He's obviously convinced like Florida people. I mean, I don't get it how anyone could get on board. I mean, if we're saying like worse for society, I think like both, obviously, but it's just so horrible to think about like kids getting like persecuted. Teresa and Andy, you have me maybe reconsidering 
DeSantis being younger, having a little bit more energy is definitely scary. Maybe Trump having the experience in the office and maybe understanding how to manipulate things in his favor a little bit better. That is something that I think about. But yeah, DeSantis like shipping people around, not uh, being on board with trans kids. That's super scary, too. I'm not sure that the trans stuff is a big winner for the Democrats, but I will say to your point that listening to Democratic voters talk about Ron DeSantis is they they do not see a difference between him and Trump. (laughs) They do not think that he is less dangerous. In fact, they often think he is more dangerous because they think he's smarter. They think he could be more effective. You know, Nate Cohn had this piece in the New York Times this week that I think is kind of interesting about how, like, yes, we're so far away from the actual election, and yet the early polling is often indicative of where we end up, in part because there's a bunch of things going on where people are already making up their minds. DeSantis has really high name recognition among Republicans, but as a result, he's also got really high name recognition among Democrats, and they really, really hate him. And so you think that Joe Biden against DeSantis, you think that's like as good as him running against Trump? Like, how do you, where do you put it? Well, yeah, look, I I think anybody would want to run against Trump. I think Joe Biden would want to run against Trump. Absolutely. And I think if you had to pick a candidate, that's who you'd pick a hundred times out of a hundred. But I do think the point you just made, I think is really important for listeners to understand. It's different than if you look at like in 2000, you know, George W. Bush was able to come onto the scene and lay out his own kind of platform and image as a compassionate conservative. So he actually got to play off of House Republicans and draw his own image. Obama came onto the scene very unknown except for one big speech in 2004, but they were allowed to sort of unwind a bit of how they wanted people to think of them before the negatives truly caught up with them. I think DeSantis made a decision and probably a strategically correct one that in order to be the nominee in 2024, I've got to create an image within the Republican Party that allows me to take advantage of Trump fatigue. That's why he's, it's sort of Ron DeSantis and then a a lot of people way, way, way behind him in terms of who's the alternative to Donald Trump, right? But I, I think it's important, even as a Democrat, I think Ron DeSantis has and again, I don't agree with him on a lot of, of issues, obviously, but he's a smart tactical politician in how he's created an image to get where he is in the hierarchy of that Republican primary. And Democrats shouldn't take any of that for granted. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that a campaign that you'd run against Trump is the same degree of difficulty in terms of what you would run against DeSantis. Look, if DeSantis were the nominee, it's a remarkably challenging campaign. There's no doubt about that. And what DeSantis wants to run is what every challenger wants to run, right? They want to run a change campaign and make it a referendum against the incumbent, right? Whereas again, I think Biden is going to want to make this a choice. Let's compare who's best ready to face the challenges that the country is going to face, deal with those challenges, who has the experience, who has the foreign policy wherewithal, who has the wisdom and the ability to get things done versus somebody who's untested at a bigger stage. That's, I think, the contrast you'd see in a Biden-DeSantis race. Yeah. So I think that's right. And I'll tell you, listening to the focus groups and just thinking about things analytically over time, I have sort of arrived at the conclusion after being for a, a while there man, Biden should really step down. He should let people have somebody new. But I, I've sort of come around to this idea that like giving up the benefits of the incumbency, listening to people head to head, they will all take Biden, not just against Trump, but against DeSantis. But then I hit this wall in the analysis. And the wall is Kamala Harris. Mm. And the the swing group last week, very pro-Joe Biden. They were amped about the State of the Union. And you said head to head, Trump, all Biden. Head to head DeSantis, all Biden. Then you said Kamala Harris versus Trump. And everybody stopped and like thought about it for a long time. And now they were unsparing, the swing voter group, about Kamala Harris, and most swing voting groups are. But this is like the Democratic base 
where I would say they weren't that much better, except when we asked if they were interested in seeing someone else on the ticket, that was still a no-go. Let's listen. If she were to be removed from the ticket, I think like more of the pushback would be less about like the lack of impact she has and more so, you know, this is our first woman vice president, woman of color in office to change that. I guess it would depend on who she was replaced with. But if it was like a white man, for example, there might be like a lot of pushback from like a social aspect. I don't know enough about her. Like people say she hasn't done anything, but I also don't ever hear her name or so I I really don't know what she's doing. And I don't know if the vice president really matters all that much, but changing it up just seems like, oh, then it just be another thing. Oh, he made a mistake and they can just attack him for that, which maybe they'll find anything. But, you know, just another thing. I mean, just don't rock the boat, man. It won in 2020. Don't don't mess things up for 2024. I think it would be a bad move. First of all, we have a woman who is a minority, who is quite brilliant, who's an advocate for women and minorities. And for him to take her off the ballot, I don't think it's her. It's him. He's the problem. Going against Ron DeSantis, he will be killed, I think. People will look at him and say, oh, my God, this old man or this young man who who's taken over florida you know so let's stipulate head to head i see a real path for joe biden but ron desantis is not going to run against joe biden he's going to run against kamala harris he'll run a little bit about joe biden but he'll be like this guy is too old he's senile everybody else is pulling the strings and you know who we really are gonna have to deal with kamala harris and you know what That is not something you have to explain to voters. Their heads are already there, that the chances of Joe Biden getting sick in office or even dying in office are like a real possibility in your 80s. And she would be the natural successor. And they're not that hot on her. And yet he can't actually change her on the ticket. So so it seems like the only path, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, is that they have to start now basically rehabbing her image as vice president. And they've got to get her out there. They've got to build her up. How do you do that? Let's start with, I I agree with the focus group, and it was interesting to see how hardened they were about not changing. It is, to me, hard to imagine a scenario in which that would happen. So I just think it's important to touch on that. And I agree with you that I think it's really going to be incumbent upon the administration to do all that it can to put the vice president into a better position and to bolster as you said, the the vice president, bolster Kamala Harris. I will say this. Let's take the most recent example. I was struck that that her remarks in Munich at the, the security conference that got a lot of play on Saturday, and I know a lot of people probably aren't focused terribly on the news on a Saturday, and then Biden pops up in Ukraine and then Poland, and it, it probably drowns some of that out. But I, I think the White House is thinking about this because you could tell her remarks weren't just the you know, we need to stick together in Ukraine, her pointed remarks talking about Russia as having committed crimes against humanity and holding Russia and its leadership responsible for those crimes against humanity gave her a platform at that conference that was bigger than a normal sort of vice presidential speech probably would have been a few months ago. And I think they're going to have to look for moments like that to elevate her and maybe even give her lines and remarks and announcements that they they would normally have given to a president. When I heard those remarks and read those stories, I thought it was interesting in the sense that that to me might have been one of the lines Biden used in his speech in Poland. They clearly gave it to her in a way that that helped, I think, make her a bigger part of this. They're going to have to look for more opportunities like this and on issues that are important. I think that's why you see, you know, they travel some together at ribbon cuttings around uh, new chips plants and infrastructure projects. I think those are the kind of things that they're going to have to put her equally in the forefront on to make sure that people feel better ultimately about her ability in the event that something should happen. Let me ask you like kind of a behind the scenes question on this, because I guess my impression has been It's been sort of weird how invisible Kamala Harris has been in the first couple of years. It's something that comes up in the focus groups all the time, especially from Democrats. 
It's not that they don't like her. They just sort of thought she had a lot of potential and now they don't see her. And, you know, she's had a lot of negative news stories, staff turnovers, all this. And it, so it seemed maybe like Biden was sort of distancing themselves from her. And now, like, they've got to be a team again. Yeah. Like, they, there's nowhere else to go, right? It's like, Biden's going to do this and Kamala's the person. Like, they just got to do this again together. Like, what a conversation has to happen? Do you look at each other and just say, you know what? It's you and me and that's just what it's going to be. And this is for both of us. And we've got to put on a smile and go do it. Like, are they overcoming a negative relationship or what do you think? I, I don't know that there's a negative relationship. I think there's always a challenge in the White House of the challenge of what I just talked about, of giving those bigger announcements or some of those lines to the vice president. You know, you've got a, a presidential staff that wants to bolster the image of their guy, right? So I think it's a little bit of what you just talked about. Like there's two people in the boat. There, there aren't any tickets off the boat and there's only one way to get to the other side and that's paddling together. And I think they do a understand that. Two, I think they have to make sure that because of the challenges and because of age that people are going to focus on a vice president, maybe unlike you have it normally, that they've going to have to bolster that image and, and give her a a role that's probably bigger than you would normally want to, not because of who she is, but because again, you're, you're trying to bolster the main guy. So I think they're going to have to be very cooperative, very transparent and understand as I do believe they do that this is a ticket, not, not one pulling another. Okay. So last question, and it's really about the democratic bench. Um, I think you and I had, I can't remember if we had this argument on hacks or we talked about. We did. We, okay. You remember. Oh, you remember our argument. Oh, I remember. Okay, great. Uh, I'm kidding. But, so, but I do remember. But so, <laughs> I'm, glad, yeah. I'm glad I left an impression. So I would say when I was on hacks, it was definitely before the midterms. Yeah, it definitely was. One of the things that was interesting about the midterms, it changed my perspective on a few things. I thought Donald Trump had a much bigger hold and I, I was not sure Ron DeSantis was going to run. And I think that that knockdown of Trump and all the people he nominated and Ron DeSantis's win like really shifted the dynamic of like DeSantis had no choice but get in. Like he doesn't announce, but he's already running basically. No um, doubt. But the other thing that it did was it created like a really impressive bench. I mean, I think that, you know, Shapiro uh, mm -hmm. winning by just like clobbering Mastriano in Pennsylvania and that swing state. Whitmer winning by like, I can't remember how much she won by, but it was a big win. You know, it was like a double digit win. Yeah. And there was a number of candidates that I would push back against your Stacey Abrams idea. I think losing twice is not uh Fair. Uh, but Warnock, you know, Warnock, I thought came out looking really mm -hmm. good. So I think that, the Democrats are in this interesting place where like they sort of don't have a 24 person who could be an alternative to Biden where everyone's looking at them saying like, well, just so-and-so could run. And everyone would be like, yeah, so-and-so would be great. However, in 28, there's a bunch of those options, but it's like Shapiro needs time to actually govern as governor, you know, Whitmer, uh, she's in her second term, but you know, feels like she has to do more governing. But tell me where you think the state of the bench is going forward in terms of what does the future look like with these candidates now who I think many of whom are well positioned mm -hmm. to be major 28 contenders? Yeah, and I, I was joking that I remember this because I honestly do remember it because I do think that the bench has always been a bit discounted in the Democratic Party. But I think if you look at just the ones that you mentioned that one in 22, Whitmer, Shapiro, you mentioned Raphael Warnock, who's won now, what, four races in Georgia? He has in, to run a lot a of specials, this guy. Guys. A lot of runoffs. Right. Um, and, and I'd throw in a name, I'd throw in, you know, like a Jared Polis in, in Colorado. Why I think the Democrats are uniquely well positioned for the future Whitmer, Shapiro, Polis, Warnock. Let's just take those four names, right? Michigan, Pennsylvania, Colorado, Georgia. Yeah. Swing states. Yeah. Our guys and our gals win in swing states. And a Nikki Haley won a Republican primary that she had to win to be the nominee in South Carolina when she was governor. But she's not run a tough general election in South Carolina, right? Mike Pompeo is not in a swing congressional district. Mike Pence is from Indiana. A Glenn Youngkin in a place like Virginia 
is a little bit different because Virginia is is a swing state. But I think we're particularly positioned because one, we have good leaders, and two, they're in places that Democrats have to be both the nominee and capable of winning in a general election. Yeah. You mentioned governing, and, and I think what's interesting and why I think the case of a Gretchen Whitmer in the future is so powerful, they've got the legislature for the first time in the history of the state. So she can she can be governor without having to just play defense, right? She's the governor and is now able to really get some of her stuff done, passing big tax cuts for working families. Those are the types of things that help bolster that resume going forward. I, I think there's a lot to be excited about in the Democratic Party. And that's not to mention, there's obviously others, right? I think Gina Raimondo is a remarkably talented public official and public servant. And uh, Pete Buttigieg also has got a bright future depending on what he wants to do and when. So I'm pretty optimistic about the bench in a way that I think Democrats have been overly worried about. And the last thing I would say is each of those candidates that we've just talked about are unique and interesting. And we're always sort of looking backwards. Oh, we need our X. Oh, who's this year's Barack Obama? Who's this year's Bill Clinton? Who's this year's John Kennedy? That's not really how it works. We've got very talented campaigners, very, very talented public officials. To me, the, the future of the Democratic Party is remarkably bright. And just to just to underscore this, I'm just going to play a little bit of sound. And, and I'm going to set it up by saying there was this real asymmetric response that you would get from Republican groups versus Democratic groups. Because if you'd ask Republican groups like, hey, if Trump doesn't run, who do you want to see run? They'd have a bunch of names that they would throw out. But if you ask the Democrats, who do you want to see run if it's not Biden? Because they would say they didn't want Biden to run. They didn't have names. That has started to change. That's changed. Listen to these voters now. I think Gretchen Whitmer from Michigan, I think she'd be great. I really liked Cory Booker in 2020, and I don't know why people didn't like him or Elizabeth Warren. I would have voted oh, yeah. for a million yeah. times over. I really mm-hmm. liked her. But then again, after what happened in 2016, where they couldn't get people to vote for a woman, I'm also like, electability, which sucks. Because I, I mean, if I were choosing a candidate, if I could pick the president myself, I would choose Elizabeth Warren. But I don't know, just worry about her electability after 2016. Katie Porter, because yeah, <laughs> I like Gretchen Widmer from Michigan. I would be on board with Stacey Abrams, but I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> I love Stacey. Stacey. I love her, but she's not been able to get past governor here. So I worry too much about that. I mean, especially now considering we're a blue state. She's run for governor two times now, and she hasn't won within a reasonable margin, you know. So that's the scary thing, but she's more than qualified. So I just want to reflect on one last way in which these Democratic groups are starting to sound a little bit more like Republican groups, which is their big pitch for Ron DeSantis over Donald Trump is not because they don't like Donald Trump. They like Trump fine, but they don't think he's electable. They think that, that Ron DeSantis is more electable. And these groups, in ways that is, I think, different from where they've been, are now They're turning over a bunch of new people in their heads that they see emerging in the party, and they're thinking about electability. And they're saying, who of these people can win? But I would say what's interesting that I hear in these groups, they sort of like the more progressive candidates, right? They say Katie Porter. They say, you know, Stacey Abrams, although Stacey Abrams isn't particularly progressive, actually. But like Elizabeth Warren is really more progressive. But then they kind of walk themselves back and think like, who could get elected? Who do you think? in the future of the party, I mean, it sounds like you kind of just answered this. It's these swing state governors. Do you see the party moving towards an electability model after Biden that maybe compromises some of the progressive side of what they may want more in their hearts? Well, I I do think Democratic primary voters go through a couple of different gating decisions, if you will. (laughs) We want to fall in love with a candidate, right? We want to be inspired. We want to go into a full swoon. And then we have to go through this idea of, okay, now that I've fallen in love with this person, can they actually get elected? While I've mentioned a bunch of swing state candidates that I think would be remarkably powerful, that doesn't mean that's the only list for me. The reason I say that, and like you, I was struck by 
a lot of the challenges that they, they give Biden are not that they think he can't overcome that challenge. They're worried that he can't overcome the perception of that challenge, which is, which is fascinating. Totally. They mentioned Katie Porter. She's actually in a swing district in the California congressional district. Look, if she gets elected to the Senate in California, it's a big if because there's going to be a, a, a wild primary. And quite frankly, she's going to have to win two elections. She's very much going to shoot into that top tier group of people. I, look, I, I would say this. I go back to my experience with Obama. And we had a challenge initially with black voters with Barack Obama. And your listeners are probably saying, well, why? Well, black voters in focus groups, and we saw this in polling, they, they love Barack Obama. They love what he stood for. They supported him. They did not believe that the country would elect Barack Obama because of his skin color. And when did that begin to change? When a very, very white state of Iowa supported him in the caucus. That boosted him going into a place like South Carolina with a big black vote in a primary. So to me, campaigns are interesting because we think a lot about them and then we run them. And often what we think about them when we go into them is different than when we run them. And that's why it's sort of like that adage of it's why they play the game, right? You can think you know who's going to win the game, but it's the strategy and the things you do within that game. I think a candidate that can prove they can win in a tough place can overcome the concerns about electability. I think you heard somebody in that group say, oh, I'm worried they're not going to elect a woman because look what happened in 2016. I think if a, hypothetically, if a Gretchen Whitmer or a Katie Porter were running for higher office, a Gina Raimondo, a Kamala Harris and they won a series of big primaries, I think that would help prove to the Democratic electorate that had perception concerns, okay, maybe they can win. In many ways, seeing them do that is what helps to wear away that perception concern that it won't happen. Uh, I love that. Even with Nate Cohn's telling us that where things are now might be really indicative to where they are later, you got to play the game because you never know what's going to happen. Robert Gibbs, thank you for coming and talking this all through with me while you had COVID and I had COVID. This was great. And I uh, hope you'll come back again next season. Love to do it. And thanks to all of you for listening to another episode of The Focus Group. Go tell all your friends that they should be listening too and give us a rating on Apple or iTunes or wherever else you listen to the show. We will catch you next week. everyone, and welcome to the Focus Group Podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and this week we're talking about the prospect of a national divorce. If you missed it, a couple weeks back, Marjorie Taylor Greene tweeted, We need a national divorce. We need to separate by red states and blue states and shrink the federal government. Everyone I talk to says this. Everyone she talks to. But Marjorie Taylor Greene's social circle notwithstanding, there's no doubt our country is facing deep internal divisions. And MTG isn't the only high-profile figure to raise the prospect of secession, national divorce, and civil war over the past few years. But how interested are Americans really in breaking up? Our focus groups have some thoughts. My guest today is David French, newly minted New York Times opinion columnist and author of Divided We Fall, America's Secession Threat and How to Restore Our Nation. David, my friend, thank you for being here. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's an honor to join you. Do you feel good about the fact that I said national divorce? Get me David <laughs> French. That's who I want to talk to. I really have mixed feelings about being the first call when national divorce comes up. Yeah. <laughs> but... I don't know what to say. You literally wrote the book on the potential of a national divorce. And so, you know, I think just to set the stage for this conversation, can you just give us like the thesis of the book? Yeah. Yeah. The thesis of the book is really stated in the first sentence of the book, which is that there isn't any truly national, cultural, religious, social, political trend that is pulling us together more than it's pushing us apart. 
So all of the major social, political, cultural, religious forces are pushing us apart into separate camps. And this is happening not just in the sense of you and your neighbor being pushed apart. We're being pushed apart on multiple fronts, including geographically, for example, that people are super clustering into very bright red, into very bright blue parts of the country. We're clustering culturally. We're clustering religiously, like religious faith and practice is not evenly distributed across the United States of America. Just on point by point by point, there are forces that are stretching us and pulling us. And what I wanted to say was we can't do this indefinitely without serious consequences. Yeah. Although, can I just ask, what, every time somebody brings up the national divorce, I know in your book you kind of lay out two scenarios, one yeah. where Texas secedes, one where California secedes. But like national divorce doesn't make any sense. Like the red states, blue states thing, they all have blue cities inside of red states and we are all intermingled right. and also – Based on Thanksgivings, as best I can tell across people, you know, <laughs> share this, these different political opinions with people that they love. So every time somebody says this, I'm like, this is deeply stupid. This is never going to happen. Why are we talking about it so much? Is it actually more a social signaling way just to be like, no, we really hate you guys? Like, is that really what it's about? Well, yes, uh -huh. it is. But OK, so. Yes, there's absolute social signaling where we're in a competition, and I see it more on the right. I don't see so much national divorce rhetoric coming from the left. I see it more coming from the right, where there really is this sort of cultural competition on the right to who is going to be most aggressively anti-left, mm -hmm. right? And so it's hard to beat, well, let's just break up the country <laughs> as most aggressively anti-left. So some of it is this social signaling, I'm the toughest right winger in the room kind of thing. I'm so tough that I would want Texas to secede or Tennessee or Georgia to secede. And so there is some social signaling here. However, at the same time, and I actually want to write about this, I think a lot of the folks were saying, well, look, I mean, we've got blue cities and red states and got red areas and blue states. There's no way all of this would happen are just a little too Pollyanna-ish in my view, because- mm. If you go back to secession in 1861, if you go back to the American Revolution in 1775, moving into 1776, much of the same stuff was true. There was a mixture of communities throughout the American colonies. There was loyalist communities and there were revolutionary communities and they were often in the same city. They were often in the same colony. In secession, there were parts of the South that didn't want to secede. I mean, this is where you get West Virginia, for example, East Tennessee. I live in Tennessee. East Tennessee had a lot of unionist sentiment. There was unionist sentiment in the South. This was not a universal sentiment towards secession. And if you look across the world, you'll see, for example, the United Kingdom came very close to its own separation with the Scottish referendum. You know, the majority of people in Scotland voted to stay. But if 55% had voted to leave, <laughs> Scotland might be independent, as messy as that would be. And so if you're talking about secession, what you're often talking about here, if you're looking at sort of historically, I mean, we've had various attempts. Uh, Quebec and Canada has had various referenda about secession and leaving. There's no such thing sort of historically as, well, everybody wants to break off here. Right. And everybody wants to stay here. If you have super majorities, Tennessee is a is like an R plus 20 state, even though it has a blue Nashville and a blue Memphis. If you had a plus 20 vote for secession, then Nashville's coming along because it lost. And so I think that this is a thing where people look at this sort of patchwork of blue cities and red states and forgets that. In any kind of separatist movement, you're always going to have dissenters, and the presence of dissenters doesn't mean that the separatist movements don't succeed, as we've seen from our own history. All right. Well, then I stand, you know, more afraid. <laughs> you know, you're not the first and you won't be the last person to accuse me of Pollyannish uh, thinking about people. <laughs> and I like to just think that this is not a thing that could really happen. And to me, it's it's more, I've always felt like it's a way of talking about 
a dissolution of trust and fidelity and like good feeling between all of us that can manifest itself in violent and terrible ways, but that like the logistics are too hard. Like in some ways we're such couch warriors and like keyboard warriors now that I'm not sure we could muster the energy to do the real logistical work of a national divorce. But (laughs) I want to play you just as a setup here. This is actually from just some accumulated clips because people do talk about the idea of national divorce, civil war, and just like how tense things are all the time. It is a through line in the group. So let me just hit you with a smattering of what we hear. I see this buildup of of like a different type of civil war almost, where it's like, it's not a civil war of fighting. It's a civil war of words and and legalities. Civil war seems, you know, sooner rather than later, it's getting very difficult to talk to people who do not agree with you uh, without getting offensive or um, activating their defenses. We should be able to agree to disagree. We should be able to get along. I've never seen it like this. I'm 57 and I've never seen it like this. We're almost out of civil war. (laughs) I mean, the way that we're trending with violence, look what happened with the riot in January. Like before that, nobody would have ever imagined that like on a, government building that was unimaginable but now that it did happen even there's definitely people out there that are like okay it's not a fortress it can happen we can make this happen so it is scary to think about like i I don't hope for it and would never wish on it but it's scary and i think it is a possibility just with such polarized ideologies and people seeing that you know these things are possible and we may possibly get away with it i think a lot of these recent events are making it seem like it is a bigger possibility. I wouldn't be surprised if it took another civil war, to be honest. I honestly could see that in our cards in the near future, because I don't see what else, aside from some huge radical change like that, is going to do anything. So, David, here's my notice about these comments. These people aren't advocating for a national divorce or a civil war. Right. They just think one might be coming based on what they're seeing around them. So you and I are both big fans of a group called More in Common, and they do these great studies sometimes around how we perceive our ideological opposition, and we often impute much deeper things onto them than is true in terms of what they really believe. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if this is one of those things where people like overemphasize how another set of people thinks about something and the actual number of people who might want a national divorce is actually very small. What do you think? I would say that the actual number of people who really truly want a national divorce is very small, relatively small. I mean, if you're talking about in the millions, yes, but as a percentage of Americans, low. But here's the problem, Sarah, and let me be very clear. I do not think a national divorce is going to happen. The thing that I was writing about in my book was we're getting so polarized that Mm -hmm. it's possible. It's not probable. But if we're in a position where it's even possible, that's a scary thing. And so what I would say, and you said this interesting thing right before those clips Mm. about keyboard warriors, and that goes both ways. So Yes, keyboard warriors are not the kind of people who are going to get in the streets, right? But guess what? Keyboard warriors are also not the kind of people who are going to stop something once it starts unfolding. They're passive participants and commentators about events that they're not in control of, that they're not going to exert their will over one way or the other. And one of my big concerns is the minority of Americans who are extremely activated politically are extremely polarized and hate each other very much. (laughs) And the, the more in common data is both reassuring and not. It's reassuring in the sense that what it says is, look, the vast bulk of us are not in these polarized edges and extremes. And in fact, if you're a typical Republican, you think the average Democrat is a lot more extreme than they are. Or if you're a typical Democrat, you believe that the average Republican is a lot more extreme than they are. There's a lot more commonality than we believe. That's all the good news, right? The bad news is the term for that group of people is the exhausted majority. Now, why is that bad news? Because the word exhausted, (laughs) they are like, to use an illustration, You've seen the gif of Homer Simpson with his eyes wide, kind of backing into the shrubbery. 
Love it. That's the exhausted majority. Their eyes are wide. They're looking at all this toxic mess and they just kind of back into the shrubbery and it leaves the field of political engagement to the most angry, most energized minority. And so you can be a majority. You can be frustrated at how contentious politics are. But if you don't exert your will, you're going to leave the field to that most activated minority. And that's what really concerns me. I don't think the bulk of Americans, there was this really great moment at the very beginning of the focus group about national divorce with the Trump voters, where her comments were brought up and most of the Zoom room laughed like, ha ha, that's absurd, right? But if you're not exerting that as a force of will, you leave the field to the people who are deadly serious about this stuff. And so that's why, you know, when I think about national unity going forward, that exhausted majority, so long as the the operative word is exhausted and not majority, we face a problem. Once the operative word starts to be majority and not exhausted, yep. then we've got a chance to, to work our way through this. Well, I'm glad you gave me the segue. I, I do want to ask you a question when we're, when we're done about whether or not your feelings have changed at all since you wrote the book. Mm-hmm. But before I do that, since you brought it up, I want to hit this set. I sort of felt like this group was made in a lab for you, David. Like as I was watching the group, I was like, this is such a good group for David French to watch uh, because it's like <laughs> they're two time Trump voters who definitely don't want Trump to run again. They do not like Trump and they're DeSantis people, but they're still quite, I would say, of the right in, in yeah. almost all the ways. But you're right. When we read them, Marjorie Taylor Greene's tweet, here is how they responded. I think she's just silly. She's not serious. I mean, she definitely appeals to that super far right group, I guess, whoever votes for her in Georgia. I just think she's like the AOC of the left side. I just don't pay much attention to what she has to say. I don't really understand what she's saying. Maybe somebody could explain it to me. A divorce from what? I don't understand. Basically, she thinks that the red states and blue states should each become their own countries. Oh, If Democrats move into red states, they shouldn't be able to vote for at least five years. Oh, God. (laughs) Kelly was right. Kelly was right. Don't listen to her. (laughs) Yeah, she's there to fire up the the far right wingers. I mean, which, okay. I mean, I guess you kind of need somebody like that on the team, too. But you don't really put anything into it, like Kelly said. I mean, it's the hot air. You know it's coming. And you know what her job is. and, And she does it well. But. You know, that's what she does. So they're like, this is stupid. But to me, actually, part of what was funny is the way that they perceive Marjorie Taylor Greene as having sort of like a legitimate role in the coalition. Yeah. Like you should take her seriously, but not literally. Yes. What what did you make of how the group reacted? I thought that was such a textbook example of countless conversations I've had since late 2015, which is. One of the responses people have to some of the most outrageous rhetoric on the right, whether it comes from Trump or it comes from Marjorie Taylor Greene or Matt Gates or you name it, is they laugh. Okay, there's a oh, that's ridiculous. Oh, you can't take that seriously. Now, there's no real condemnation to it. In other words, that's dangerous. Don't say it. It's like that's absurd. Don't take that seriously. And I just heard this for years with Trump. Oh, ha ha. That's funny. Oh, that's ridiculous. And that's the seriously, not literally. But at no point there the sense of, well, that's just too far to be in our coalition. That's right. right. (laughs) Like that's too far. And so I just felt like I was watching a rerun of all kinds of conversations I've had from everything around dinners in restaurants locally to conversations with old friends about all of this rhetoric. The sad thing is, though, as they're laughing, and I think they know this, and this was hinted at in in the focus group, they know there are a lot of people who are not laughing. Right. They know there are a lot of people who take this seriously, and they're part of the family. And, you know, one of the things that's distressing is that this idea that, well, we know they're extreme, we know not to take them seriously, but at the same time, we're not really going to say this is way too far or we're going to exert any will to sort of purge this from the larger right wing coalition. It worms its way in. 
I don't get the sense from hearing that that they're going to actively oppose Marjorie Taylor Greene. They're just going to kind of keep her at arm's length. That's right. So she has a role to play in the coalition. She's not their cup of tea. Right. But they're not like mad about her. And the thing that I notice, I hear this a lot actually, where people say she's like AOC, right? Right. They see a, like a mirror image on the other side. And so therefore the what about him kind of justifies that, well, the left has people like this in their coalition. So we get to have people like this in our coalition. But I got to tell you, when I was watching this group, I was reminded of something. One of the things I get yelled at the most for online is whenever I say I really like a lot of the people that I listen to in the groups. And part of the reason is like so many people in this group, their moral compass was not horrible. But there was a very troubling part about why Nikki Haley could not be the president. And it was super like, wow. No world leader would take a woman seriously. And it would get, oh gosh. again, it was like a little bit heartbreaking because, again, it was a it was a perception thing. Although I hear Democrats do this with Pete Buttigieg where they're like, I would vote for a gay guy, but I'm not sure other people would vote for a gay guy. And so these people, including the women in the group, were like, well, I would vote for a woman, but unfortunately, I don't think other people would or I think world leaders wouldn't take them seriously because of how these other countries are. But in any event, so there are things that they said that I wasn't wild about, but like for the most part, they were decent people who recognized like that Trump is bad. They voted for him twice, though. And this to me, I find myself understanding these people and then also thinking that these are the most dangerous people because these are the people who sort of know better, but there's no leader or anybody else who is appealing to the good nature that's inside of them that you hear coming out and is pulling on those best instincts to say, we have to resist this. This is actively bad for the country. Right. Right. That's the key here is that, and I've said this a million times to folks who've asked, well, how can all of these folks continue to vote for Donald Trump in spite of everything? Well, we just heard some of the the ways in which this happens. One is there's always a what about. Yep. So there's somebody else on the other side, always a what about. Number two, there's a minimization of what's negative about Trump or the Trumpist movement, sort of laughing at the excesses, not taking it incredibly seriously. And then number three, there's the question of identity. And the identity is, well, I'm a Republican. And so why wouldn't I vote for the Republican? And He's the Republican nominee. People have asked me a million times, well, why did so many evangelicals vote for Trump? And the answer is one sentence. He was the Republican nominee and they're Republicans. And so there's this absolute unwillingness to sort of say, this is so far beyond the pale that I'm going to break with this kind of core sense of identity that I have to actively oppose it. And then therefore what that means is, However far Trump goes or Marjorie Taylor Greene goes, there appears to be no direction they can go that will put them actually truly beyond the pale for the vast, 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 vast majority of Republicans. Now, we've seen from 2022, for example, that there might be a 2% or a 3% or a 4% who are not going to go that far, that will not vote for, say, a Herschel Walker or a whatever And that's enough in close states to really make all the difference. But the bottom line is there's a 90 plus percent of Republicans who will go as far, as far as their politicians take them, so long as their politicians remain Republican compared to the Democratic Party, which is just not an option for them, period, end of discussion, no further conversation necessary. And that is exactly how this group was. I mean, there were people who said, and I hear this all the time. Everyone's like, look, as long as they got an R by their name, like I'm going to go for them. You know, like I got preferences within the group, but like as long as they got that R, they're going to be better than what we've got. And actually, just to back up your point, we're calling it the anti-anti-national divorce uh, sentiment, uh, which is exactly what you were just describing. Let's listen. We are not united. Everybody is just button heads. They get in and then they start calling the other people names. And saying how wrong they are. We don't know anything about compromise. The Democrats' idea of compromise, for an example, on gun control, their idea of a compromise is we'll take only half of what we think we should take. Compromise is give a little and take a little. They don't give, they take, they take, they take. 
They keep taking rights away. They don't give you anything back. They're not taking all of what they think they should take, and that's a compromise to them. I think some people, probably just the far right, but they definitely agree with her. A lot of people think this country is headed for a revolution. I mean, it's ridiculous the way it's run right now. And who has the power? It's not Biden. I mean, he's just standing up there. And, you know, who does run the United States? You know, I don't know. But I definitely think that she's not totally off base on some of the things she says. Because I've even looked at, if that ever happened, I would move to a a red state. I mean, I live in California. I want to leave California. I am victimized by the politics here. I do not like them. No, I don't. That's Dr. Seuss. But anyways, obviously I have children. But the point is that I would love to live in a red state instead of a blue state. I love this woman who makes up Dr. Seuss rhymes about being victimized about living in a blue state. So one of the things you talk about that I also talk about, you and I are frequently on the same page about this, is the role that leadership can play. You know, towards the end of your book, you lay Mm -hmm. out what, what you call it James Madison's vision of pluralism. So explain that and why these voters might benefit from a more concrete understanding of pluralism. Yeah, yeah. So James Madison wrote Federalist Number 10, which is the best Federalist paper. Best. And the best Federalist paper. And so in Federalist 10, what James Madison does is he talks about expanding the sphere of the American Republic. In other words, the way that you deal with dissent and debate in profound disagreements in what he calls like the danger or the violence of faction is not by trying to suppress factions because then you're aiming straight at liberty. You're gunning straight for liberty, which undermines the American Republic, the American experiment. And so Madison's, you you can't do that. Here's the caveat. This is a guy who was a slave owner. So was he living up to his ideals? No. Are the ideals as described in Federalist 10 good? Yes. So what does he say in Federalist 10? He says, what you essentially need to do is to dilute the disruptive power of faction by allowing factions to bloom. In other words, you don't have to defeat or suppress another person to live according to your core values. The sphere of liberty in the U.S. is broad enough to where a variety of communities can live side by side with each other. People who have dramatically different points of view can live side by side with each other possess the same amount of liberty, possess the same rights of free association and all of the things that we possess to allow us to create thriving communities. And we expand the sphere. We make the sphere of liberty bigger. We make the sphere of faction bigger so that we don't have that zero sum game where if Democrats win, then somehow my ability to live according to my core values diminishes, or if Republicans win, that the Democrats' ability to live according to their core values diminishes. And so that's sort of this core vision of pluralism. And if you look at the Constitution, the Bill of Rights and the Civil War Amendments together are this big one-two punch that says, here are all of the baseline rights that we have, human rights that we possess as Americans, that we all possess, and that cannot be taken away by losing an election that cannot be taken away by living as a red minority in a blue state or a blue minority in a red state. If that social compact gets threatened, then we face real problems. And every time we have faced critical sort of nation defining problems, it's when we have violated that social compact. So slavery, for example, violates that social compact in the most dramatic of ways. Jim Crow violated that social compact in the most dramatic of ways. That is when we're talking about a situation in which we look at an election as having existential consequences for our ability to function within the American social compact. That's when we're in a very dangerous place. Oh, which is exactly where we are. Um, (laughs) The other thing I think you and I both we'll talk about a lot and agree on is is the nature of of leadership and how yeah, yeah. how critical it is and one of the things I talk about a lot that's my favorite parable I guess uh, it's called two wolves and, and and they're they're fighting and and the question is is like well which one wins and the answer is the one you feed and and the reason that I like that so much 
is that what I feel like politicians are doing right now is I believe, and no one's going to talk me out of it, that people are essentially good. And that Americans, because of the built-in infrastructure that we got from our founders, are especially inclined toward pluralism. You know, every dollar we have says out of many one on it. And like, you know, right. it's, it's built into our American infrastructure and we don't live up to it, but we still have like the best tools. Um, I think of just about anybody else. But the problem right now is that I listen to these people and I can see they take care of their families. They volunteer at dog shelters yeah. and they love their kids and their grandkids. And yet the most unbelievable things often comes out of their mouths. My special favorite is one, and you just heard some examples of this, where they're like, yes, things are so bad. Like, it's like a powder keg. People are really angry or whatever. And like 10 seconds later, like, and it's those stupid Democrats that won't, you know, get yes. on board with whatever. But the point of the one you feed is that means it's what they're taking in, right? It's their inputs. And the leadership is this key element to how you bring yeah. out the better angels of our nature. And so like, talk about how critical leadership is, because that's in your book. You agree with this. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, the leadership point is really important. I was listening to an interview and, oh gosh, uh, Kristen Soltis Anderson, I believe. And Kristen, I'm sorry if I'm misattributing this to you, but I, I remember hearing an interview where they were talking about polling Republicans and how important the person at the top of the ticket is to Republican views on issue after issue after issue. So, for example, going back several years, single payer health care would be an inc incredibly low support for Republicans. But then as soon as some Republicans learned that Donald Trump had said some nice things about single payer health care, their esteem for single payer health care went up. Right. What the leader does is the leader sets the course of a cultural river. And so the direction that the river flows, whether it's towards integrity, whether it's towards compassion, et cetera, or whether it's towards division or towards anger, it's not that you can't defy the leader, but it's exhausting and hard mm -hmm. because you're swimming upstream. And so we saw this in the Trump era in abundance. So Trump set a particular tone of endless combativeness, of constant rage. And if you were going to go against that cultural tone on the right, it was exhausting. It was hard. And people could do it for a while. A few people did it all four years of his presidency, but it was really, really hard. And by 2020, you know, one of the things that I saw in this very red area of America where I live is people hadn't just given in to the course of the river. They were swimming along with the course quite merrily. So you went from holding your nose in 2016 to third bass boat in the boat parade in 2020. Yep. And it was that power of the cultural river. And now, would the Republican Party be like that if Mitt Romney had won in 2012 and was running again in 2016? Absolutely not. That's right. It would be a very, very different party. But that's what leadership does. It sets the course of the cultural river. And you see it in military units. You see it if you're working at a McDonald's for a manager, if you're working in an insurance company for the manager, you name it. From the top down, there is a cultural course that is set. And that's one of the burdens of leadership is you have to set that cultural course in the right direction. And, you know, one of the powers, if you want to go back to our founding documents, for example, the statement that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, was setting a cultural course for the United States that we were often contrary to, but had enormous power over the course of the next two centuries plus to where eventually we started to get more and more and more in conformity with that vision. And one of the things I fear about the right is the cultural course of the river that is being set is towards conflict, towards division, away from honesty. I mean, just look at the Fox News revelations regarding the 2020 election. There is such an incredible pressure to conform with that Trumpist culture now that it's just radiating up and down the rightward part of the spectrum. Yeah. And, you know, I'd imagine you'd get a little pushback on this idea that that there's not something 
endemic in the Republican Party, right? There's there's pushback that says, well, voters craved this. Like there's a part of the party that wanted Donald Trump. And I, I think that's invariably true. But I also think this is how Charlie sometimes puts it. And I've always liked this formulation that there was absolutely a recessive gene within the Republican Party yes. that was populist and demagogic and had all of these things that allowed Donald Trump to sort of get in there with his plurality. And yeah. it's not an insignificant part of the party. But this group that we were talking to is 100 percent people who voted for Mitt Romney and then became socialized differently through the course of mm-hmm. Donald Trump. So I always say like, yes, it was a recessive gene that became a dominant gene in part because Donald Trump had a genuine impact and changed a cohort yes. of voters within the conservative coalition that like actually cared a little bit maybe about some free market stuff or limited government. Or I call them normie conservatives, which is, I don't know why, because yeah. I need some broad terms to describe people. Um, this is the kind of group where there you see the most change. Yes. And they would have been part of that old coalition, and they're different now. They sound different. Yes, 100%. So on both counts. So number one, Yuval Levin has said this very well, that there's a George Wallace constituency in American politics. There always has been this sort of populist, mainly white working class populist part of American politics, whatever it is, 15% of America, 20% of America. And Trump tapped into that group pretty decisively. And in fact, one of the things that sort of saved us from that group is it's not all been in one party, Mm -hmm. right? So it's been a a minority of, it is now, and which makes it far more powerful. But then once this minority group, because remember, Trump clinched the nomination with the lowest percentage of the popular vote in the history of the Republican open primary era. But once he clinched it, and he became the Republican. The course of the river was set. And you can just start to see this on issue after issue after issue. Sarah, one of the, one of the most consequential is Ukraine. So when Russia invades Ukraine, you can see this instant, instinctive response on the right to oppose Russian aggression. Just it's been built into the right through the Cold War, <laughs> through Romney telling Obama that Russia is our chief geopolitical foe. I mean, being hawkish on Russia is a core right identity for a long, long time. And then it runs in to the new course of the river. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening is you see this really strong fall off of support for Ukraine, mainly on the right. Now, there's been some gradual lessening on the left as well. But mainly on the right. And that's a classic example of how the old instincts meet the new coalition and the new coalition gradually overcomes the old instincts. Absolutely. And that was that was in this group. And we didn't include it because we have so much to get to on this. But like they 100 percent were like, well, in the beginning, I was for it. But now I'm against it because we have to take care of our own people first. And, right. you know, we America can't be in these forever wars. Yep. It's like all stuff they've just heard from white right wing media. So I want to talk, though, about one of the core causes. Let's get to the root causes of why people are feeling detached from one another. So much of it is this like, and people talk about this all the time, the collapse of trust, the collapse of trust in institutions and the collapse of trust in each other, because you need like social fabric is built around a kind Mm -hmm. of social cohesion and trust. But like we asked these Trump voters about the investigations into Trump. And they don't think any of them are legitimate, and they can't name anyone they would trust to conduct an investigation. Let's listen. I could not pick one person or institution or individual that I would trust. I think it's just all a witch hunt regardless, but um, I couldn't think of anyone either. It would be hard for anybody to find, but I guarantee you one thing. I guarantee you as soon as Trump pulls his name out of the hat, a lot of those investigations will automatically disappear because it's all political. If someone like Chris Rufo or who just got left uh, Project Veritas, James O'Keefe investigated and uncovered crimes of Donald Trump, I would believe him. Okay. But I don't think Donald Trump committed a crime. I don't trust the FBI, but I would trust my own eyes. I've seen the evidence of his crimes is the only reason I would agree with their decision. The stuff in Georgia, he told the guy, you know, see if you can work out a detail. The numbers don't seem to add up. He didn't twist the guy's arm. He didn't threaten him. 
He didn't say, you know, I'm going to go down there and beat you up if you don't give me the votes. <laughs> the votes were all skewed in strange ways. This whole voting system is ridiculous. Yeah, you can throw, put any ballots you want into a box and then watch who counts them and then run the ballots through the machine a few times and then close up the windows so it's all hidden. This is ridiculous. They need to have a much more clear way to vote like it used to be. Even then they'd find ballots in the back of somebody's trunk, but it was a lot more difficult. This election had so many loopholes and so many places where you could cheat. You will never find what exactly happened. Okay, now I just want to stress again, this is a group that dislikes Donald Trump, wants to move on to Ron DeSantis. And David, I'm sure you caught this, but that everyone said they would not trust the FBI or any other institution who prosecuted Trump. And with one of the guys in there, when he's saying, you hear him say, I'd only trust them because I saw it with my own eyes. That's about Hunter Biden. So when we asked about Hunter Biden and we said, well, would you trust them if they prosecuted Hunter Biden? 100% of hands yeah, went up yeah. right away. Is that a collapse in the faith of institutions or is that just negative partisanship all the way down? Maybe it's both, but what do you think? Yeah, I was going to say yes to yeah. both. And we also know, Sarah, if Chris Rufo came out tomorrow and said, I have concluded that Donald Trump has committed crimes. Many people in that group would say, what happened to Chris Rufo? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Like, totally. <laughs> I mean, when did Chris Rufo become a traitor to the yeah, cause? Like th- this right. is absolutely what would happen. So I like to draw a distinction between earned distrust and manufactured distrust. So there is no question that major American institutions have made some pretty serious and profound mistakes. There's just no question about that. We have seen scandals in the FBI. We have seen media scandals. And so I do think there is no American institution that you just sort of say, well, whatever they say, I take it face value for granted. They're absolutely trustworthy. Look, that's an unhealthy instinct in a democratic polity. You say, look, I don't fully trust any institution. I like transparency and I like accountability. So that's a sort of a general principle. But then there's this whole concept of manufactured distrust. And if you listen to right-wing media, if your entire diet is right-wing media, you're going to hear wild things all the time. And it was reflected in what they just said about voting, for example. Is voting less secure now than it was back in the day? No, it's more secure. Right. And in fact, the Dominion voting system that was the subject of an enormous amount of controversy is a dramatic improvement over prior forms of voting. When electronic voting first started, I would go to my polling place in Tennessee and I would press the button and I would light up all of the people I was voting for and then I would press vote. And that was that. I just trusted that that was how the vote was recorded. Now we have a Dominion voting system in our own county, which is hilarious because lots of folks in our county were convinced that Dominion was corrupt. And And I said, well, how was your voting experience? And they said, well, we liked it because we voted and then we got a paper printout that showed exactly who we voted for to confirm. And then that paper printout was what was actually scanned. And I said, that's a Dominion voting system. <laughs> um, so it was a better system than I've seen before. But there has just been this relentless drumbeat. And then I wrote about this for the Times. So prior to the election, Fox and Trump, both of them, and you can go back and you can see the clips and read the reports, were telling everybody, don't trust mail-in balloting, don't trust mail-in balloting, don't trust mail-in. And then Fox calls for Arizona and the whole right-wing population or much of it was like, wait, we were told not to trust this process. And here's Fox going ahead and calling this red state for Biden. That can't possibly be real. And it was like a breach of trust between right wing media and the audience that they had cultivated to be distrustful. And so when you talk to somebody who like those folks in the focus group, it's like peeling an onion of manufactured distrust. And then here's the other problem, Sarah. They can point to scandals you know, in mainstream or left-wing media and that are real, that happened and are bad. Sure. Okay. But then if you tell them about, say, the Seth Rich conspiracy theory coming out of Fox or all of the Dominion nonsense coming out of Fox, that doesn't tell them to distrust Fox. That's right. 
They continue to trust Fox. This is such a key point, and unsurprisingly, the next section I have here is, let's listen to these voters talk about the media. I tend to hit the Fox News first, and then I tend to hit CNN or MSN, and I try to read a lot of sources. I clearly can't trust our local papers anymore. So I feel like I'm in this kind of whirlwind of trying to fact find. You'll find more, maybe more information on Facebook or social media, but you're not necessarily going to get the truth either. So I don't know. That's one of the struggles I have, even whenever I see things that are happening locally is to try to find a local source. But I don't know. I have no idea where to find the right answers. My father-in-law, who just passed, followed the Epic Times. And I don't know enough about them to know if they're trustworthy or not either. And I also like look at the Daily Wire and try to find a news source that seems pretty balanced. But then I do try to do my research on other areas because you can read the same story and hear two totally different sides. It's not what happened at the FBI or the CIA or whatever institution you want to talk about. It's what the media does to it. And it's so hard to know where the truth is. A lot of people have echoed that already. It's very hard. But, you know, I tend to really appreciate the Epic Times. And I do like to listen to Tucker Carlson and Hannity and Laura. At least they're a a voice that's different and gives you another viewpoint. Um, No, they're not always accurate either. They have their own agenda. But the media in this country, that's that's almost who elects the president. Personally, I think Fox is probably the most down the middle of any of them. And they they do lean right, absolutely. And they go far right, but at the same time, if there's something bad happening caused by the right, they'll call it out. Now, the mainstream media will call it out when the left mess is up. No more censoring. No more state-run media. And when you say censoring and state-run, who do you mean? Well, censoring, there's a lot of censoring in media. There actually is a body that is overseeing the media right now and determining what is allowed to be said and what's not allowed to be said. Disinformation is like the biggest word out there. And does it not strike anybody strange that you go to four different media houses and they're all saying the same thing? Why? Because it's like state-run media like what they have in China. Okay, so I'm going to say something again, which is that this is another situation where I I listen to these people and they're telling you that they don't know where to go for the truth. They're telling you that they're trying to find answers. It's pretty much like in good faith, but because they're pouring Fox News and the Daily Wire and other right-wing sources into their ears – They don't have that much context, and they do think that Fox is the most trustworthy, and it's all the other people who are wrong. Look, people are responsible for their own actions, they're responsible for things, but I'm also like, you guys are being poisoned slowly by these institutions. And you had a great piece, you were just talking about it, about this latest thing with Fox News. And what makes me so mad about that Fox News thing is, and you hit this, right, is this idea that they were like, well, our people believe this and they're good people, so we're going to reinforce it. And that is wrong. When you think people are good people or you're a news organization, like your obligation is to tell them the truth. And they knew the truth and they didn't tell it to people, which means they hold them in contempt and they think they're stupid. And now you can talk, but I'm so mad about this. (laughs) No, you should be. And here's the other thing. So as Howard Kurtz said, he was on Fox and he said, I'm not allowed to cover this. Mm -hmm. So- They're going to watch Fox and they will know nothing about all of the hosts that one of those people just mentioned as being pretty much straight shooters intentionally lying, right? So they won't know about it. Then you'll go to the Daily Wire. I looked a couple of days ago. I didn't see that the Daily Wire had covered this, Mm -hmm. the Fox scandal. They may have. I didn't see it. Certainly not prominently. Across right-wing media, this is not really being covered right? because a lot of right-wing media is an audition for Fox News. This is where people want to end up. And so if you are watching right-wing media, you're not going to know. You're literally not going to know about one of the most consequential media scandals of my lifetime is this intentional lying about the election for day after day, week after week, leading up to the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. And so this is what I talk about when it's manufactured distrust. They're going to go to Tucker, to Laura Ingram, to Sean Hannity. They're not going to talk about their own lies 
And they're going to continue to say the mainstream media lies, the mainstream media lies, the mainstream media lies. And so if that's your news environment, and look, people are responsible for their own choices about the news that they consume. And I've had the same conversation with folks who say, well, I go first to Fox. And then I also look at CNN. And when I drill down, I find out that they don't actually. Right. They just go to Fox. Yeah. And then Fox tells them about MSNBC or CNN or whatever. And I've said this to a million different people. If the right wing media is your universe, a lot of the critiques of the Trump era are going to be mystifying to you. Mm -hmm. It's like you're, a person has landed from another planet to tell you things that are completely outside of your zone of experience. And then, of course, you're going to be automatically mistrustful of it. You're going to be automatically dismissive. And quite literally, Sarah, there is no amount of right-wing credentials that can allow you standing to tell folks that Trump has lied terribly or that Tucker Carlson is spouting falsehoods. Because the instant you do then the question isn't what happened to Tucker, mm -hmm. it's what happened to you. That's right. That becomes the question. The only way they would ask what happened to Tucker is if Tucker started to question what was happening at Fox, right? Like, <laughs> right. And like sometimes people end up, they come to us like belatedly and it's because like Liz Cheney, good standing, mm -hmm. good standing, good standing. January 6th happens and she says something and now it's like, you're out. Liz Cheney's a rhino. She's never been conservative about anything. She's wrong about everything. Or Judge Ludig. Uh, you know, like anybody who says the thing, they find themselves over and suddenly are like, ah, welcome to meeting all of us. Yeah. We are all no longer conservatives. We're all rhinos. We certainly can't be counted on having conservative beliefs because we said something about what was happening. Yeah. And that was the end of it. One of the most disturbing pieces of data I have seen in the last, really since Trump came down the escalator, which is, I mean, Sarah, think about it. It's coming up on eight years since I he know, came down the escalator. I know, it's been a long escalator. time we've lived in this world. It's been a long time. And one of the most disturbing pieces of data that I've seen is watching the contrast between Mike Pence and Mitch McConnell's approval rating and Donald Trump's after January 6th. And after January 6th, Trump's approval rating with Republicans stayed very high, very slight downslope, very slight. And Pence and McConnell, who opposed Trump's attempt to overturn the election, their approval rating dropped to such an extent that Mike Pence now, who may well run for president, is widely viewed as having no standing, no meaningful standing in the Republican Party to take on Donald Trump. Now, we'll see. I mean, of course, nobody's voted yet. But the idea that between the two people on January 6th, Trump, who wanted to overturn the election, and Pence, who had stood by Trump every second of the four years prior and who drew the line at a coup, was going to then lose his standing and become a what happened to Mike Pence situation, tells you an awful lot. And again, Sarah, I want to underline something you said earlier. These are folks that if you met them in any other context, and we're talking about any other topic, you'd find them to be some of the best, most down to earth people that you'd meet often, like people you would want as neighbors. And then as soon as the topic veers into politics, then all of a sudden it's like watching one of these old sitcoms where the car's driving and you see the transmission coming out in the road and the wheels are coming off. <laughs> that you're thinking, wait, we're having this really great conversation. And then now what? What do you think? What is happening? I mean, the number of times you're just listening to the sweetest grandma oh, who yeah. is introduced because you do this thing at the beginning where everybody tells you like what they do for fun and, you know, where they live and what they did for work. And like, you know, just get the sweetest grandma who just talks about your delicious grandchildren. That's what she spends all her time doing. And she knits them sweaters and all that stuff. And then she's just like... And these socialists that are ruining the country, they yeah. should all be thrown in the gulag. And you're like, oh my God. Oh no. Yeah, this is, this is right. This is, this is how things go. My favorite example of that, Sarah, I was volunteering for Samaritan's Purse in Mayfield, Kentucky after these terrible tornadoes. And I'm with these awesome people who dropped everything when they heard the tornado had happened descend upon Mayfield, Kentucky. They're sleeping in cots, you know, in church fellowship halls to help these folks. And I'm talking to one of the most lovely people who's, you know, up to her eyeballs in debris, trying to dig people's possessions out of this catastrophe. 
and we're having the great conversation. And then she turns to me and she says, you know, they sent this tornado to punish the red states. Mm. And I'm like, okay. Who sent it? Do I engage Who's on they? this? <laughs> yeah. Do I engage on this point or we go back to talking about SEC football? And you just kind of go back to talking about SEC football. But yeah, it's something else. Oh, man. Okay, so this is my last question for you. I actually had a whole section on Democrats that like, we just don't even have time to get to. Because I will say, this is... It is not a one-sided thing. We've mostly been talking about the right. We know a lot about that. Yeah, yeah. But like, you know, when we talk to Dems and we ask them about the Supreme Court, for example, mm-hmm. right now, I mean, we ask them about Merrick Garland, like talk about someone who's tanking with them. It's not a one-sided problem. Um, but we talked about leadership. We know trust is the problem. We know that the media feeds it. The politicians feed it. I often talk about the Republican triangle of doom, which is the toxic and symbiotic relationship between the right-wing infotainment media, politicians, and the voters that it, like increasingly radicalizes them. But like, how we get out, man? What's the solution? You got it? You know it? <laughs> I don't have the solution yet. And I think the Fox revelation should be very sobering. Because what they have told us is that, you know, we've talked about the power of leadership. Leadership has exerted such power for so long that I'm starting to wonder how much attempts to counter the flow of this river, how effective they can be. And because when Fox called Arizona, the response was not, oh, man, Trump was such a bad candidate that he even lost Arizona. The response was, that can't be right. Fire the pollster who just called this race. Fire fire the guy who called this race. So here you had Fox sort of at the apex of the infotainment pyramid, the tip of the infotainment spear saying, Arizona is lost. And the people just said, no, I refuse. So how much have we built sort of this cultural stream that is now so powerful that any given individual can't really stand in front of it anymore and say, no more, no more. And however, here is where I will say that I'm seeing some signs of hope. After 2022, where every one of the hyper MAGA candidates in a statewide swing state election lost, every one of them, for the first time, I started to see some reappraisals. Mm -hmm. And The reappraisal, interestingly, wasn't just on 2022. It was backdated all the way back to 2018 and 2020 and 2022 that said, oh, maybe this doesn't work. I do think that movements can be learning organisms. And if the hyper MAGA world keeps losing, then there can be a hope for a reassessment. There can be. But right now, Sarah, we're still in the world where anybody who stands up, no matter their credentials, no matter their credentials, the instant they stand up, it's what happened to so-and-so. Trump broke you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I used to respect you. That's the dynamic. And it's very difficult to go against that. Yeah. Well, on that uplifting note, David French, yeah. <laughs> uh, my friend, thank you for coming on the Focus Group podcast and talking to us about our big national crack up. We will all continue the work of trying to better understand our fellow citizens by doing these focus groups, listening to the podcasts, grappling in a real way with what they're telling us. So thanks to all of you for joining us for another episode of the Focus Group. We will see you guys again next week. Bye bye. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Focus Group Podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and this week we're talking about faith in politics, specifically evangelical Christians who vote Republican. Now, there's no doubt evangelical Christians form a meaningful chunk of the GOP base, a full 30% as of 2020, according to the Public Religion Research Institute. And back in 2016, many were shocked to find that Trump's notable lack of moral character didn't seem to phase Christian voters. In fact, they became some of his most devoted supporters. 
Today, we're going to hear from a group of evangelical Christians who voted for Trump in both 2016 and 2020 and talk about how they're sizing up GOP candidates for 2024, especially fellow Christian Mike Pence, who puts his faith front and center. My guest today is McKay Coppins, staff writer at The Atlantic, author of The Wilderness, deep inside the Republican Party's combative, contentious, chaotic quest to take back the White House. McKay, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Now, we're going to spend a lot of this show talking about the role religion plays in American politics and specifically the Republican Party. But we need to talk a bit about your reporting on Trump recently. You're out with a piece in The Atlantic on the most MAGA CPAC ever. You said in your decade of covering the event, you've never seen it more dead. Just tell us what you saw at CPAC. Yeah, I mean, I was struck by two things. One was how fully Trump had captured the institution, right? Like, Everything about it from the swag that was being handed out to the booths that were set up in the exhibit halls to the speakers who were chosen, all of it was just kind of like a MAGA pep rally. And that was not always the case. When I first started covering it, it used to be this kind of place where you would have all the different factions of conservatism uh, show up and sort of like battle it out, right? So you had like the Ron Paul libertarians rigging the straw poll for Ron Paul, and you had the social conservatives with like pro-life signs, and uh, you had more establishment Republicans. And, and a lot of the tension between those groups was what made the event kind of worthwhile and memorable. This event was fully a three-day MAGA pep rally. And, you know, a lot of the big stars in the Republican Party didn't even bother to show up, most notably Ron DeSantis. Trump, you know, was everywhere. He obviously spoke uh, the last night of the event. But the, the second thing that, that struck me about the event was how dead it was. Like, I think without the tension of the different groups of the Republican Party kind of competing, it made the event kind of boring. But then the other thing was just like talking to people there you could sense an undercurrent of ambivalence about Trump's 2024 campaign that, frankly, I think has also come up in some of these focus groups you've let me sit in on. But like, even people who were ostensibly pro-Trump and excited to hear him speak, when you kind of started talking to them, they'd say, yeah, but you know, it is possible that his four years have come and gone and maybe it's time to move on to somebody else. And there just really was a lack of energy that, that was pretty palpable to me. So there was like a lot of discussion on the Twitters about the crowd size and Mm -hmm. people were quick to sort of show the ballrooms kind of pretty empty and even for Trump's speech, which must have been the most well attended part of the whole conference still had a lot of the seating in the back was open. Is that real or was that people working with the cameras? No, the, the ballroom wasn't full. And my colleague, John Hendrickson, who also went He had one of those videos that kind of went viral (laughs) on Twitter. Um, The back of the ballroom was not full. So it's probably like two thirds full. I I did see reporting that sponsors who had uh, booths in the exhibit hall were kind of grumbling that the turnout was down from years past. I could definitely sense that there were not as many people there. It didn't feel quite like the big marquee conservative political event that it has in years past. And Again, I think that this might have been a strategic mistake by the Conservative Political Action Conference. I think they made a decision in the Trump years to just fully hitch the event and their whole kind of organization to the Trump wagon. And it's not clear that's where all of Republican voters are anymore. And I think the institution has struggled to kind of catch up to that reality. And how much of that is just Matt Schlapp? being so tied Mm -hmm. to Trump and like linking their careers. And now because he's also in some real hot water, you know, really needing Trump to stand by him in this moment. Like, was that a big dynamic? I definitely think that was part of it. Matt Schlapp is the the chairman of CPAC. And for listeners who don't know, he was recently accused of groping a male aide to Herschel Walker. He denies that allegation, but that scandal is kind of swirling around him. And I'm sure he's kind of made the decision that he's just going to double down with his allies, which include Trump and Trump's various cohorts. But again, like, I actually think, though, that the decision CPAC has made is emblematic of where a lot of the party is, which is like the party is in this weird limbo where Trump is running again. He still demands to be the center of attention. But there isn't as much natural enthusiasm for him as there was in 2016. I think a lot of 
Republican leaders, conservative movement leaders, they're trying to like recapture that feeling of 2016, 2017, when Trump was this like unstoppable once in a generation political phenomenon who is, you know, proving all the haters wrong and saying things that had never been said by a politician anymore. We're six years into this. That, that's just not the case anymore. Trump's shtick, you know, people are used to it, whether they're bored with it or not is a matter of interpretation. I felt like I sensed a lot of boredom in my reporting there. But if nothing else, people are kind of inured to it. They, they don't act shocked when Donald Trump says something outrageous in a, a speech at CPAC. It's kind of just the default now of conservative rhetoric. Yeah, that's right. It's not just that they've heard Trump's act. It's that that act has been much replicated. Exactly. And so, you know, Carrie Lake's there doing it, too. She's got her own version. And so does Marjorie Taylor Greene. And so does even Ron DeSantis. And so I always say this. It's like Trump the man can lose altitude while Trumpism is still kind of ascendant. And Exactly. It's almost he's a victim of his own success. Totally. In that way. You know, like he, he basically has remade the Republican Party in his image. But now that makes him way less interesting. That's right. right? That's what he's struggling with now. And also, like, there are younger, sassier versions. Like, for all the talk about Joe Biden's age, uh, sometimes people forget that Donald Trump's no spring chicken himself. Okay, we'll talk about (laughs) Trump a little bit more. But I want to I want to start talking about religion and the role it plays in the party. Um, I'll just say for myself, I grew up a small town Methodist. But, you know, like REM, I lost my religion somewhere along the way. And so I'm, I'm not like an active churchgoer, but I've, I've always felt like I sort of intuitively understood the evangelical or just religious part of the right, because I felt like I kind of grew up around it and I sang in the church choir and it was like a way that I was brought up. A lot of the people in these groups, they talk about, you know, growing up in religious households. I wouldn't say I grew up in a religious household, but I grew up in a religious town and we participated. And so I often feel like I know these people and you too, right? Faith has been very important to you. Mm -hmm. Talk about how it shaped you. Yeah, I grew up uh, practicing Latter-day Saint Mormon uh, is the the colloquial term and still am a practicing Mormon. I still go to church every week with my family. I also served a Mormon mission in Texas in the Bible Belt, where, as you can imagine, Mormon missionaries are uh, are maybe not the most popular people in, you know, the Dallas suburbs. But I did get to know a lot of conservative evangelicals during my two years in Texas. And I feel like I also really do understand how religion can inform every aspect of your life, including your politics. And so like, I've always tried to approach my reporting on religion and politics from a place of empathy and Mm -hmm. curiosity. I've written a lot of stories about Evangelical voters, conservative Christian voters, I've profiled people like Mike Pence. I never go into those stories like ready to just like wallop them or like make a joke out of them because I I think I actually can empathize with a lot of how they're feeling. That's part of why I was so interested to listen into these focus groups because I, I really think like I could understand where they were coming from in a lot of ways while also being surprised by some of the conclusions they had come to. Yeah, well, let's jump into that. We asked this group, and and we sort of screened to get two-time Trump voters who identified as evangelical Christians, and we just asked them as a kind of level set, you know, how does your faith inform your politics? And here's what they said. I'm a Christian. I was raised in a Christian household, so grew up always going to church, still go to church. So conservative values were always instilled into me. And I believe that the Republican Party most uh, represents those values. So that's how I vote. I actually work for the church, um, but I did not grow up in a believing family. Um, I've got a lot of mess in my <laughs> in my background. But politics-wise, my faith, yeah, it's the greater good for the country and my biblical values and constitutional values, really. Um, who's going to stand up for the Constitution? Because that's what our country should be operated by. Also grew up in a Christian household. We are you know, very much at our church all the time, still very involved. I think there are issues like the pro-life versus pro-choice, where definitely religion, I think, plays a part in that and, and some other issues that are going on right now. So I definitely think it it plays a part in who you want to see take that office, knowing that, like somebody else said, they're going to be choosing new Supreme Court justices and where you kind of want this nation going based on Christian views. 
So, you know, I, I do two-time Trump voters all the time. Like, that is just a constant group that I'm, I'm talking to mm-hmm. as people who listen to this podcast. No, and, and there's people who talk about faith in those groups all the time. This is the first time, though, that I think we've screened exclusively for evangelical Christians in the groups. But I got to tell you, by and large, they sound exactly like every other Republican group that I've done of two-time Trump voters. And I was wondering if there was anything about how they talked about faith and politics that struck you as interesting about how it informed their politics? <laughs> it's a difficult question because you're right that like they had come to the same conclusions that I think basically your average conservative Republican would arrive at, right? Like policy wise, politically, they did not sound that different than the last focus group, for example, I sat in on, which was not screened for evangelicals, but was two time Trump voters, you know, they liked Ron DeSantis. They kind of had a more or less the same political policy profile as, as everybody else. But but I do think they kind of like had to grapple with certain issues in a different way that I felt like I could understand as a, a person of faith myself. So like, you know, when they were asked about questions about like the moral character of political candidates, all of them kind of had talked themselves into voting for Donald Trump, but you could sense some kind of ambivalence about it, at least some like reluctance to fully endorse his uh, character. Mm -hmm. Uh, Same with like when some questions about immigration and refugees came up, all of them had more or less, I think, a pretty restrictionist approach to immigration. But the way they talked about it, you could sense that they were trying to square it with like Christian ideals of compassion and, and charity and and helping those in need. And and again, not that it necessarily led them to arrive at a different conclusion, but I do think they might have taken a slightly different path to get there. Yeah. You know, one of the things I think about with in this past, you know, seven years is that it feels like in the before times that Republican politicians were very careful and intentional about meeting these kinds of voters where they are, meaning that they wanted to sort of reflect their values back to them. And that was part of the reason that the Republican Party had this idea of character counting, that morality mattered. What I was struck by is how it seems like the opposite is now true, where Trump actually, you could see his impact all over them in terms of them they've done a lot of rationalizing, right? Like rather than Republican politicians now coming to meet them, these voters have sort of changed where they now have a sense of, well, I don't necessarily need this person to reflect my values Mm -hmm. because they've already made that compromise. Like you remember the before times. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to overstate how central this block of voters is to shaping who the Republican Party was before, right? I mean, talk about that a little bit. Well, one of my favorite stats of the Trump era was that as recently as 2011, the Public Religion Research Institute found that only 30 percent of white evangelicals believed that an elected official who commits an immoral act in their personal life can still behave ethically and fulfill their duties in their public and professional life. So that that only 30 percent agreed with that statement in 2011. By the time Donald Trump was running in 2016, that number had risen to 72%. I I remember talking to uh, Robert P. Jones, who who runs the Institute there. He said, like, this is really a sea change in evangelical ethics. And I think that, like, it speaks to what you're describing, that there was just this kind of mass rationalization that occurred within the base of the Republican Party that uh, around the time of Trump's rise that changed the way they evaluated candidates. But just to answer your question more directly, 10 years ago, like the Republican base was, if not dominated by white evangelicals, very influenced by their thinking and the way that they talked, right? Like this is why you had Republican candidates who didn't only talk about social conservative policies, they felt like they had to project in their personal lives, in their family lives, in their campaign literature, in their interviews, everything, they had to project a certain ideal of kind of like moral Christian conservative family life, right? And that that just isn't the case anymore. And, and I thought it was so fascinating listening to the voters in this focus group kind of talk about that, 
were, you know, some of them were younger. There were, I think, a couple in their like early 30s who probably like barely remember that period or maybe weren't as politically active. But a lot of the older people had lived through the Clinton years, Mm -hmm. right? Like they had lived through the period when Bill Clinton's affairs and his affair specifically with Monica Lewinsky was the single most shameful thing that any president had ever done. They had had polluted politics in America, American culture. He had stained the Oval Office. And this was the rhetoric that was very common in the 1990s and the early 2000s, George W. Bush, right? So it was interesting to hear these voters kind of who had lived through that period, probably held those beliefs at some point, now kind of talk themselves into the idea that it was okay to vote for somebody who in their personal life doesn't live the values at all that they believe in. And, and the most interesting rationalization I heard, and I heard it from a, a few people, was that every politician is morally deficient in some way, right? That like Donald Trump is probably more upfront about it. And they all kind of said, you know, I don't agree with everything Donald Trump does in his personal life. I think one of those said that's probably true of nine out of 10 political candidates. So we just have to make peace with the fact that our candidates aren't going to live Christian values in their personal life and just vote for the person who has the best policies and the best experience. Yeah, you're doing a great job summing up exactly what these voters are saying. And I cannot tell you, as an 18-year-old in 1998, that Bill Clinton situation was incredibly formative for me and brought Mm -hmm. me to the Republican Party. I liked the idea that character counted and that it mattered. And it's so funny listening to these voters because They were the reason that so many people thought Donald Trump was an impossibility in the Republican Party, because we were all so certain that they would not tolerate his legion moral failings. But of course, they did. And I think that's one of the big shifts in American politics over the last decade is now like these voters are cynical. We're all cynical. And everybody's lost the sense that morality matters at all in our politics, which brings us to. Mike Pence. So you wrote a feature on Mike Pence a few years ago that was really interesting. The title is God's Plan for Mike Pence. And one of your sources, evangelical leader Ralph Reed, suggested that if you're Mike Pence and you believe what he believes, you know God had a plan. It sounds like he's suggesting that Pence might think that it's God's plan for him to be president. Mm -hmm. And so do you think that Pence sort of has this manifest destiny feeling that seems to be kind of peppered throughout your reporting over the years. Um, Is that what's propelling him? You know, I I remember when I was reporting that, that feature, I talked to a bunch of people who were close to him, friends with him, had known him throughout his life. And that was one of the most common kind of recurring themes was that Pence was, first of all, much more ambitious than people realized, right? He has this kind of like, ah, shucks, you know, modest persona, but the truth is that he is extremely ambitious, as ambitious as any other you know, successful politician, that he wants to be president, has wanted to be president for a long time, and that the very unique circumstances of 2016 that led to him not only being chosen for the Republican ticket, but then being elected, you know, a lot of people in Pence's life believed or speculated that this was the product of divine intervention right? That God had placed him in this moment and that he had arrived at his office because uh, it was part of God's plan. And that, I think, that belief fueled a lot of the self-justification he did throughout the Trump years. You know, Pence was the most kind of loyal aid, ally, acolyte of Trump's throughout those years. He would defend anything. He would excuse anything. He would be kind of the first person to get on TV and talk about how Donald Trump was a great man and a moral man and how they prayed together. He kind of vouched for Trump's character constantly in moments of controversy, right? And a lot of people in Pence's life believe that that was because He made that calculation that, like, this is how I become president. I have to stay on the right side of Donald Trump. I have to stay on the right side of his supporters. And eventually Trump's presidency will be over and it'll be my turn and I'll be rewarded for that loyalty, which is why I think where Pence is now is so fascinating. Well, yeah, I mean, God may have a plan, but I got to tell you, the voters sound like they have a different one. And let's listen. 
I guess I'm sort of neutral, but I don't think he would have a shot because even though he was vice president for four years, I mean, we're all saying we still don't really know a whole lot about him. I don't like how Trump was like just in your face with everything, but then Pence is almost too far in the other direction. You don't know anything about him. I can't give a single detail. I I know what he looks like, but I never saw him do anything specific. I almost feel like he's the Donald Trump equivalent of Kamala Harris, where I can't name a single thing that she's done. I do know that a lot of the Trump base saw that as kind of him being a little turncoat if they didn't agree with the results, that he was just saying, go ahead and do the peaceful transfer of power. I don't think he has a chance. It's a shame. I guess he seems like a perfectly nice man, but I don't think he has a chance. I'm having a hard time backing Pence right now. And I can't tell you why other than just maybe my gut, but I felt like that in 16 that he was, you know, a good partner. I thought having him on the ticket with his faith background was good, but then it didn't seem to pan into anything. So going forward, not having him on that ticket in future times, I don't, he's almost become too entrenched in the establishment as well. It feels like. Okay. So, okay. So, but hold on. And it's going to get worse. So, so this was one group. This was just the evangelical group. And I was very interested to know how an evangelical group specifically sounded because here's just some random selections from the last few groups we've done where we've asked about Pence. Listen to these. I think very highly of him because of his Christian beliefs Mm -hmm. and think that he is a very honorable man, but I'm just not sure, like the way he didn't back Trump, to me, that does yeah. not. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't like the way he turned on Trump. But. I don't I don't know if anyone would vote for him, just his family at this point. Yeah, I think he's alienated everyone, maybe accidentally. He might have done it with the best of intentions. I think taking the job as vice president for Donald Trump at the time with not much known was an honorable thing to do. He served well. And then he probably acted as honorably as possible on January 6th. But in the process, he has alienated every Republican and Democrat. That's just over. It's retirement time. He's a nice guy. I don't think he would win. So (laughs) Nice guys finish last. He's not that good enough (laughs) charisma. Puppet. So now I've actually had a chance to spend some time with his brother and his whole family, actually. They're actually nice people. I'm so mad at Pence, I would never vote for him. He'd be a horrible president, but I don't think he's a bad person. I just don't think he has leadership qualities to be president. Yeah, and that, that's really it. Right. He didn't have the leadership qualities to do what everyone wanted him to do on January 6th. He doesn't have that spot. They seem like perfectly great people, <laughs> but I don't yeah. think he was presidential or vice presidential material. Okay. My God, brutal. <laughs> I mean, that is brutal. <laughs> And, and McKay, I need you to back me up here on something because Mike Pence has clearly has a very strong PR department because reporters call me all the time, which means he's getting people to write stories about him. And they're always like, so what do people in the focus group say about Mike Pence? And I'm like, they are brutal about Mike Pence. And people are like, really? And you sort of and I sort of had the same thing where you were kind of like interested in what they might say. And I was like, I'm telling you, they say Absolutely not. And then your experience bore that out. Yes. <laughs> you told me so. And you, you you were exactly right. I mean, it's funny because the, the reason it came up with a possible story for me was that you look at the Republican primary polls and, you know, it's Trump and DeSantis way up there. But then like Pence always has like around like 7% of the vote. Right. So you could look at that and say, oh, well, Pence is lurking, right? Like maybe he catches fire at the right time or something happens and he's already got a solid base of support. I wanted to know who those 7% of voters were. I didn't see a single one in these focus groups and I have yet to be able to find one in the wild when I go to places like CPAC. I don't know who that 7% of voters is. I imagine a lot of it is just name recognition, right? But the fact that People not only are not interested in him running for president, but like are so dismissive is really kind of an indictment of Pence's whole, you know, strategy going into this, right? He thought that he was going to build a profile with the conservative base by serving with Trump. 
And instead, I think what happened, and I mean, I'm curious to hear your thoughts, but it seems like everybody is judging him in kind of side by side with Trump, right? Like the contrast between Trump as this larger than life figure who's confrontational and loud and entertaining and insane. And then Mike Pence, who is kind of like the most quiet, boring, monotone person that might have made for a good balance for the ticket for Trump in 2016. But I think it's led voters to kind of dismiss him as a as a viable presidential candidate. Yeah, I mean, I have like a smattering of theories surrounding Pence and also with Trump. I mean, one of them is Tim Miller kind of has this riff that I've always thought was really good about there was a fundamental misunderstanding around kind of secular white working class voters who have some religiosity where they might go to church or they might culturally say they're Christian, but they find Mike Pence's intensity towards his Christianity and like they find it kind of weird. Mm. And actually for lots of them, they too have gotten a divorce or they too have had a kid who maybe had a kid out of wedlock. I mean, like when I listen to Republican voters, the extent to which life touches them in all kinds of ways and which they have sort of much more general tolerance for personal foibles Mm -hmm. uh, than one might have anticipated. And so I've always thought that whether it's because culturally things have changed or what have you, that Donald Trump's thrice married adultering ways, like actually seemed more normal to people than Mike Pence's very devout ways. Yeah, that's an interesting theory. I mean, I guess, though, I would have expected that at least in the focus group where you filtered for people who are, you know, professed evangelicals, and and it did seem like this group had at least a handful of people who were pretty seriously devout, right? I mean, one of them worked at a church. Several seemed to be pretty regular churchgoers. I thought that at least in that group, you might have some more positive pen sentiment. It wasn't there. I mean, I think the point is valid and it speaks to a lot of the research about what evangelical even means, you know, how people self-identify, right? A lot of people might identify as evangelical, but they don't go to church that often. They don't read the Bible. It's not actually like a major part of their lives. It might be as much a political identifier as anything. But but yeah, I think there is probably something to that, that Pence's particular brand, you know, his political persona is maybe a little alienating to people. I think there's also just like a more simple, you know, explanation, which is like, he doesn't have a lot of charisma, you know, yeah, like, right. just he's just not a charismatic figure. And I think after four years, five years, whatever, however you want to count it of Donald Trump, like, the bar for charisma is pretty high, you know? Yeah. <laughs> People want a lot of personality in their presidential candidates. Now, maybe less than Trump. That was another thing you heard in this group that like people were a little tired of Donald Trump constantly picking fights on Twitter and, you know, whatever else. And so maybe you could split the difference between those two. But Mike Pence just fundamentally being kind of a boring guy, I think also just probably hurts him with these people. Though, again, I just want to make the point, it is shocking that the very fact that he is kind of like or at least presents himself as a an ideal, wholesome Christian dad and husband undercuts him. Yes. <laughs> that, that that hurts him with these voters just speaks to how much attitudes in the conservative evangelical world have changed over the last 20 years. Well, the thing I've never quite been able to get my head around with Mike Pence when I get all these calls from reporters that I know his his team is out there ginning up is like Mike Pence's theory of the case. like. There's a smattering of different ways people talk about him. For some, it's like, you know, super nice guy. Yes. Totally would love him as a neighbor. Which always feels like a backhanded compliment. That's right. You know, seems like a really nice yep. guy. You know? He'd be a great neighbor, yep. but uh, no one would vote for him. But they're kind about him. They think he seems like a nice man. But then there's the other half that say he did not back up Trump. Yep. He betrayed him. He stabbed him in the back. Uh, These are my always Trumpers, typically. And even it bleeds into like another group where they're not so committed to the lie that the election was stolen, but they just have this sense that, you know, Mike Pence didn't really stay on side. Mm. He just didn't do the right thing for the team. Like, if you need personal security to go to an event that 
would have the base of the party there. How do you think you win a nomination? Like, it's not that they don't like Mike Pence. It's that a chunk of the party wanted to murder Mike Pence. Yep. I mean, it is possible, you know, let's give the benefit of the doubt is that it is possible on January 6th, he wasn't making a calculation about his future political prospects. Oh, no, I agree with that. I know. I think he did the right thing to do the right thing. I'm just talking about the way voters interpret him. Well, he gets points with me for this. I don't think he gets points with the voters. Yeah, no. But what I was going to say, though, is that, like, you know, he probably also did make a calculation around January 6th that, like, Trump had lost re-election. Mm. Trump was on his way down if you're valuing him as like a stock, right? Like it was sell time on Donald Trump. And maybe he thought that <laughs> uh, the voters were going to follow his lead, that he rode the Trump wagon as far as it would take him. And then he jumped off. I don't really know what he's thinking now. Right. I mean, when you look at the landscape, I'm sure that his campaign or his team is like holding similar focus groups and encountering similar sentiments. And I mean, I genuinely, I was at one point listening to these voters, I was trying to put myself in the head of somebody who was trying to help Mike Pence get elected president. And I was like listening to these people and I was like, what would I do to overcome this sentiment? Because the the answer is really not obvious. It's not like, oh, I just need to define myself better, or I need to like get on Fox News more often, or I need to, to reach these voters, like these voters have seen him for four years, and they're not moved by him. And so I don't really know why he, how he he thinks he wins a Republican primary in this climate. Right. And there's another word besides boring that often comes up, which you heard in some of those clips, which is establishment, Mm -hmm. which is also one that they hit Nikki Haley with and a few others that are candidates that, again, are from the before times. The voters have a very strong sense of people who had profile in the before times, and they have decided that those people mean going backwards. Yep. The way they talked about Nikki Haley was as a, you know, she seems like she's running for vice president, right? Mm -hmm. Um, One of the voters, I think, said something about how I don't know if I trust her on foreign policy and then kind of corrected herself and said, well, I guess, you know, she was in the UN, but I don't know. I just don't think she has it. I think that there is this sense, like you said, that she is a product of some bygone era of Republican politics that nobody wants to return to. Right. You heard the same thing when the the moderator asked about a, a host of other candidates, Marco Rubio, Chris Christie, like it was kind of just like a shrug, you know. One voter said the ship has sailed on them, right? Yes. I think that Republican voters seem to be in a moment where if they don't want Donald Trump again, they want somebody newer and more exciting. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of interest in mining past primary fields for future presidents. Yeah. You know, we talked about this a little earlier, but I want to play it for people because I thought it was pretty interesting. And it's just a question I get a lot, which is how do evangelicals justify voting for Donald Trump. And you talked about that poll, which I also find that illustrative and and staggering in its own right. But let's listen to how they answered the question about how they view character in the role of choosing their politicians. I don't believe in what Donald Trump does in his personal life and different things, but I believed that he could do the things he was saying because of his professional background. So that's where it's hard is I don't know that I could just put all of my vote into a person because they had a good moral character if they don't have the experience. So that was, I think, the biggest thing for me with Trump. Let's use pro-life and abortion. It's like that issue comes down to that moral choice, at least for me. And, you know, like with Donald Trump, yes. He was the best candidate when I voted. And what I saw in his four years was he did have a very strong pastor that was there with him a lot. And, you know, that pastor was here from Dallas and I would hear him on the radio a lot talking about not necessarily their personal meetings, but just talked about how, you know, he's getting it. And that's all we can ask. I mean, everybody's going to make mistakes and do the wrong thing at times, but comes down to, you know, if it was a a decision, there is a a moral, I think, aspect to every decision, I think. 
I definitely take into account some of their moral character, but for me, it's policies are going to be the primary way that I vote. Like I said previously, I think that Trump recognized that his base, the people that are going to vote for him, the right side of the political party, are fundamentally a very Christian group, have a lot of faith, family oriented, and he played into that. It's smart. That's what you would want to do. So that's great. Do I think that he's like super moral family guy? Maybe not, but that doesn't matter to me as much as he's aligning with the politics of the right in their their missions. So there you have it. That's the that's the shift in the mass rationalization. Um, you said something earlier that I think relates to this about Mike Pence and his miscalculation about what being vice president was going to mean and how it was going to position him. And one of the things that he did, and this was totally in your piece about Pence, uh, was sort of the central role that he played in creating a permission structure yep. for evangelicals yep. to support Trump in 2016. And now they've given themselves permission, not just for Trump, but like for it to not matter. That, that's such a good point, actually. I hadn't thought of it quite that way. But Pence was one of the kind of the most important figures in rewiring evangelical politics over the past 10 years, right? He basically created the permission structure. It worked. Evangelical voters decided they don't need to consider moral character in their presidential candidates. And now he's written himself out of Republican politics, right? Exactly. He convinced them all that the things that he brings to the table aren't actually that important. And he won the debate, and now his political career is probably over. That's right. <laughs> People say that sometimes, by the way. Like, when you talk about him, they're like, his political career is over. Like, voters say that. It, it was funny that, like, that was one of the, the themes that I heard also in the discussion of Pence was they would talk about their own kind of, like, lack of interest in him. But they would also say he has no shot. They would turn into pundits and kind of had reached the decision, like, this guy, is he doesn't have what it takes to win. And so I'm not going to waste a vote on it, right? Um, one thing I did want to mention, though, you got it kind of in the, the clips you were just showing is there was kind of an interesting split in one aspect of the discussion of Trump, which is some of the voters in that group seemed genuinely to believe that Donald Trump was, if not like on their team, you know, spiritually, at least was like sort of starting to understand the importance of faith and moral values. Like a couple people talked about how pastors or religious leaders had gotten to know Trump and vouched for his character, right? Then there were others who were maybe more cynical about it and maybe more savvy and essentially said, look, he was pandering to us and I was fine with that because what matters is ultimately that he does what I want him to do and he did what I wanted him to do. And so like, I do think that's interesting because I think that there is a sense sometimes out there that evangelical voters have just been duped by Trump, that he's convinced them that he's like a man of God or, you know, spiritual or something. And the reality is, I don't think most evangelical voters think that. It was helpful that Trump had this kind of evangelical advisory committee with people who have a lot of pull in certain segments of the conservative Christian world vouching for him. And so I, I thought that was interesting. Man, I also thought that when she told the story about somebody coming to her church to say he was OK, it was such a testament to the way these permission structures work. And Mike Pence was just one big blanket permission structure for a lot of folks. But you're also right, just the armchair pundits yeah. who are, yeah, well, I'm of an important demographic in this voting block, and he <laughs> needed to tell me the things I needed to hear. And fine. I'm glad he did. And that's where, actually, he gets a lot of credit often from voters in terms of he did the things he said he was going to do. Yeah. And one of the biggest places he gets it is on abortion. When we do just the two-time Trump voter groups, you do get a lot of secular folks for whom abortion is not important. Mm -hmm. And the groups are often mixed. You get a lot of people who are still either pro-choice or pro-very moderate levels of choice. But in this group, this group is very pro-life. And I was interested in, in whether or not Dobbs would make abortion sort of less salient for this group, which is something people ask a lot now that we've had the decision is sort of, will it take the wind out of the sails yeah. of these voters for whom it was a, a major driver? Let's listen to what they said. I do think it's still a threat because both sides now are working just as hard, you know, for what they believe. And yeah, I don't think that is going to change anything really. 
It was a huge win. In fact, I remember in 16, and myself included, voted Republican partially because we knew Supreme Court justices might be appointed in that period. And it worked. <laughs> but really all that happened is it got pushed back to the states. It could still be codified into law other ways. That was one big battle, but the war's not over. No, I just agree. Yeah, I think it's definitely still an ongoing thing. So still happening. Have you seen this in your reporting where, you know, there's not this sense from pro-life folks that, oh, it's all we've won or that they feel like the fight is very much sort of still ongoing? Yes, I I have not seen any drop off in my conversations with conservative voters in terms of their interest in or passion about abortion as in the wedge issue. Part of me wonders if some of this is reflex, right? Like abortion and Roe have been among the top talking points for so long in the conservative base that they've kind of forgotten how to not not bring it up. But that wasn't really the case in this focus group. Like when they talked about it, they made the point, which I think is basically true, that like pro-choice people are going to keep fighting, if not at the federal level, then the state level. There's all kinds of legal and legislative and uh, referendum battles that will be going on around abortion in the years to come. And so it doesn't seem like it has faded as an issue that they're driven by. Yeah, agree. And I think that's going to make a difference potentially in the Republican primary. I mean, I think that there's going to be some calculations going on, maybe most specifically by DeSantis, to try to figure out how he balances what pro-life voters are going to want to hear and what they know about how badly it fared for them with sort of the general electorate in 2022. Mm. What do you think about that? That will be interesting to watch because, you know, for so long, basically the promise that Republican presidential candidates at the national level made was that I will appoint Supreme Court justices who will overturn Roe. That was the most they had to promise. Now, some did go further. And I actually remember the first Republican primary debate in 2016, Marco Rubio going much further. And I don't want to mischaracterize what he said, so I'm not going to because I can't remember off the top of my head. But I think he, it was something like a, an, a federal abortion ban that he supported. But for the most part, Republican presidential candidates just didn't need to promise anything beyond I'm going to appoint pro-life Supreme Court justices. Now, the uh, terms of the debate have changed. And since a lot of the battles are going to be happening at the state level, um, I will be curious to see how somebody like Ron DeSantis or even Donald Trump, for that matter, will take sides on state level issues. Also, will they, you know, support federal legislation codifying abortion bans, you know, after a certain number of weeks of pregnancy. Like there are a lot of places that this debate can go now uh, that Republican presidential candidates didn't need to go in years past because Roe was the, the main wedge issue. Yeah, it's a great point. So I just want to play one last piece of sound. You alluded to this earlier, but I would say the main place that I thought this group sounded somewhat different from a lot of the other two time Trump voter groups was when we asked about immigration. Let's listen. I'd say it's a dichotomy for me because you want people to do things the right way. But at the same time, as a Christian, you should be accepting of people that are in need. So I think there's definitely a balance there. I don't think I have that answer to that question, but you hate to turn people away that need help, but you also want them to go about it the correct way. So I don't know. If I was in their position, I would absolutely be trying to get across the border. If you put yourself in their place, it's hard to not be empathetic for me personally. But would I try and, you know, go through a visa program or would I middle of the night go under a chain link fence? I don't know. It's easy for me to sit here in my house and say that I would do it the right way. I think certainly many of them could prove at this point that their life is in danger where they are and come through the proper channels. I mean, they're not just sneaking over the southern border. So I would have to assume they are coming through some sort of channels to be able to get here. And so I'm all for helping them out when they get here. And I definitely understand wanting to escape both of those countries right now. I'm okay with, you know, taking people in, especially You know, like there's so much like human trafficking going on in these places and it has to be done right. So, I mean, people can't be like just sneaking in here. The Ukrainians, they can come. Sure. What the heck? 
what the heck? <laughs> so, so this is this is a little delightful deviation from some of the other groups you hear. But you know, as you noted before, and I think it's worth saying, like a lot of Ron DeSantis fans in this group. And oftentimes, when I ask people what they like about Ron DeSantis, you'd be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't, how often him putting the migrants on the plane comes up as a big plus, thumbs up from him. Do you think that his stance on immigration would hurt him with voters like this at all? You know, I would love to say yes. I'm not sure it will. I mean, you know, it's possible. Like, I will point out that some of those clips were people who were making a distinction between taking in refugees from Afghanistan and Ukraine versus undocumented immigrants from Mexico and South America. And I would imagine that some of the sentiment among evangelical conservative voters might be a little warmer toward war refugees from war-torn countries than Central and South American immigrants for probably a variety of reasons. That said, like, I guess like I would like to see more research on this, but it did seem that while attitudes on immigration might be different among people of faith in contrast to general Republican primary voters, it didn't seem to be a motivating factor in their votes in the 2016 primaries. Uh, Maybe I'm wrong about that, but I did not sense that, with some exceptions. Um, I know, for example, Mormon voters were very down on Donald Trump in the 2016 primaries, and I did see some research that indicated that immigration was one of the reasons. So maybe it would, but I haven't seen a lot of evidence that it's the primary motivator for these voters. Yeah, I'm deeply skeptical. I would say, you know, the the gentleman in the clip used the word dichotomy. I, I think that these are voters who are very able to say on one hand, like they personally would take in refugees while being perfectly fine with a candidate who puts migrants on planes yeah. uh, as a political stunt. McKay Coppins, great conversation. I so appreciate you joining us today on the focus group. It was wonderful to talk to you. And thanks to all of you for joining us for another episode of the focus group podcast. We will see you again next week. Be well, take care. See ya. Thanks, Sarah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Focus Group Podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and this week we're talking about the great war of Western civilization, the woke culture war. The general of the culture war, soon-to-be presidential candidate Ron DeSantis, will probably run under the slogan, America, where woke goes to die. And wokeness is such a catch-all villain that when Silicon Valley Bank collapsed last week, DeSantis, Josh Hawley, and the Wall Street Journal editorial page inexplicably blamed it on wokeness. Now, we wanted to get a sense of how voters across the political spectrum think about a lot of the big culture war buzzwords of our time. And unsurprisingly, we found that people are talking past each other a lot. Now, I'm very excited. My guest today is Jane Coaston, opinion writer at the New York Times and one of the most incisive commentators on our political discourse today. Jane, thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but your thesis on the culture wars is that they make great political sense because they are unwinnable and unlosable. Can you tease that out for us, especially in light of all the legislation we're seeing around the country that do notch real wins and losses in some of these culture war battles? They do notch real, actual wins and losses. And I think it's important to note that a forever war has casualties. If there's anything that we've learned from our own actual forever wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, that have killed hundreds of thousands of people. But what I mean by not having winners or losers, I mean that they can be fought forever. Because what would it mean to win the culture war? What would it mean if for Republicans to make a reference to scripture if every knee bended and every tongue confessed that Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. I think people (laughs) still might be doing that somewhere. But there is no means by which you could tell that you were winning and you're always losing, but you're also always winning. I've referenced this before, but there's this understanding, and I'm, I'm going to use the F word here, but I don't mean it in this way. There's an understanding in the study of fascism that fascism's enemies are always portrayed as being simultaneously overwhelmingly powerful, but also really stupid, that they are just fumbling idiots, but also they're going to kill all of you. 
And I feel as if sometimes that's how culture wars are performed, that the enemy in the culture war is evil, but stupid. (laughs) They will beat you, but you could easily beat them if you just tried a little bit harder. And so when I talk about how they are unwinnable and unlosable, I mean that there's no marker at which you could say, we won, we did it. I cannot think of the number of national review pieces that are X indicates that we are winning the culture war. I remember there was a poll, I think, in 2009, in which support for marriage equality ticked down slightly. And this is before marriage equality, I think, reached like 75% approval, which is what it has now. But it was like, oh, you know, we're winning this war. Well, I mean, how did that go? But I think it's interesting to me that the culture war has become, everything is wrapped up into it. Every decision, even decisions that have nothing to do with culture, even decisions that seem completely untethered to the culture war become part of the culture war. And ideas that were once believed to be on one side of the culture war can easily switch sides. I wrote a piece that came out this week about horny bro conservatism. This idea that there's the so-called barstool conservative who just doesn't want to be told what to do. It's fascinating to me that some on the right have claimed those people as being on their side in the culture war when this is a particular side that's pretty much like pornography is fine, having sex out of marriage is fine, abortion is fine, just don't tell anyone what to do. And so the culture war can take on new applicants, the culture war can take on new topics. It is always growing and changing, but it never has to end. And isn't that because culture is not a fixed thing? Right. So if culture is always changing, then there's always a new front in the war. Exactly. And there's always something. I'm reminded of when I was in high school. I was in high school in the early 2000s. My freshman year, the second week of my freshman year of high school was 9-11. And so the culture war I remember was people being very mad at the Dixie Chicks over their opposition to the Iraq war and over being mean to George W. Bush. But also the culture war was about the over-sexualization of teen girls, which has been an ongoing concern for pretty much forever. You you had kind of the last vestiges of the moral majority that was very upset about this. But I've been struck now by how culture has shifted in a sense. And now you see some on the right complaining that teen girls aren't hot enough anymore and that people aren't sexy enough anymore. For instance, certain celebrities aren't hot enough to be celebrities or models aren't thin enough to be models. And it's interesting how as the culture shifts, people find new things to be mad about. It's not that they're wrong to be mad or right to be mad. It's that there is always something to be mad about. Culture shifts. Do you remember when people were extremely mad uh, after the um, Columbine massacre, which it turns out had nothing to do with bullying or the trench coat mafia, but had to do with the fact that these two kids were evil assholes? Mm. I know that's okay to say. Mm -hmm. But there was a lot of people who were like, Marilyn Manson did it. And violent video games. Like, some of these culture wars, you know, I'm a World War II nerd. And so the way that I think about like, ah, remember the Battle of Market Garden? I sometimes wonder if culture war veterans are like, ah, remember the battle over video games? Like when Grand Theft Auto came out and people were convinced that that was going to cause undue suffering. And then we all moved on from whether it caused undue suffering. So there's always a new front in the war. A new front in the war. And then also, I mean, one of the things we we wanted to do with these focus groups is get them to sort of define woke and talk about what that means. But it always has struck me that the conversation around wokeness is very old wine, new bottle. So there's both this idea that culture is always shifting, so there's always a new front in the war. But also, like, I grew up fighting a political correctness while you were still in high school and I was a young conservative uh, working at a conservative think tank. Political correctness was very much a thing that sort of consumed people. And Donald Trump ran on political correctness. Like, right. it's, like people are acting like Ron DeSantis like invented this woke culture war. But what he did was he put a new word around a phenomenon that the right has been mad about for right. as long as I've been around. But the challenge, as I, I wrote this week, is that the right is always divided between whether or not they want to protect you from being told what to do by these evil PC people, or whether they want to tell you what to do. It's also interesting how political correctness really was this moment 
because it became so all encompassing that how we talk about speech and how we talk about speech that we find impermissible, it became very in vogue to rail against political correctness. And then there'd be the moment where the person on behalf you are railing says something that's like one step over the line. And then you realize, hang on a second, actually, I have something that I also object to. And I think that that's the challenge we have now with, and we'll get into whatever woke means, because I've been struck by how some people think that woke has a very specific meaning. And I need those people to talk about how, why does woke mean there's a black person in a movie? Right. Uh, I remember when the uh, trailer for, I think, whatever the most recent Jurassic World movie came out. And someone was like, ah, a woke picture. And it was literally an image of Chris Pratt, the star of the film, with an African-American actress. And everyone was like, what's, what's woke about that? And I do think that that's one of the, the fascinating things about the terminology is that now it seems it is a catch-all term, which I think only benefits some of the worst people in society because you can decry wokeness and people will think that you mean their wokeness. Uh, totally. Like, you know, you mean something that you don't want your kids to see in school. But for some other people, it means black people appearing in a place that they shouldn't be. Yeah. So we were eager to ask people to define this term. So we asked a couple of Republican groups the ways in which the country is becoming too, quote unquote, woke. And we got a laundry list of complaints. Let's listen. Wokeism is treating people as members of groups. We're not treating people as individuals. We're defining people by the groups they're in. It's like gender politics. It's like identity politics. And I was just thinking about this the other day. I was watching a TV show. I was watching Survivor, actually. And Survivor has a new rule where you have to have so many Blacks, so many Asians. You have to have so many what they call minorities. Rather than the best candidates for the show. And we see this in movies all the time. You're not picking the yep. best actors. You're picking the Black or the Asian uh, or the yes. gay person. So it's this identity politics of forcing people to be thought of as members of groups rather than treating them as individuals. And that's what aggravates me the most, is we're getting away from thinking Amen. of people as people, and we're just classifying them according to the group there. And that just that aggravates the heck out of me. It just seems like everybody's leaning more towards what you call the Hollywood liberals and, you know, what they think is okay. And if you dare speak out and say you don't believe in something that they do, then they're trashing you. And it almost seems to me like I still think that those the Hollywood liberal types are in the minority, but that's what you hear about 90% of the time in the news or social media and sort of to make you believe, you know. I don't really know what I'm trying to say. I don't know if that makes sense or not. But um, yeah, that everybody has to believe this one way that, that the very liberal believes, or you just really shouldn't have any beliefs at all. It means uh, the way they're cramming the racism, homosexuality, transgender, the critical race theory, yep. let's put it that way, you know, all those things. And they want everybody to believe because I'm white. They want me, you know, oh, I'm racist because I was born white. And, you know, I'm not. I'm not racist. But I don't like that crammed down my throat through every movie that you watch anymore. They got to throw in all of their, ooh, I got to try not to say these bad words. Um, <laughs> <laughs> homosexuals, mixed families. It has to be a white man, black woman, or black man, white woman, you know, and, you know, the kids are really, you know, there's a black one, a white one, and something in between, you know, I, I'm just tired. As a millennial, I feel like I see, like, woke culture, like, all the time. I don't know. I feel like, you know, I, I'm, like, forced to accept other people's beliefs no matter what whether I agree with them or not, like they're just like the Democrats seem to be just hammering it down our throats all the time mm -hmm. that, you know, you constantly have to agree with everything. I would say like, oh man, like <laughs> transgenderness, mm -hmm. that like, Thank you. I don't know if I'm supposed to be PC in here or not, but like, it's like it's ran down my throat and I like, I don't care if you are, but like, I don't have to agree with them. Don't get mad at me if like I don't, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's my values. I work at a very liberal company, Starbucks, and I just try and do my job. Um, they're all the time trying to 
push everything. And, you know, when they want to, they will, you know, give us a pride shirt to wear, you know, during pride week or month or whatever. And that is one shirt I chose not to wear. Nobody says anything to me. I just make that decision. I'm not going to preach to anybody. I work with people that think differently than I, but we don't go there. And, um, you know, just like with the vaccine thing, you know, you just, I, I was just going to write it out. I didn't lose my job. I think that was a, a question, but just those things that I think if I had my druthers, I probably wouldn't even get in the conversation, but if somebody asked, I probably would tell them my opinion, but Again, I feel like we're being silenced. Okay, so there's some not great stuff in there, but there's a lot there. But yeah, but a lot let me to get into. Yeah, <laughs> let me let's start with the, really the most important point. Do you watch Survivor? I do not watch Survivor. Okay, all right. I watch Survivor religiously. I love Survivor, and I got to tell you, there's a lot of stuff to unpack in there. A lot of stuff that I don't agree with. There's a couple of things where I think people have a point, and I'm going to take the most charitable view with folks and, and, and say, I was, so I was watching Survivor and they have absolutely made an effort to make the cast more diverse. It's like one of the things about Survivor is Survivor is like this comforting show where even though it sort of has evolved over time, it's like very much the same in a lot of ways. And so Jeff Prost is always the host is always saying certain phrases all the time. And one of the things he does whenever people come in for a challenge is he says, come on in guys. And a few seasons back, he stops everybody and he says, does anybody object to me using the term guys? And a bunch of people say no, and everybody's sort of shaking their head. And then one person, one gentleman who is gay, and I think had a trans partner, if I recall, trans husband, objected, said, I do object to the term guys. And Jeff Probst said, okay, I'm not going to use this anymore. And he like changed that phrase that he used. And I rolled my eyes at this so hard and was like, are you serious? We can't say guys anymore? And So there's a part of me, there's a part of me that identifies with the annoyance that people feel over some of the evolving language that has been heretofore harmless, and suddenly they are being told that it is actually harmful. Because there a part of you that sort of understands like that piece of it, or, or do you think these people are being very unreasonable? I think I understand when people have a thing that they didn't even realize that they were kind of just used to. And then the thing changes in some way and they are annoyed by it. I used to write about college football in the NFL. And it is interesting to me whenever there is a rule change, how you're like, oh, that sounds reasonable. And then you see it executed for the first time. And you're like, well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. For instance, there have been rule changes that are supposed to protect the quarterback, which You know, we've learned so much about CTE and you've seen horrifying injuries happen. And you're like, that sounds great. Don't need another Trent Green situation in my life. And then you see some of the penalties people get for what looks like just gently brushing the quarterback. And you're like, well, this is ridiculous. I mean, the challenge that we seem to have, whether it's about Survivor, which every time I am reminded that it is still going on, you cannot kill you cannot kill a CBS series. They will be airing Blue Bloods until the day after I die. Um, but I, I think that one of the challenges here, I mean, I, I say this all the time about how to borrow uh, what used to be on Pimp My Ride on MTV, it was like Exhibit asked us, like, I heard you wanted criminal justice reform, so I got you this weird survivor challenge language change. <laughs> I feel as if a lot of this is because people and corporations specifically witnessed what has been happening over the last five to 10 years and decided to react to it in the most small ball way possible and didn't make anyone happy. No one has been bettered by changes to how people talk on Survivor. And I think that's one of the things where I keep thinking about how we are asking culture to solve political problems But no one wants to actually solve those political problems because it's really hard and people might get mad at you. And then we ask culture to respond to them or cultural entities to respond to them. And they are doing so in a way that feels to everyone 
overbearing and simultaneously insufficient. And so I, I understand the annoyance, but at the same time, I'm thinking like, this seems like something that happened because something else bigger didn't happen somewhere else. Well, maybe, but like take the woman who there at the last clip where she's talking about the pride shirt. Right. I totally am on her side. Like, I think it is would be so weird for an employer. I think it is weird the way these companies are saying mm-hmm. to people. Uh, and you know what? I got me one of those gay marriages. Yeah. I like the gay marriage. I like the gays. It's great. It's, it's great. great. It's great. But I am. It's weird to ask people like the Pride Month, like my Uber suddenly has like a rainbow tail on yes. it, like for an entire. I'm like, this feels like a strange way for our culture to respond. Right. to. Just let us be married and exist. Yeah, that's the thing is that like, I think, again, it is an indication of corporations specifically attempting to respond with a cultural action when they're not responding to, say, a political action like Starbucks, for example, attempting to discourage people from unionizing or for folks, you know, you're working 80 hour weeks and working all on the weekend. but You got a pride shirt. That's great. And so. It reminds me, um, after the murders of George Floyd and Ahmed Arbery and Breonna Taylor, people on Instagram started doing this thing of like, I'm posting a black box because that means I'm listening on racial justice. And I was like, that's not doing anything. Civil asset forfeiture is not being stymied by your black box. We're not getting the elimination of qualified immunity because of your black box. We're, I'm just annoyed with you. I was struck because you haven't mentioned this yet, and I understand why. But I was struck by the woman who, and this is always a fascinating tell to me. I am the product of a uh, interracial couple. And I am always struck by how there is a way in which people talk about mixed race couples. I'm also in a mixed race relationship, that they are a sort of plant by the media, that they aren't real, that this isn't a real thing that happens, that no one is in an actual interracial relationship, despite the fact that the number of people in interracial relationships has been skyrocketing dramatically over the last 30 years. But it's a fascinating tell that somehow um, that woman listed homosexuality, trans people, and mixed race relationships. I was like, oh, oh, I see. Oh, I see. There is something about how our culture works that we cannot tell in which direction our cultural mores move, whether they go from the bottom up or from the top down. And I think that one of our worst inclinations as people is to assume that the only reason people are gay or trans or in a mixed race relationship is because they saw it in a movie or because the cultural overlords made it look like it was okay. You know, I I think that the Lovings who had to go to court in 1967 and go to the Supreme Court to challenge the state of Virginia for their marriage, I am pretty sure they did not do so because they saw it in a movie. And I'm always struck by this idea that you are having mixed race relationships shoved down your throat. But I'm like, what? So the jammed. My the parents j- are just like hanging out. So the jammed down your throat piece is is. It's always that. Terminology. I know it is. So obviously, I view myself. I'm at the perfect place in the culture. Like I have the perfect position on mm-hmm. culture, and I think everybody would agree that Sarah Longwell's position is the perfect position on culture. Uh, I was in the bank yesterday, mm-hmm. and there is a picture of a gay couple doing banking. Yeah. Uh, there. And there is kind of like a montage. There's like a picture of a gay couple and there's like a, a black guy who's like um, a carpenter, I think. Right. And it's like a collection of people who do banking. And I think yeah. well, this would qualify to some of the people in this group as shoving it down their throats. Whereas I'm like, right, these are people who bank and the bank would like to show that many different people bank here, lest you be one of those people. And we'd like to see you reflected in it because we would like you to bank here. And so to me, that is a normal thing to do. Right. Whereas I think forcing people to wear a pride shirt or the bank having a pride month, I think that is like on the other side of things where I'm like, I think that some of the things they identified as shoving down their throat are just, hey, these people exist and we're going to like show you that they exist. Yeah. Whereas there are things that I might agree feel like kind of shoving things down somebody's throat. And what's hard, to te- it's hard to tease that out. Right. I remember that there was a Wells Fargo ad a couple of years ago. Now, keep in mind, Wells Fargo was one of the companies that really screwed over people during the, the Great Recession and signed people up for credit cards they didn't sign up for, took a ton of people's money. But they also had this ad that was about like a lesbian couple adopting a deaf child. 
And I was like, don't, don't bring, no, 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 no. Don't bring this into this. And so I don't like using that kind of cultural swordsmanship, the argument that you aren't going to do real things to benefit people, but you'll do this kind of performative action. I don't like that being included with there's a biracial person on my television and I don't like it because I don't think it's real. I don't like the fact that that can all be called wokeness and you could have someone who campaigned against quote unquote wokeness and someone would interpret that to mean I won't have to see biracial people on television anymore. Right. Uh, We played like a pretty long section there uh, of of those groups and I think It's very accurate of what we hear all the time. But you also hear like it's sort of inconsistent, right? People have different ideas very much of what woke means to them. And I had a reporter ask me one time, they were like, do people use the word woke in focus groups? And I was like, not really. Like we had to ask them sort of for the purposes of this, like what does woke mean to you for people to say it? And they they all had a variety of different opinions. And they're all sort of – it's some – it's like sub substructure of a culture war thing that particularly annoys them that is allowed to exist under this umbrella phrase woke right. for them. And actually, I'm going to get into that a little more. But before we do, I want to listen to the Dems. Yeah. You know, and you'll hear, I think, the disconnect between the way that the Republicans were talking about what woke is and what Dems say woke is. The term woke means stay educated. And that's all it means. Stay educated. But when you hear, and it's typically used by white Republicans, when you hear them saying the woke generation, they're talking about Black people. And no one wants to address it. I believe we have to talk, first of all. We need to talk. We need to understand one another. And I say this because of my foundation. We have a saying that says, in order for humanity to survive, we must care for one another. So we have to take the time to listen to each other and understand each other. Don't take a term that you know nothing about and run with it and use it in a way that's demoralizing or condescending to the next person. Governor DeSantis is the governor of Florida and he loves throwing that term out when he wants to disparage something. And it really angers me to hear it have a negative connotation. I don't look at a negative way at all. I think awareness is important for change. So I don't like how he uses that term and has made it negative. I don't look at it as a negative thing. Anytime you want to have a change, it's like to mock you. Oh, you're so woke. It's like to cut that dialogue out because it's done a very condescending way. Oh. Yeah, like um, Saf is coming from like you know, like a Caucasian type person, like you need to be more woke. Like, I guess it's in their delivery, their tone of how they're saying it. So if it's, I guess, just depending on the situation, you know, and and how they're just presenting it to you, you know, it can come off as rude, you know, it can come off as kind of like a, they're kind of trying to be kind of controlling. They're trying to make you aware of something, but it's kind of like a privilege type thing. I would be yeah. proud to be called woke. Yeah, and Jesus I think it's was a compliment. woke, by the way. So the funny thing about this word is that the definitions vary widely. And I think, you know, for the Democratic group, they, they didn't so much want to define woke as define like the way it is hurled at them. Right? Right. And I, I think that this also goes to the thing about how a culture war cannot be won or lost is that like now you hear some of those Democrats being like, hell yeah, I'm woke. Like <laughs> Jesus was woke. <laughs> Jesus was the you. original wokester. Yeah. Exactly. And you know, screw you, screw these people. People aren't like, oh, oh, I'm so sorry about my wokeness. I will <laughs> repent. Like, no, that's not how people react to things. Like if you attempt to ban something, everybody's more interested in it. If you attempt to decry something, in general, people become like very defensive of it. Then you ask more questions and people might be like, oh, well, I don't like this. I don't like that. But using it as a cudgel doesn't do what you think it's going to do. It was notable. There's a number of people who hear it very distinctly as a dog whistle. And it, what's interesting to me about the term woke That's what happens when it can mean so many things. On one hand, it is a racial dog whistle. On the other, for a lot of people, it's talking about like gender ideology or it's talking about what's being taught in schools or it's about how they want to be able to say a certain thing and they feel like they can't because it's not politically correct. Or it's about, you know, CRT or it is about race and it's about, you know, a multiracial family on TV. 
all of those things. When you hear it, do you hear it as a racial dog whistle? Yes and no, because it is often used as a racial dog whistle, because I think that that, again, when you use this term as an umbrella term, it becomes... I now hear the woman who doesn't want to see biracial people on television. You might have meant something entirely different, but all I'm hearing is there are too many mixed race couples on my television and I don't like it because, you know, I remember when I was a kid, woke was what the guys in the barbershop would say about how you needed to be worried about the fluoride in the water because you have to stay woke. Like they won't tell you about (laughs) this. And so that's how I heard it. And then you had to stay woke because, you know, the FBI wanted to kill Martin, which is, okay, sort of actually true. And so this idea, like, wokeness was this conceit that you need to stay aware and stay awake. You need to keep your eyes open to how the powers that be were prepared to mistreat you and mistreat people like you, generally African-Americans. And it's interesting now to see it become this catch-all term when it will always, to many African-Americans, always sound like they were right all along. They should stay aware. They should stay awake to the way in which power structures can be wielded against them. So one of the things that I use the focus groups for is to help me think about messaging. And on this sort of idea that it is difficult for people to define woke, and you learn a lot by sort of throwing out an open-ended question about, like, what do you think is woke? You know, they were just saw this prominent anti-woke activist, uh, Bethany Mandel. She was asked on television, she has a book out about how, you know, wokeness Mm. is destroying children. And Mm -hmm. she was asked to define woke on TV. And she kind of had like this brain freeze because she couldn't conjure a definition. And the Dems, rather than getting sort of mad or I think that they should just constantly, when people say like, oh, you're woke, what does that mean? What, tell, right. me, tell me what that means, because I think that people will betray themselves pretty quickly in terms of what it, what it means to them. Yeah, I, I think that asking people what they mean by something is often the best question any journalist can ask. I also think that it, if I were doing democratic messaging, I would really focus on how this seems to be a distraction mm-hmm. from a lot of actual Like issues. maybe the actual war? That exists. Yeah, and actual, yeah, the actual war or actual wars. I mean, many of the same people who decry wokeness are currently proposing that we bomb targets in Mexico because apparently war is cool when it's here. That sounds great. Or you, know, you think about so many of the issues people are struggling with in actual life and people attempting to tether that to some sort of wokeness issue, but not actually doing anything about it. Because again, culture wars should not be won, and they cannot be lost. That's not the point. The point is not to do anything about any of these actual issues. The point is to have something to fight about on the internet or on television for the rest of our lives. Yeah. So I would always say that, like, one, what do you mean? What does wokeness mean? And two, what does this have to do with any actual problem for people who are not on the internet all the time? (laughs) Right. Speaking of things that happen on the internet all the time, I want to talk about our second culture war buzzword, which is cancel culture. Now, I know you hate it, but among our Republican groups, they had a very strong sense that Republicans exist in a world of fear with cancellation by the liberals in their lives just around the corner at any moment. Let's listen. The left, they can't really make their point as to why they believe that way. They just want to scream in your face and tell you they don't believe in the things that you do. I think there's hotbeds. I mean, you know, abortion, hotbed. Uh, religion, hotbed. Politics, hotbed. And it's not that we can have political discussions anymore. We can't. People aren't happy if you don't agree with them, uh, especially the liberals. You know, you, you just can't go out and have that discussion anymore because people want to try to convince you. I always have a, a rule of thumb at a party. You don't talk politics, you don't talk religion, because you're not going to convince anybody to change. It really is like a, a problem, like in families, because people feel like a certain way it it just it's scary when you can't have conversations it's like you're not allowed an opinion i mean we've been like not so much myself but my husband like you know really put like in a place from our granddaughter it's like it's a, a crazy time 
if you don't like go along with what you're supposed to to do, uh, you, you're just uh, old and stupid, you know. But I, I know that we're not stupid. I understand all of the things that everyone has said because we've experienced all of those things in our household as well with family members disowning us because of our political votes, where they've gone, vaccinations, COVID, school, like all the things. We are participating and having all of that happen to us in our lives too. So like people talk like this in the groups all the time, where they basically use the term canceled when they mean someone got mad at me for my opinion. Right. I I am also curious in the family examples. I'm like, what exactly did you say? (laughs) I know. Like, yeah, but again, this is why I think having these catch-all terms is so difficult. Because, for example, when people talked about cancel culture to begin with, it was these specific examples of the woman who tweeted something about how she was going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS, and by the time she landed, she had gotten fired from her job and everyone hated her Yes, on the internet. Um, again, a lot of this is on the internet. The words on the internet should be added to all of this. <laughs> or people who are wrongly accused of something and lose their jobs, lose their career. I generally don't think of famous people in this way because I think that famous people have the unique way to always come back from pretty much anything. I think of people who it's like, you were seen in a viral video doing something awkward and somehow lost your job because of it. But now it has become encompassing to mean someone didn't like my opinion and they were mad at me for it. I've been canceled. I wonder who have these people canceled? Against whom have they wielded the cancel culture cudgel? Yeah, there's a fair amount of lack of self-awareness oftentimes in the groups. I mean, but I got to say, this to me is the kind of organic genius of Republican messaging because they're able to provide sort of a pernicious term that people can tap into when they want to describe Things liberals in my life do that annoy me. Then the family ones come up all the time in focus groups. And it's a lot of it's sad. You know, it's like people who don't talk to each other anymore. It's just a function of our political polarization. But like the woman here who was talking, her husband, it sounded like was having an argument with the granddaughter over it sounded like immigration and things got heated. She got mad. I think the granddaughter called him racist and that clearly hurt them. But, like, that was their definition of cancel culture. And that's just, like, all over the Republican groups, this sort of grievance of people who get mad at me for my opinion. But they're so different from the Democrats, though. I want to listen to the Democrats, and then I have a a question, Mm -hmm. because I I would say that the cancel culture stuff, unlike wokeness, where the Dems were pretty resistant to letting Republicans get away with calling things woke— Cancel culture, the Democrats were more sympathetic to this idea existing. I think I became concerned about it many years ago before it even became to the point where it is at now. You know, I think things that should be canceled isn't canceled and things that should stay in place, they're canceling it. And for what reason? It makes no sense. You know, and I don't get it. I'm grateful that my children are no longer in school, they're adults, but I feel bad for the children that are coming up in this era now because there's a lot of things that they're canceling that it shouldn't be canceled, but it's things that they're letting fly by that need to be canceled. If I don't agree with something or if I'm prejudiced against something, I'm going to try my absolute hardest to get as much people behind me to cancel something um, and not, you know, keep it going, not keep it alive. I think, you know, people who have been canceled in the past, we've all been children, we've all been young and dumb at one time. And something that I say or do when I'm immature and young should not come and haunt me, you know, 10, 15 years later down the road. In the United States, murder has no statute of limitation, but rape does. Crimes against children. It depends on what you've done. I believe in holding people accountable. And some things you just can't say sorry for. But instead of canceling them, I think that People need to have time to look into it. Some people will lie on you, and a lie travels faster than the truth. So in order to hold someone accountable for something horrific that they've done in the past, you have to look into it. But we all make mistakes. We all fall short. 
And we've all done some things in our past that we wish we would not have done. So I found it interesting that a lot of these people on some level, like they believe in holding people accountable for their worst moments, but they also have this instinct toward grace. And I think especially for older people, Mm -hmm. you know, they think about their worst moments and if it had been captured on camera, like they grew up at a time when not everybody had a camera. And so it sounded to me like a lot of them felt like people were being too hard on people oftentimes, or that like we should have some some room for people to make mistakes and be allowed to come back. I I found their answers to be quite compassionate. Unlike where the Republicans felt like cancel culture was a thing that was visited on them. Right. Democrats felt like cancel culture is a thing that's kind of real and we should be careful with how we wield it. Right, exactly. And I think that that's the thing is that like cancel culture, I think strikes also at a personal level, but I am almost certain that there are certain things that have been deemed cancel culture that people are like oh yeah that guy absolutely like the dilbert guy recently where i'm just like well you know you don't have a legal right to have your cartoon in newspapers right is the challenge of these overarching terms i was of like kind of the first generation on facebook and i remember in about 2008 2009 where everyone was about to graduate from college where all of these people I knew from high school took down so many of these pictures of themselves that they had taken drinking or doing something debaucherous. And I just keep thinking about, like, imagine if you know, those photos come back. And we've seen so many examples of that happening to actual people. And I think that that is something that people see as, as so different than, like, Louis C.K. getting to perform again. Right. It, it's difficult that we don't have a diversity of terms to talk about the diversity of experiences that we have And we just have this way of talking about how do we move past either our own mistakes or the transgressions of other people, which transgressions have reached the bar where we don't have to get over them. And how do we talk about that? Uh, Yeah, totally, totally. Okay, well, I want to pivot back to Republicans for these last couple of clips because they relate to sort of the biggest culture war third rail, which is kids, right? Because a lot of us... You could sort of say, well, I, I'm a grown up. I, I can, you know, we'll talk about yeah. trans issues. or But like, it's about the kids. And this is Ron DeSantis, I think, has put sort of the kids squarely at at the center of, of how he's talking about sort of wokeness. So the Republican groups, once again, uh, they have a laundry list of grievances over the way public schools are being run currently. Let's listen. That's the problem with critical race theories. You're now starting not just to teach facts, but to actually influence the interpretation of facts by giving an interpretation of facts. And that's why I think parents do have a legitimate need to understand what's being taught and have some influence over it, whether it's input, influence, control, whatever. I think we do need to know what our kids are being taught because it's quite possible that it's being flavored with a political agenda and it's not just teaching facts. I don't like the recent culture of you have to address me the way I think you have to address me. You have to believe whatever I believe. And like my wife is a teacher, for instance, she's a fifth grade teacher and she's got students that have to be addressed like certain ways, whether it be like by gender or by, uh, you know, whatever, everything they come up with. And if she addresses them differently, it's pushed back on by the parents. And I don't, I don't like that that's the case now. When these other countries are teaching their kids, you know, how to actually do something, when we're teaching our kids how to worry about what gender they are, you know, that kind of thing just, mm. <laughs> I went to a very big university here in Ohio, and I grew up in a really small town that was all Republican, and it was, like, mind-blowing. I mean, nobody ever pushed, you know, politics on us in high school. And as soon as I went to college, it was like everything was like so pushed on us in regards to how we should think. And thankfully, I never fell into the trap. But a lot of my friends did just from hearing their professors and other people talk about what they should believe, you know, believe in. I I think teachers should teach kids to think and not what to think. Uh, The indoctrination of you're going to be a little mini me because I'm a teacher and I'm in charge of you for eight hours a day is ridiculous. Um, you know, a teacher's hired to, to help assist the parent, but the parents should be in full control of what the kid sees, doesn't see. And um, I, I just don't like where we're at right now. So this has become like a very hot button political mm-hmm. issue. And I think that with a lot of this stuff, there's a spectrum where people are in a sort of a crazy place like, oh, no, there's litter boxes in schools. 
And then there's like kind of a more reasonable place that I think got Glenn Youngkin elected in Virginia. So the idea that parents should have a say in their kids' education, that parents are concerned about some of what's being taught to their kids at young ages in school. I'm sympathetic to the more normal argument on some of this stuff. And I think that for a lot of swing voters that we do, we do a lot of groups of swing voters, this comes up a lot. And I I think that DeSantis has decided to wage a very particular and aggressive kind of war to win over sort of the crazy side of this debate. Mm -hmm. I sort of have always thought that it will resonate and play okay with swing voters if he can sound more Yunkin-ish come general election. What do you think? Perhaps. I think the challenge, though, I I was struck by how there was a person who referenced how their wife was a teacher and that if they didn't use the correct pronouns for a child, the the kid's parents would push back. And I think that this is less parents versus schools than it's parents versus other parents, which I am not a parent. And I would rather walk into the fires of hell than get in between two parents who have a fight over their kids. (laughs) I, I would lie down in front of a bus before I would face that. And so I think that it is telling to me that there's this idea that kids are being indoctrinated, but of course they are. I went to Catholic school. That was the entire point of Catholic school was to indoctrinate us. That's why you do it. (laughs) But it's what you're being indoctrinated with what your parents want you to be indoctrinated by. You are never, ever getting the reading, writing, arithmetic school that apparently people seem to imagine that they went to. They did not. There was an interesting op-ed in the New York Times about a young girl who refused to say the Pledge of Allegiance and was basically assaulted by her principal for doing so. Now, it is not required for you to say the Pledge of Allegiance. It is not a crime. Uh, The Supreme Court has ruled in 1943, one of the great decisions of that body, that you don't have to. But this woman received nonstop vitriol because clearly saying the Pledge of Allegiance was very important to people. Again, that is a form of indoctrination. We use it as a cudgel, but it does not necessarily mean that something is bad or good. I went to church so that I could be indoctrinated with the ethos of the Catholic Church. I would imbibe the doctrine of Catholicism, which some of that was great and some of it was you know, less great. But I think that the, the real battle here is between parents versus parents. And I think that so often, and I think this is where Democrats fail a little bit, Democrats forget that Democrats are also parents and they have kids and that you can talk about how you want your kids to learn these different things. It's not just evil teachers. Teachers are also parents often. I think that we saw in 2022 in a bunch of states in which A lot of Democratic parents were like, actually, I want my kids to have these books in schools. Actually, I want my kids to learn these things. I was also interested that, uh, uh, you know, schools in other countries are doing things so much better. We still have the best ranked universities in the world. Thousands of people come to the United States to study. And many of the people's educational experiences in other countries, I think people often use China as an example, China's educational system is based on doing a very specific type of indoctrination with regard to the Chinese party and with regard to kind of Chinese authority over that country. And so it's interesting to me that we don't see the indoctrination that we like as indoctrination. That's just how you should be educated. But we see the indoctrination we don't like as indoctrination. Well, speaking of kids and things that that people object to, the, the last thing I really want to talk about is the bill out of Tennessee banning drag performances on public right. property. And DeSantis has also really picked this up. He pulled the liquor license from a Florida hotel for hosting a drag show. It's interesting how the, the voters in our groups, when we asked about it, jumped right to the protecting kids angle when we asked about it. Let's listen. Any consenting adult can do whatever they want, wherever, but I would not in a library, not in a school, nothing involving kids. I would stand for those people to have their rights to do those things. And then in exchange, I would expect them to support my rights to be able to, you know, do things that don't hurt them in any way. That's the thing I just seen, too. They they was doing drag shows in like elementary school. There was a video of like these kids in preschool and they had a drag going in there and doing a dance for them. And it was like a 
auditorium and everybody was in there and i just looked at that and i was like that is crazy it's like what are they teaching but now that they're banning that i love that that's the, that's a great that they're banning it i i guess it would depend on whether it's you know it's if it's a nude or sexualized show or something like that but if it's just something you'd see if somebody was transgender walking down the street i mean you know some people are going to see that regardless so i mean if it's something that's a sexualized show i definitely have an issue with that um, but it's just, I mean, hell, not to minimize it, but Peter Pan in plays was played by a woman for years. That doesn't necessarily bother me, but something that would be content inappropriate, they have the right to their opinion. They have the right to, you know, share their thoughts, but they don't have to right to stand in front of a bunch of kindergartens and have some kind of sexualized show. What do you make of the drag panic going on? I think it's the stupidest thing in the entire world. I think it is indicative of, again, how a culture war will always seek a new front, especially because, one, it is actually about trans people, but it has somehow decided that, like, yelling about drag queens is a way to yell about trans people in a way that doesn't involve trans people, but we all know it does include trans people. You saw online how there was a very specific effort by Chris Rufo to talk about how drag queens were trans strippers, Mm. which is not what a drag queen is but also it becomes this thing that we have to discuss when we could be discussing any other number of things and especially because i think there has long been this idea that if a kid sees a drag queen and i think that i have witnessed a drag queen story hour and a drag queen read a story and then that was pretty much it there was nothing sexualized. I mean, I believe that they were reading The Very Hungry Caterpillar, which I don't remember being a specifically erotic text, but I'd have to go back and check. I I can confirm. I do have kids. Can confirm. It is, you know, unless unless you've got a a food fetish, maybe. It's true. It's true. In which case, life must be complicated for you. (laughs) Um, I think that there is a sense that if you see a drag queen or... A trans person, because what I actually really gets me about the Tennessee bill, it's incredibly vague. So for one thing, it implies that it is about both drag queens and drag kings. And it's written in such a way that could possibly, if you were the worst cop in the world, could just include trans people. Mm -hmm. And it's also written in such a sense, let's see, um, male or female impersonators who provide entertainment that appeals to a prurient interest boy, I am not looking forward to the first court case in which someone has to argue about what the purient interest Mm -hmm. was with regard to so many things. But I think that it goes back to this idea that I've seen so many times in which people think that if you see an LGBT person, that that will make you LGBT or that LGBT people were totally normal. And then they saw a drag queen or they saw Paris is burning or I don't know. They saw that that episode of Ellen where she reveals that she's gay and then that that just does it. And if you just avoid that, they'll grow up to be straight and normal. And so I think it's a distraction of an argument. I think it's an an anti-trans argument disguised as an anti-drag argument. But I think it's also about this idea that children are these tabula rasas. And if, if they are shown anything, they will immediately become whatever they have seen. Now, again, I went to Catholic school, and I can tell you, it did not quite work that way. Hmm. Yeah. So uh, first of all, I completely agree with the point you just made. But let me go to a place where it's slightly more complicated, which is on like the issue of non-binary and talking to kids mm-hmm. about non-binary and the idea that there is no gender Because you're right, it all kind of like the drag queen stuff and the trans conversation and the sort of gender conversation around language in classrooms. There are different elements of this debate. And that that one of the things that I really want to get out of this episode is that the idea by providing these blanket terms really benefits Republicans in the culture war because it allows people to tag things that are on the really crazy side of the spectrum and things that are just – I don't know, we can have like very reasonable differences of opinion on all under one big umbrella term that people can sort of lock into. And that allows Ron DeSantis to essentially appeal to people who don't want to see biracial couples 
as well as parents who are a little concerned that, that their kids are coming home and saying they identify as they when they're six, mm-hmm. right? Like they all under exist under the same sort of cultural banner. Right. Because I think that there's things, I mean, I don't, so we were talking about how old we are. Mm-hmm. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that are a little harder or I don't know, maybe a little personal. Right. And same, same for me, right? When I was coming out, there was so little visibility around lesbians that like there was just like nothing even to look to. And once I was like, okay, I'm a lesbian, I could find a lot of cultural signals. You said I had to go looking for them, but like there was Ellen and Mm -hmm. then uh, spent my 20s and 30s in a culture for lesbians. Now uh, there's all this non-binary stuff, which didn't exist when I was younger. And I do find it like it's very new. And I have this sort of like, I want everybody to be happy and I want everybody to be self-actualized. And I want everybody to pursue their truth. And I, I genuinely believe that. Uh, and then there's this other part of me that's like, but I find the language vexing sometimes. I think we are, uh, like, I'm still struggling to understand things that I know, like my kids are, are coming up in a totally different way. And maybe that's just the way that the world works. And there will always be kids saying to their parents and to their grandparents, like, listen, you old fogies, you don't understand. I, I know the real truth about the world now. But I, I mean, do you do you have sympathy for people who are sort of struggling with the newness of a lot of this and trying to figure out what the right speed is for kids to engage with it? Yeah. And especially because I think that this is a generational issue. And for example, one of the great benefits that kids now have, let's say you're 18 years old right now. That means you were born in 2005, which is a wild thing to say. But that also means that when you were 10 years old, Obergefell went through the Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. And so when you were about six or seven is when Barack Obama came out in support of marriage equality. For the vast majority of your life, you have not had to experience in some ways, the overarching homophobia of a society aimed at eliminating you that so many people did. When I talk to older gays and lesbians who are in their 50s or 60s or 70s, there is a real sense of like, they just can't believe it. They can't believe that we got here, that we did this. But I also think that that means there's something bonding about being on the vice of oppression. There's something that brings people together to be like, no matter our differences, we are clearly all being hated by the same people. And so I think that for many LGBT people, there is a sense now that there's less bringing people together. There's less like, what are we fighting for and what are we fighting as? And I also think that it's worth noting here, like I remember when I asked my mom, in the way you think you're being extremely subtle when you're a kid, like, what would you do if I were gay? (laughs) I was like six or seven. And my mom said, and I think about this all the time, because my mom's mom's a very liberal woman who loves me very much and loves my spouse very much. And But she was like, you know, I'd be scared for you because your life would be Mm -hmm. harder. Now, this would have been, this would have been 1994. So this is like even just before Don't Ask, Don't Tell. This is a very understandable thing to say. Mm -hmm. But I got the message of like, don't be that. And I already kind of, I already knew. I had seen the movie Mannequin with Kim Cattrall. And I was like, I'm going to marry Kim Cattrall. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, boy, that's a big problem for me. Kim Cattrall, well. I don't know if you've ever seen Mannequin. I have very. It's not a good movie, but she was. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to marry her. Um, I had seen it on television, and I wanted to marry her, and that was going to be a problem. And I hear this now, it's interesting with regard to trans kids or gender nonconforming kids that like, oh, I don't want my kid to be that because their life will be harder, Mm -hmm. which I'm like, or we could just make life less hard for them in a number of ways. And I think that one thing I keep thinking about, though, about like how this generational shift has happened is that there is a sense that Yes, it's good there's been increased acceptance, but I think that there are people who are worried that something has been lost. You were talking about lesbian signifiers, Mm -hmm. and I I am picking up, and you can correct me, that you're a little bit worried that the use of the term lesbian, you know, the idea of being a lesbian, that something is being lost if folks are coming out as queer or coming out as non-binary or gender non-conforming? That's, well, that's a good question. Actually, I, I, can I just say that I th- feel like I come at these conversations from three perspectives. One is the, the parent of kids who are right. being 
taught things and language that like I, I sometimes find confounding. Like it just it's different. And I have mm-hmm. them forming my opinions of how I feel about some of it and how they're interacting with it as young people. Then there's me as a lesbian who I wonder how it might have been different for me as a kid if the what is available now on the spectrum had been available to me, like how I would have, mm-hmm. whether that would have been good or bad for me, because I'm uncertain. And then also as, as somebody for whom women's sports were quite important and formative for me, mm-hmm. I think I grapple with these issues and I feel like I'm mad sort of at everyone all the time. Like I'm really mad at the, with the lack of compassion, the gross way that conservatives have taken on trans issues as a way to wedge people culturally and be despicable to people. And I also find myself torn about the ways that we're trying to accommodate these new things. And like, I I agree with you. I want to make people's lives easier, but I also don't want to put my pronouns in a Zoom. So yeah, that's how I'm thinking about it. Right. And I think that there's room for that. I would say that there's a moment in the movie um, Children of the Corn, which is not a good horror movie. I don't like horror movies, but I think about it all the time because there's like the kid who's been basically leading this cult that's killing all of the adults. And he's doing it on behalf of this entity, this like evil entity that lives in the cornfields. And I believe his name is Malachi. And there's a moment at which one of the children who has been killed by this evil cult leader comes back as a zombie. And there's this moment at which he comes and looks and says to this character, he wants you to Malachi. And I think about that because we have now seen that the same people who are railing against trans people competing in sports are also saying like, hey, we should reconsider Obergefell. Right. You know, I, I think a lot about gender nonconforming people. Because the idea that people are like, what about feminine men and masculine women? And I'm like, you know, do you think that things have been super easy for them anyway? Do you really believe that the folks, one, it's not the same thing as being trans, but also that the idea that we have been so accepting of gender nonconforming people up until now is a fallacy? And so I am concerned about a increasing slippery slope that takes out all of us that is aimed at all of us. And so I think that there are a lot of individual issues, especially because there are ways in which people talk about, say, the sports issue that ignores the experiences of trans men. It's interesting to me that when we talk about trans women and trans girls, we are always talking about like evil adults who are gross and bad. And we talk about trans men as sad children where something went horribly wrong. Uh, There was an article in National Review about a trans man. It was written very poorly. But one of the comments was, oh, how will she ever get a man to Mm. love her? And I was like, oh, boy. I heard your head hit the desk there. (laughs) Yes, I genuinely hit the desk there. And so I think a lot about how we think it's about just trans kids or non-binary kids, but it's actually about all of us. It's about the ways in which people are shifting how they identify and wishing to be themselves in the world and figuring out the right ways to do that and how that changes over time. And I also think about the ways in which the people who had been keeping quiet about marriage equality found a new issue to rail at. I understand it's complicated. It's incredibly complicated. My answer is currently taking like 10 minutes, (laughs) but I think that it's worth trying to keep all of this straight because it's a sign of intelligence to be able to keep two opposing thoughts in your head Mm. at the same time. And so I think that the concerns that you're raising are interesting and valid. And I also think that the concerns that I'm thinking about in which I see the ways in which people are using this as a means to either go after some of the most vulnerable people or attempting to take back rights that they believe we shouldn't have gotten in the first place. That's what concerns me. I also think there is a degree to which how we talk about these issues, it's so time-based. I, I think a lot about how gay men who experienced the AIDS crisis 
who experienced a time in which they watched their friends and their family die while people didn't seem to care or that they were rejected by their families. I think a lot about how we have come so far, but I also think that there is a degree to which they are experiencing something that I think that LGBT people have never really gotten to experience before, which is like the younger versions of you annoying you. (laughs) You never really, you know, if you were, imagine that, like if you were a gay man in 1955, you never thought about what it would be like to see future gay kids irritating you or doing something you don't understand. I think in some ways it is a sign of incredible growth that, I go to Pride and you see like the lesbian teens in their 20s getting messy and drunk and make, <laughs> making out all over the place. And you're like, oh, just not on my shoes, yeah. please. Just not on my shoes. Well, you know, I could have this particular conversation with you forever, but we're going to have to leave it there. Jane Coaston, thank you so much for coming on the Focus Group podcast and talking through these Absolutely. Tri- thank you so much yeah, for having the best. me. It was the best. And thanks to all of you for listening to another week of the Focus Group podcast. We will be back next week when we will be talking about a real war and asking voters about Ukraine. Oh, boy. See you then. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Focus Group Podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and this week we're talking about the GOP's evolution on foreign policy. One year ago, around when Putin launched his invasion of Ukraine, I did a focus group of two-time Trump voters, and they were firmly pro-Ukraine. One year on, not so much. Only 29% of Republicans see Russia as a major threat to U.S. interests according to a January Pew Research poll. That's down from 51% in March 2022. At that time, only 9% of Republicans thought we were doing, quote unquote, too much for Ukraine. This past January, that number jumped to 40%. The Iraq war also began 20 years ago this week. All of the Republican voters we talked to supported it 20 years ago, but now they are deeply cynical about American foreign policy. My guest today is Tom Nichols, staff writer at The Atlantic and professor emeritus of national security affairs at the U.S. Naval War College. He's also my good buddy. Tom, thanks for being here. Good to be with you, Sarah. Okay, I'm just going to ask you an open-ended question just to start because you already tweeted and you already showed me your face right before we started the podcast (laughs) uh, to indicate that perhaps your reaction to hearing these voters was one of uh, deep concern. But just tell me what you thought of the focus groups listening to these voters. Well, you know, in a way, I'm, sometimes I'm, I'm the worst person to ask because I'm, I adhere to that old Churchill line about the argument against democracy is a 10-minute discussion with the voter. Mm. Um, but I also understand that foreign policy is really complicated and people find it, you know, a difficult and emotional subject. The overall comment I'll make compared to, say, focus groups that you see on television in the 70s or the 80s even, is just this immense amount of confidence and assurance. There are a few exceptions, and you know they'll probably come up when we're talking, of people say, well, I, I absolutely know what's going on here. And of course, then they proceed to say something that's just wrong. And so the information basis and the kind of epistemological certainty You know, those two things combined really worry me. And I think that's part of an overall phenomenon that's been a problem, you know, in this country for years now. Yeah, well, a lot of them have been doing their own research. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. (laughs) So I know as a a complaint of yours and something that I hear all the time in the focus groups is the the sort of gold standard for information uh, because they can't trust anything else is that they do their own research. And as a result, they were kind of all over the map about what they thought about foreign policy and what information they had. But I want to dive into what these voters were thinking because I want to just sort of stipulate up front. I'm not a foreign policy person. At the risk of sounding like one of these voters overly confident in my own positions, I just want to say I have you on here to be the expert because I am not. So I was born in 1980, which I'm sorry, that must sound hard to you. Because I think you're you're slightly older. Wow, I'm, the- <laughs> I'm going into Grandpa Simpson mode while we're sitting here already. Ah! Uh, 
<laughs> so I was born in 1980. So I'm born the year that Reagan takes office. I remember the wall coming down. I was in college when 9-11 happened. Uh, I sort of began my professional career as a young conservative at the time we were going into Iraq. And I was part of a conservative establishment that was super supportive of going into Iraq. And I, you know, was sort of raised on the Weekly Standard politically and by a lot of the neocons. And I guess the one thing sort of stipulating that I don't know that much specifically about foreign policy, I will say the change in the Republican Party and the change in Republican voters for how they talk about foreign policy is to me the biggest change. I mean, there's a lot of other changes we can talk about in terms of character, not counting. No, it's astonishing. Yeah, right. They've changed a lot. But but this, this on foreign policy, it really is wild, right? Right, right. And as you were entering the world and uh, opening your eyes for the first time in this great adventure, I was voting for Ronald Reagan. Yeah. That was my first election. And I think when it comes to foreign policy and in so many other things, but foreign policy especially – What's changed is that the party that I joined in the late 70s, which had this deeply confident, optimistic, very assured belief in America, even though by the end of the 70s, this was after Watergate, it was after Vietnam, you know, all the tropes that are also true about how people didn't trust government anymore. The party of Reagan, as it was constituted in 80 and onward, believed in the shining city on the hill, that America could do great things, that we were more often right than wrong. And that confidence has been lost. And the base of the Republican Party in particular has kind of congealed into this sour, churlish, a pox on all houses, everybody sucks kind of pessimism that not only pushes back against the foreign policy establishment that these voters, these base voters see as hopelessly liberal, mm. which, you know, that's that's a big part of it, right? If you say State Department or even Defense Department, you know, the corrupt liberal deep staters, even though, especially in, in national security, most of those people are pretty conservative. Um, and so they've kind of resorted to this know-nothing isolationism with one horrible difference, which is that these are people that go to rallies that say, I'd rather be a Russian than a Democrat. They've kind of cast the Russians as a placeholder in the way that liberals used to do, by the way. This is the thing that really, if you were a young conservative in the 80s, that liberals would say, well, you know, the Soviet Union is not perfect, but it's a counterweight to the United States. It limits the United States from just doing whatever it wants, the kind of stuff you read in the nation back then. The core Republicans have become that. Well, you know, Putin is not a great guy, but, you know, white Christian traditionalist, hates trans people, hates gay people. What's not to like about the guy? And I think that this is really the effect of propaganda, a steady drumbeat of propaganda from places like Fox, but also the collapse of local news, the collapse of any form of news that isn't either entertainment or internet rabbit holes. Yeah where people just don't read newspapers. They have no sense really of national news. As you say, they do their own research. And I think that's what's happened with a lot of these people. And it has completely melted down their sense of moral orientation or their ability to engage in any kind of critical reasoning. This is undoubtedly true. And one of the reasons I know it's true is that I was doing focus groups right after Russia invaded Ukraine. And we did an episode back then with Alexander Vindman, and this is how two-time Trump voters sounded back then. The most concerning issue at the moment, I believe, is Putin going into the Ukraine, um, war crimes. The issue for the United States, I think the major problem is who the president is. If Trump was president, I should say he is, but we know what happened on that. Putin would have never invaded. What do you guys think about what you've seen from the Ukrainian people and their leader? How do you awesome. feel about them? They're amazing. amazing. I love, love them. them. Absolutely amazing. Especially when a 60-year-old woman can stand there and tell a soldier from Russia, I'm going to put seeds in your pocket and then kill you. And then the seeds will grow up 
flowers yep. over your dead body. Right. When the babushkas take AK 47s. There you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's impressive. Amen. I, th- God bless I think him. President Zelensky is a phenomenal leader, too. I mean, when his line when he said, you know, I need ammunition, I don't need a ride. Like, that was right. such mm-hmm. a powerful line. If and Joe I, Biden had 1% of his spine, America would yeah. be okay. We have more than enough oil and natural gas in the United States that we can supply the rest of the world. Nobody's got to get gas from Russia. Prices would come down here as a result. Open up the fucking pipeline. Oy. Okay. Now, I remember this episode really vividly, and the reason I remember it is because gas prices were really high, and a bunch of voters in that group said that they would tolerate high gas prices if it meant that we could defeat Vladimir Putin, that, like, they'd be fine with it. And I remember at the time, Vindman was very sort of reassured listening to these voters that their instincts were in the right place. And I remember being like, "Eh, I wonder how sticky that gas price Mm, thing's going to be. And it turned out not very sticky. But more importantly, to your point about the media, these guys loved Ukraine back then. They wanted to get Putin and they wanted to help and they they admired the Ukrainians. When we get to the, the next section about where people are now, suffice it to say it's different. And I think that your point about the media is dead on. Like there has been a relentless campaign to change how these voters view what's happening there. And it's working. No, it's totally working. But I guess, why do you think Tucker Carlson and the entire right-wing infrastructure, it's still, to me, sort of gobsmacking that they've become, it's not too much to say pro-Putin. Oh. Like, what? what is happening? Why do they want to do this? Boy, that is a gigantic subject. So with the caveat to everyone that I'm going to do this in shorthand, I think there's a couple of reasons. First of all, I think Fox in particular, its brand is we are the loyal, beleaguered opposition to the gigantic democratic machine that runs this country. And it's an attitude they took with them even when the White House and both houses were in the hands of Republicans. They are addicted to this notion that we are the plucky gorillas telling you the truth against this giant blob. And so, of course, because Biden and NATO are all in on this and helping Ukraine, it's not an interesting hour for Tucker to come on and say, hey, you know, the United States basically doing a good job. You don't keep people riveted in their seats with giant waves of cortisol and dopamine jolting through their brains with that. So some of it is just the kind of crazy showmanship that is meant to keep people angry and staring at the television until their eyeballs are dry. Some of this, though, I think you can't underestimate the degree to which people like Tucker Carlson hate a cultural establishment of which they wanted to be a part and yet were rejected. And so it's almost like the kind of churlish, I'll get even with you approach is is to side with someone like Putin. That'll show those bastards at CNN and MSNBC who fired me what's what, you know, watch what I'll do now. But there is also a cultural affinity with some of these people. You know, these are people that say, well, Vladimir Putin, he's a brutal dictator, but this is a guy who really didn't want drag queens to win Eurovision, you know, that they have this kind of juvenile culture warring sense. Here we are in the middle of the biggest war since World War II in Europe, and the right is still going on about woke banks and drag queens. And I think that feeds into that entire thing of saying, look, we just have to take this side. And I thought when you said it's not too much to say it's pro-Putin, it's openly pro-Putin. Yeah. There's not even subtlety about this anymore. I mean, Carlson, as the kind of avatar of this, went years ago from, well, I'm just asking questions. Why shouldn't we side with Russia? Is this really our business? All the way to Zelensky's a gangster and Ukraine's a crazy dictatorship and all of this kind of Kremlin sludge and slime that has made its way from Russian television onto American television because it sells, because it's culturally in sync with people like him believe, and because it's a kind of natural oppositionism to people who really think they are like the plucky gorillas, even though they have the highest rated shows on cable. Yeah. In fact, with that, just because I think these next group of sound bites really confirms what you just said, let's listen to these two-time Trump voters that we talked to for this episode. Because, you know, 
most of them, I think seven out of nine, just in this group in particular, wanted to see the U.S. play a lesser role in world affairs, period. And zero people wanted the U.S. to act as a world leader during global entanglements. So let's listen to them talk about why. We already knew Ukraine was a corrupt country. We've seen it and heard about it throughout the past. Now he's going through and closing churches to any Christians over there. And we're paying the major share of the financial aid to the country. And it's probably going in the front door, right back out the back door. The Ukraine situation is, in a way, a cloak to make Russia and China very powerful together. So Putin's goal is to tag team up with China. And that's his whole push, is to weaken us militarily, to drain us economically. So this aid to Ukraine is a game, if you will. The whole thing is a farce. And it's to weaken us, to, to divert us, our attention, our energy, so that China and Russia can become very powerful and militarily crush us. Because there's no money that is filtering into our military. That's done on purpose by this current administration. It makes me really nervous. They don't care. They think that borders are bad in the United States, but they want to send money to another country for borders. Yeah. And how about the train spill too, right? The train spill happens and, and Biden's like, hey, let's give money to Ukraine. I'm like, hey, wait a minute. Why don't you just go help all those people? Right, like, right. What is happening? Like, I couldn't even believe that was happening. The media has been pumping all this Putin stuff forever. I could care less about the guy. I mean, when Trump was in office, obviously he respected us. So there was going to be no messing around like what's going on now. But Zelensky, what people don't understand, he is exactly to a T the same guy as Putin is. He still has all the same corruption. He's stealing money from everybody. He's oppressing people. He's the same guy in a different suit. So I was never for that since the beginning. Always been against it. They should not have dime. I don't care if Russia takes it over or not. It's irrelevant to us. We got so many problems here. We need to solve what's going on here. Wow. So, okay. Now, I got to say, there's two things. One is you can just see how much the whole of right wing media is just filtering through people. I never heard this last year the idea that Ukraine was a corrupt country. And one of those women seemed to be suggesting that we were diverting the money to Ukraine and that that was like the goal of Russia and China I know. so that they could like drain us of our money and then crush us. And we're too stupid to know that, I guess. I had you watch the one group, but this has been coming up over and over and over again. And we don't ask a ton about foreign policy, but we often just ask people, hey, what do you think about what's happening in Ukraine? And we've just seen it evolve over time. And the number one thing that comes up is this idea of we've got too many problems here. We've got a border issue. You know, we've got an education issue. We're not taking care of our own people. And deep in that kind of analysis is really the America first Trump idea. Yeah, I was going to say, Sarah, I mean, go ahead. You know, as a veteran of 80s politics, I have to tell you, this is very much a horseshoe moment because as I was listening to this, oh, the train spill and we've got pro these were the arguments of the American left, mm -hmm. the far American left. Why are we sending money to NATO and, you know, to fight the Soviet Union that has no interest in us? If we just leave them alone and Reagan's going to take all that money from our schools and our towns. And I mean, I'm listening to this and I'm saying, holy crap, this is 1984 all over again, but from the far left. And it really proves the horseshoe theory that if you just go far enough to the right, you will come around to the left and vice versa. If you go far enough to the left, you will sound like a rightist. And I took a couple of notes while that clip was going. By the way, of all the things people believe, this was also, I don't know if you'll play this clip, but there were at least two people in there who think we've been in Afghanistan for 30 years, Yeah, which is off by a full decade. Mm -hmm. And it was twice, two people, 30 years is just too long. Yes, I agree. Good thing we weren't there for 30 years. But there is that confidence again. These are things everybody knows. Everybody knows they're shutting down churches. Everybody knows the money is going out the back door. 
everybody knows that they're trying to drain us again, not even bothering to read the news that, that this tiny fraction of American weapons and aid has now been used by the Ukrainians to destroy like the bulk of the Russian armed forces at this point. But glued to cable, glued to internet newsletters, glued to YouTube. And I don't know how you break through that. I think the reason you didn't see it when the war broke out is that there was just so much video and so much obvious shock at what Putin had done that it was really hard to just kind of stick your head in the sand. And it took a while for all of the kind of American propagandists to regroup. You know that I, and I, I'll get off this particular soapbox, but you know from watching the way I interact with people on social media, I'm all for putting everything that happens, putting it on blast. I would love to take nothing but an hour of RT the way Julia Davis does and show these Russians saying, we should nuke Ukraine. We should nuke Georgia. We should destroy London. We should attack the Americans, you know, and just put it on there all night. Because, and I keep thinking this, watching these focus groups, is that if you walked in there and said, look, here's what the Russians are doing. Here's what they said. You'd get, well, I don't know that. I didn't see that. Right. They have this amazing ability with that huge epistemological surety to say, well, I don't think that's happening. That's not what I know. And I don't know how you break through that. Yeah. Well, you know, this comes down to the theory that I talk about all the time, which is the Republican triangle of doom, which is the toxic and symbiotic relationship between the right wing infotainment media, the politicians and the voters. And this to me is a perfect example of how it works and how they sort of mutually enforce to push people more and more into a radical place. See, when I heard people a year ago, I, you know, actually one of my shticks that I can't let go of is the fact that like, I like people. I think that they're good generally. And I think this was is on- your first mistake. I know, I know, I know, I know. You and I don't <laughs> agree on this. But like, here's the thing, like last year when I was listening to them talk about Ukraine, their instincts were all correct. It was to root for Ukraine. You know, the, you heard the woman in the first clip talk about the old lady that was giving the Russian soldiers the sunflower seeds so that when they were killed, uh, sunflowers grow in their place. And people loved that. They thought it was badass. Ukraines were on the side of righteousness. And then you watch the right wing media. And I think for, for some of the reasons you say about uh, you can't say anything nice about Joe Biden. So basically some of it's just negative polarity or negative polarization. We got to be against Joe Biden. And so we're going to side against all his foreign policy decisions to support Ukraine. And so now we're sort of weirdly pro-Russia. But you can just see how their instincts were right, these people. And it was the right-wing media working on them over this yeah. past year that has now brought them to this place. And I think sometimes – I have a more charitable view maybe than you do to some degree because like they didn't come up with that stuff on their own. Like there's a poisonous right-wing infotainment media that is feeding it to them yes. to keep them mad, as you say. But, but, and and let me just say, all joking aside, I am actually, I'm a humanist and I'm just less optimistic than you are. Neither of us can begin to match our friend Jonathan last, who, um, <laughs> you know, is the prince of darkness. So in the in the big scheme of things, I'm somewhere slightly more optimistic than Jonathan, definitely less optimistic than you. But he, here's what I think is going on that you're missing about this. Yes, people, their natural instinct at that moment, because it's interesting and it's exciting and it's got a moral clarity to it. And so they kind of bandwagon onto that. But I think one of the things I saw reviewing the focus group footage is that this is part of an overall American thing, which is that you can see that these are folks that have a kind of restless dissatisfaction in general, and they're looking to stick that onto something. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That, I do. Yeah, I'll put up with high gas prices. And then it's like, what the fuck? I hate gas prices now. You know, it's like it, something goes by and they say, yes, that's the thing I'm mad about. Oh, this new thing. That's it. You know, that's the thing that I'm really mad about. And the problem is that I think, you know, and I've been more and more inclined. I'm just going to plug my book here and say, ever since I wrote Our Own Worst Enemy, I've been more and more inclined to say this is part of just a kind of spiritual and civic emptiness that people are looking to blame on something. And so they kind of go, and it's happening on to people on the left as well, 
but the American right in particular, because of their location, because of their declining demographics, their rural location, yep. et cetera, they're saying, I am very unhappy with the world and somebody or something is to blame. So let's see. You know what it is? It's that weird guy in Ukraine who's just like Putin because everybody sucks. It's, you know, if only Joe Biden wasn't jungled up with the oil companies, he'd open up the strategic reserve and gas would be a buck a gallon again. That kind of stuff. And I think, again, as you point out so cogently, there isn't a media, politics, entertainment ecosystem that says, hey, we understand that feeling you have. We will enable that. We will give you all the rationalizations you need. And all you have to do is sit your ass in that chair for two or three hours a night and buy pillows. Yeah. This is why I, when I think about who I blame, you know, this is me and JBL's most fundamental disagreement. My Jonathan Last, who you bring up, my best friend and podcast partner, like Tucker Carlson knows better. The Fox News brass knows better. We know that they lie. He doesn't care. No, I know he, he doesn't knows, care. I know but- he doesn't care. But that, that's my point is I guess that's who I reserve just my ire for, especially because I've read your book and I thought your book was great. But the the thing, you know, I see it in people and there's a loneliness yes. now. And a lot of these voters are older and the world, even though it feels like it's gotten closer with social media or whatever, they are just more and more isolated and they are looking for community and they find community in all being mad together right. about the ways in which the world has sort of done them wrong and their grievance and somebody else is getting this or that. And I, I guess that's why I just always sort of feel compassion. Like it sounds like a terrible life to sit in a chair and watch Tucker Carlson and just be mad. Okay, but I, I – I will try and uh, mediate between you and Jonathan because I think you're Mm -hmm. both right. But on the other hand, as old school conservatives, all three of us, whatever happened to human agency? Yeah, no, personal responsibility. I agree. It's another one of those big shifts in the party. Agree, agree, agree. When I think of people who sit there and just stick that electrode in their neck every night, right? This kind of comes back to an argument like about, say, drug abuse, right? They say, this is terrible. These people are addicted to this thing that's killing them. And you get some people who do the tough love stuff of saying, well, they should just say no. You know, you get the Nancy Reagan, just say no. Mm -hmm. And that's the equivalent of, you know, me and Jonathan saying, here's an idea. Turn the goddamn television off. Change the channel. But as you point out, this is also a sense of community. Mm Mm-hmm. I had, a, I had an argument with an old friend from my hometown. I went back and he was just spewing all this nonsense. And I said, where are you getting this? And he said, Hannity, he's the man. And you could see that like my old buddy, he was like, Sean Hannity was his new pal. Yeah. You know, like this is the guy, he works in the restaurant business. He works long hours, his TV's on at night. And Sean Hannity is his pal. Um. I've talked about other friends from from my hometown and from school that I've had these disagreements, my, my late brother. But in this case, I said, look, you once said I was your smartest friend. And I said, you can believe me or you can believe Sean Hannity. And you could see him kind of going, oh, wow, I don't see you very often. You know, like in his head, I think he's like, I don't see <laughs> I you see very Sean often. every night. <laughs> I see Sean every, exactly, Sarah. That's exactly, I see Sean every night. And, you know, I see you, you know, at Christmas and Easter. And, and it was really disturbing. And I, again, If we offload any responsibility for this to just say, look, this candy, this crack that these guys are selling is just too good. The blue meth that they're selling is just too good. Then we really have to give up on democracy because the answer to that is paternalism to say, okay, these people simply have no human agency. They're not capable of making their own decisions. You cannot inform them. And anytime you put on a bunch of carny barkers, they're just going to walk up and hand over their money. I actually don't believe that about the American public. I think that a little bit of that tough love, a little bit of that stigma, I, I would like to bring back stigma because. That conversation, I said, I'm sorry, but, you know, you're rotting your brain watching Fox News. And my buddy was like, wow, you know, that's, dude, harsh. (laughs) So, you know, I think I think that can be recovered. But I on on this sense, I'm like with Jonathan that people want this and they're doing it voluntarily. And that says something terrible about them. But with you, I agree. They are lonely. Even though we are a closer society because of the internet, that closeness is artificial. Yeah. It's all plastic. It's electronic closeness, but it's not actually the shaking hands with another human being. 
and looking into their eyes and having a, a conversation. And so these people are terribly lonely. They're scared because they think, as one of my friends once said, they think they're on the wrong side of the evolutionary roller coaster yep. in terms of where their towns and uh, way of life are going. But I'm sorry, but that's when I go back to being a hard learner. I'm saying, I'm sorry. I know you're scared. I understand change is scary, but that's not an excuse for siding with psychopaths, seditionists, insurrectionists, and the goddamn Kremlin. Okay. Not okay. So, all right. So, okay. You wrote a couple of weeks ago about the candidates' responses to Tucker Carlson's questionnaire, right. right? And we read those statements to our present day group, and they, unsurprisingly, they liked a lot more of the isolationist policy statements from Trump and DeSantis a lot better than those from Mike Pence, Nikki Haley, and Chris Christie. Here's the thing. So it's not just the media and that the people believe the media, right? What we saw – now, I know that there's been a cleanup on aisle 2024 here for Ron DeSantis. <laughs> he's trying to walk back a little bit of what he said. But like the toxic and symbiotic relationship between the voters, the elected officials, and the right-wing infotainment media, like DeSantis absolutely knows better. And he has decided to call it a territorial dispute. He's following the voters, right? He's allowing the right-wing infotainment media who has poisoned the minds of these voters, and now he needs them to vote for him. So he is now saying that he wants to be more isolationist. This is just a territorial skirmish that the U.S. doesn't have any vital national interest in it. And what does that do? It creates another layer of people who also would know better or who would be inclined toward taking a harder stance against Russia. And it turns them into people who are like, well, I'm a DeSantis supporter. And the two main people who represent the Republican Party now say that it doesn't matter to us. We should just stay out. That has an impact, right? Yeah, and so, I, I, but I think part of it is that they're following Trump. I mean, look, I really believe that at this point, the Republicans, and I've said this many times, they are a post-policy. They're not even a party. They are a movement. They're a post-policy movement. If Trump came out tomorrow and said, you know, I've been thinking about it, Putin, bad guy, accordion hands start flying, right? Putin's a bad guy. We've got to take him out. Uh, I'll take this guy down. They'd be all in. I mean, I really think we've proven over five years that Donald Trump can whipsaw back and forth 180 degrees and people go with him simply because that is their, you know, that loneliness again. It's like, well, this is my tribe. Trump is my big daddy. And if big daddy says, we're going to do it this way, we're going to do it this way. And proof of that is look at the way he has turned on a dime about DeSantis and about things like COVID responses. I mean, Trump sounds like Fauci at this point, right? <laughs> you know, it's like Florida had this terrible COVID response and all these people died and he shut down things and then he didn't and he opened them and, he, and people are going, yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, you, you guys have the, the historical memory of a tree squirrel. <laughs> but, and I think that's simply because of kind of a cultish identification. So I think that's a big part of it. I think DeSantis is a candidate of the donor class. When he stepped on that rake about, oh, it's territorial dispute, I assume that he got angry phone calls from people saying, what the hell are you talking about? And so he had to clean this up. Even before he tried that, DeSantis is in free fall. Trump gives people this moral theater, right? DeSantis bad, me good. Ukraine, terrible. Putin, okay. You know, back and forth. And they go, okay. These are, again, people that are adrift and looking for somebody to latch on to and to hang that vague sense of emptiness and frustration on. And I think that that's what's going on here. Okay. Uh, I'm going to disagree that DeSantis is in free fall. I think that is too strong a statement. I, I want to let that just hang Fair out there, enough. in my opinion. Fair but, enough. But, okay. but, but where is he now? He's like, he went from like neck and neck to like 27%. There were two polls this week, Monmouth and then Morning Consult, that both saw a slide for DeSantis and Trump sort of picking up steam. And that is on top of Nate Cohn had done this aggregation of the polls where he compared where Trump was in the same poll. So he took a bunch of the same polls and Trump had gained about a net four points and DeSantis okay, had lost fair. about a net four points. So I think free fall is too strong, but I do I think that you're right. I think that you're right that DeSantis has had a bad couple of weeks here as he's kind of put his toe in the water of really getting into it. And we see people kind of looking at Trump and still liking that show somewhat. So that's true. But here's here's so I set up the Republican Triangle of Doom and I knew you and I were going to argue about this and the culpability of the voters <laughs> because I just blame the two – the, the politicians and the right-wing infotainment media, to me, are the really pernicious side. And, and I want to go to bat for the voters one more time here, which is one of the reasons I think that the Republican Party has turned against its more hawkish ways is because of Iraq and Afghanistan, right? It's soured the GOP base. And I want to play 
a telling snippet from the February 2016 debate where Donald Trump went after the Iraq war head on. It took Jeb Bush, if you remember at the beginning of his announcement, when he announced for president, took him five days. He went back. It was a mistake. It wasn't a mistake. It took him five days before his people told him what to say. And he ultimately said it was a mistake. The war in Iraq, we spent $2 trillion, thousands of lives. We don't even have it. Iran is taking over Iraq with the second largest oil reserves in the world. Obviously, it was a mistake. So George Bush made a mistake. We so, can make mistakes, but that one was a beauty. We should have never been in Iraq. We have destabilized right. the Middle East. But so you, so I mean, so, so you still think he should be impeached? I think it's my turn, isn't it? You do whatever you want. You call it whatever you want. I want to tell you, they lied. Okay. They said there were weapons of mass destruction. There were none, and they knew there were none. There were no weapons of all mass right. destruction. Okay. Yeah, all right. All right. Now here's the thing. At the time. I remember watching this and being like, the Republican voters aren't going to go for this. And that was one of the early indications of just how much I didn't understand what was going on with Republican base voters, because he was talking in a language that they agreed with. Like, you guys lied about this. This is wrong. I mean, it was one of the reasons nobody wanted Jeb Bush. And I don't think any of us knew that. But do you remember that period of time? Yeah. Did you see it going sideways then? Or what did you think? You know, this is the classic time where all of us on the on the right look back and say, which was the moment you thought was going to kill him? You know, and I thought it was the John McCain sure. thing. So by this point, I figured he could just drop his pants and start ranting in Russian and it wouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. But re again, what really strikes me listening to that clip then and now, I'm like, wow. So Donald Trump is basically Dennis Kucinich now. Yeah. It's one thing to say. Yeah, the Iraq war, poorly executed, a screw up, a good attempt by a misguided administration. But, you know, among Republicans, and I don't expect Democrats to talk that way, but certainly among Republicans, that's what you would have expected. And instead, it's like, wow, when did Ralph Nader wander into this debate? And again, I think the reason he got away with it was not because of anything about Iraq specifically, with the possible exception that a lot of military families in the Republican Party, and, and I'm sure a lot of the people who were there or their families or new people, they were the people who bore the burden. So let's yeah. with that caveat aside that perhaps that resonated with them. But nonetheless, I think for a lot of people, the real code underneath what Trump was saying is those smarty pantses far away made decisions that you didn't understand and didn't want to be involved in. And I'm running against an establishment. Of course, now I come back to my culpability of the voters issue. Trump is standing there saying, these people did something, and in my mind, I'm adding that you all consistently, especially Republicans, that you all consistently supported, that you were all pretty good with. You know, one of the most controversial things I wrote in the last year was when I basically blamed Afghanistan on us, on the people. How much effect did Afghanistan ever have on an election after 2002? Congressional, presidential, nothing. It wasn't there. People say, oh, Afghanistan, we got to, but, you know, but gas prices. And I mean, it just wasn't there. And all of a sudden, they watched Trump and they got a signal about what to be mad about. They said, yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's what I'm mad I about. I'm mad about I do not agree with this. I do not agree with this. I think he was tapping into something that existed, which was a disillusionment, you know, people being exhausted by being at war for, at that time, it had been a long time. Uh, I'm pushing back there, Sarah. People were not at war. The U.S. military they, that's was at war. True. They, Take your point that, like, they were didn't have to engage day to day, but, like, whenever somebody would get reminded, they would be like, why are we still doing this? Well, OK, why are we still doing this? Then, you know, you're going to vote for Barack Obama. He's going to do a full pullout. Oh, wait, if he does that, he's a coward. So he's not going to do it. Well, I can't believe we're still there. OK, well, we'll elect Trump. He's going to get us out of there. Well, we can't just get out of there. You know, I mean, the problem was that the American public was Goldilocks about this from the beginning. Get us in there and do good stuff. And if you pull out, you're a complete weenie. Even now, love or hate Biden, pulling out of Afghanistan, the way he did it, it was a complete mess. And I wrote a piece at the time saying this was a mess. On the other hand, it was what people wanted him to do. It, you know, if you listen to these groups and if you look at the polling, get us out of Afghanistan. 
But what they really meant was get us out of Afghanistan in a completely cost-free, non-painful way that doesn't leave anything in the hands of the bad guys. That's not a real option. That's not the real world. That's magical thinking. And what's the new line on Joe Biden? That he's a wuss, that he's weak, that he doesn't fight back. This is an argument you cannot win. I wrote a piece about the Iraq war two days ago, and people mostly from the left have been bombarding me. But I keep pointing out, okay, the war went sour. What was the response of the American people? They reelected George W. Bush with 3.3 million extra votes. At some point, you have to just step back and say, I understand your anger about this issue, but what is it that you wanted your government to do? And how did you express that through voting? And I'll just, I'll draw one international parallel here. Oh, Brexit. You know, we've never wanted to be in the European Union. Okay. But you elected government after government after government that kept you in the European Union, and you never really insisted on it. And you finally did it by stumbling into a referendum that was a razor sharp thing. And now you're full of regret. And now you just want somebody to blame. And I feel very strongly if Bush had said, as I'm leaving office, I'm firing Rumsfeld, we're going to get out of this, you know, we're going to draw down. But the American public didn't want to do that. They kept saying, well, as long as it's not dangerous. Well, it is dangerous. Foreign yeah, policy is dangerous. And they didn't want to hear that, Sarah. They didn't want to hear about costs. So I think that, that might be true to some degree that they did want to get out of Afghanistan with a lot fewer casualties and not feeling like we were abandoning. I, I, it was a horrible thing to watch. And right, yes. and people didn't didn't a, want that on there. As it was always going to be, no matter who but, did but it. But here's the thing where I think you know a lot about foreign policy. I'm like slightly more sympathetic to them because I have always been somebody who like just cares more about domestic policy than foreign policy. And I might know more than the average voter, but like, I just think you come from a perspective where you know all of this stuff, like you're an expert in it. They don't know any of this stuff. And like, where are they supposed to learn about it? They're going to learn about it from, because they have family members who are in the military. You you hear this in the groups. I, I'm going to, I'm going to get to the groups here where some people who had perspective on it had it because either their kid was in the military or they themselves had served in the military. Otherwise, they're relying on people that they trust to tell them things. And I think that it is- No, that's where I disagree. I'm sorry to interrupt. That's okay. Go ahead. Do, do, no, 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 no. Go ahead. So what I was going to say here, the thing that occurred to me as you were, you were saying this, there is a person in your focus group I kind of admired because she's like you on this. She said, look, I don't know a lot about this stuff. At one point, your, your host said, who feels you know that, that they don't know enough about these issues to reach really firm conclusions? One person raises her hand. One. And you, to your credit, you're saying, look, I'm an informed voter, but I really don't know a lot about this stuff. The rest of those people in these focus groups are like, well, of course, it's because we're just exporting heroin to get money for black ops. <laughs> somebody did that say came that. Up. that no, I know. Somebody did say that. And I'm like, OK, I'm sorry, but there has to be at least a natural curiosity to say, OK, what actually is happening? Why are we there? And the thing that flashed through my mind some years ago, I was on a panel with Dan Balls from the Washington Post, and a guy stood up in the audience and he said, why don't you guys in the press write more explainers about stuff? And Dan, very quietly, without missing me, he said, we do. You don't read them. Yeah. And so if it's not on TV and it's not fun and interesting and engaging and dramatic and visual, then people just tune it out. When the Washington Post did that book on the secret history of Afghanistan, my head kind of exploded because as I was reading all this stuff, I'm like, if you had been reading a newspaper for 10 years, you already knew almost all of this stuff. And what, what they're really rebelling against is not more information. It's information that is boring. Let me tell you what I always tell everybody, you know, listening out there, government and even foreign policy is boring. Yeah. It's dull. And people have gotten used to the idea that nothing should be boring. And so they say, well, I know what's going on. We're selling heroin to fund black ops. I know what's going on. We're in bed with a, you know, with a Nazi dictator who's a Jew. I'm in this Marvel Comics universe where, you know, everybody's an interesting weirdo villain. And yes, I know a lot about foreign policy, but I don't, as a moral issue, I don't have a huge amount of certainty about some of these things. I mean, I'm 20 years later, I just wrote a piece kind of saying, geez, you know, I thought the Iraq war was the right thing to do, but my God, we screwed it up and people got killed, you know, for nothing. Um, I, you know what I, 
<laughs> I know we got to get to another clip, but I was watching this and I've done this impression before, but it struck me that you had a bunch of people who all reminded me of Cliff Clavin yeah. from Cheers, the mailman from Cheers. Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, it's a known fact, you see, that, uh, you know, we've been in Afghanistan for 30 years uh, because we're uh, moving the tide. And, uh, and I thought to myself, holy shit, if you're a candidate for office, how do you even begin to engage these people? And I don't know. All right. So let's let's see how spot on your impression there is and listen <laughs> to these guys talk about why they've shifted, why they're disillusioned about foreign policy. The turning point was when I started to ask questions and I was being demonized for asking questions. And that was the turning point when it was like, oh, well, why did we do X, Y, Z, ABC? Or, you know, why weren't there plane parts in front of the Pentagon? You know, like various little things like that. And then all of a sudden, you know, it started arguments and things. And I thought, whoa, arguments. I was just asking a question. I mean, if it's all true, then where's the answer? Anyway, that was a big turning point for me that got me down this road of questioning everything. Like, oh, my gosh, I don't even know what to believe anymore. And then we find out that we got into Iraq based on all these lies. And it's like, wow, now what do we believe? I don't know. I know bin Laden did what he did and everything, but... There's not one single American life I would trade for that idiot. So right. all, all those Americans that died pursuing that idiot, we could have done it with drones. I mean, there's a million ways we could have handled all that differently. And uh, it just sickens me that all those kids died for nothing. They entered Afghanistan without having any real exit plan. Yeah. You know, I got deployed during the first Gulf War. We knew when we went in, we were going to do one thing, free Kuwait, and then we're going to go home. And that's what we did. The plan was in place. Afghanistan, they went in blindly thinking they were going to convert a whole country to think American, had no plans on how to get out. And we see the results of that 30 years later. I have a son whose first day in the Army was 9-11 and was struggling a bit in college. So we felt like it was a good thing. And I went from thinking that he was joining the military to straighten him up to thinking you have a really smart man that's going to go in and help our country. So I was totally loyal to it. 10 years later, when I had a son come out broken and the military was not helping him and I see a broken son at 42 and he trusts no one and does not believe in what he did, it's devastated our family. So yeah, we feel betrayed in the whole situation, but we thought we were doing the right thing at the time. Okay. So we've got, <sighs> we, we, listen, so, so just, we did, we did four people there. So one of them, I'm pretty sure that first guy, when he was just asking questions, I think he meant about 9-11 and whether or not it happened because there weren't plane parts in front of the Pentagon. Yeah. Uh, so we got one 9-11 conspiracy guy. Uh, and the other guy didn't think we should get bin Laden. Laden's just an idiot. And then the third one was uh, talking about Afghanistan, and we've been there for 30 years. But this fourth one, this is somebody who whose son was in the military and who had an experience that has shattered him. We had a piece by Will Selber, who we love over at The Bulwark, talking about what it was like in Afghanistan. It was just an incredibly shattering piece. So I guess there's this part of me that says, I hear a woman like that, and I think – I don't know. I'm not sure we did enough as a culture or that our elected officials did enough to help people understand what the cost was going to be and to explain why it's worth it. Wow. Right? I came away from that differently. All right, and that's the second time around. I mean, I watched it last night and, um, you know, went through it again with you today. First, the first thing that struck me about the 9-11 guy, he said, well, I was demonized. Who demonized you? Probably anybody he talked to about 9-11 being an inside job. Maybe demonized was like people going, What? Or, I suspect, spent a lot of time on internet chat rooms, yeah, which is where people really probably roughed him up. And so now he thinks that the whole government, that everything, democracy is bad, okay, because I asked about plane parts in front of the Pentagon where hundreds of people died and people got mad at me. The uh, guy who said, well, I wouldn't have given one life to get bin Laden. Well, I'm sorry, but your millions of your fellow citizens demanded it of your government that bin Laden be found and killed, right? Imagine saying right after 9-11 and in those first five or six years, hey, 
one American soldier isn't worth getting bin Laden. Guy's a jerk. Let him go. There was literally almost no one, again, out of the Kucinich wing, or, you know, I mean, maybe I'm being unfair to poor Dennis Kucinich, but there was nobody in America was making that case. That's an easy thing to say 20 years later, because it sounds like righteous anger. But I would really like to know if that guy was saying that in 2002. Um, the no plan for getting out of Afghanistan. Well, you know, everybody's a military strategist. Again, you know, Bush said, we're going to eradicate Afghanistan as a source of terrorist threats, which for 20 years, and uh, my argument about this at the end of the occupation was, hey, for 20 years, there wasn't another 9-11. For 20 years, there were no more terrorist threats coming out of Afghanistan. That's what you wanted, you know, but the last one, this is where we really diverge. The thing I heard that this uh, woman's son who apparently she said he served 10 years. Yeah. She said 10 years later when I had a son come out broken and the military was not helping him. And on that, I think, you know, to criticize the fact that we don't help veterans enough in general in this country is absolutely right. And it's one of the really shameful things. We glorify veterans as Spartans when they're going in and then we tend to forget about them when they're coming out. And I think that's perfectly legitimate. But I, the idea that somehow all of American foreign policy is a failure because my son, to me, that resonated with this thing we've been talking about all morning, which is I have things in my life that have gone wrong and I'm going to hang these on giant issues of policy now. If the guy was in the military 10 years, came out broken, then the government should have helped him. I don't know where he served. I don't know if he was in combat. Don't know what he did. But that becomes this kind of tragic personal story that somehow gets woven into a larger political narrative. All right. I think that's a totally fair point you're making in response to that. And I understand why you would hear that and that. And you're right. There is some of that in there. I guess this is my question to you. It's the final one, Mm -hmm. which is, okay. so you think a lot of the problem here is with the voters, that a lot of this responsibility lies with them. I know I, I read something you wrote where you said something like, you know, Iraq was a terrible mistake, but it would be another mistake to draw the single-minded conclusion, much as we did after Vietnam, that everything everywhere will forever be another Iraq. But like, I've listened to these voters on all kinds of issues, and the the absence of trust, like the extent to which trust has just dissolved, and they don't trust any institutions, and they basically only trust their peers who sort of agree with them, and I guess Tucker Carlson to some degree. Like, what do we do? What is the solution if if there's going to be Tucker Carlson's and an entire infotainment media system and politicians who know better are going to pander to them and tell them like, yes, let's have this isolationist foreign policy. Like, what do we do to create a more responsible, civic commitment to what America stands for circa 1980? Boy, I don't know. Um, I think some of this is not fixable. On this, I'm kind of you know, in the pessimist camp, and that particularly people my age, right, late 50s, early 60s, they've gone down this rabbit hole, and they're not coming back. I don't know who was in favor of Trump in 1999, okay? <laughs> so there's always going to be those folks. But I think some of it has to do with the political class being willing to maybe even lose elections if it means speaking truth to the public. And being more stoked. You know, we're talking about 1980, and um, I don't know if you remember the movie Roger and Me, right? Michael Moore, the only good movie Michael Moore ever made, where he's trying to like track down the head of General Motors and and chew him out about closing a factory in Michigan. And there was a part where Reagan was in it, and someone said, Well, what can we do? You know, we're in Flint, Michigan, and Reagan was like, "Uh, uh, You could move. (laughs) You know, and I thought, you know, people go, Ronald Reagan, you know, he pandered to the white working class. I mean, imagine being a political leader now and saying this coal town you're living in in Kentucky or wherever, it's not coming back. You need to move. Both McCain and Obama did that, you know, standing in front of factories and saying these are not going to reopen. Whatever these were, that's not going to be that again. And man, people just didn't want to hear that. But I think if leaders are going to lead, then they have to tell the truth. You can't be an Elise Stefanik and talking about investigating the DA and you know, Rand Paul, we're going to put Alvin Bragg in jail. You have to be able to step forward and say, look, I'm going to say things. You may not like them. And if you don't want to vote for me, then I understand. But at least it's got to be part of the public discussion. And we just have a class of people that particularly in the Republican Party who have decided that they were made for bigger and better things. And if lying to people is how they stay on television or stay 
in Washington and never having to, you know, live in rural Indiana or Pennsylvania, then that's what they're going to do. And I don't know how you overcome that other than simply voting them out of office enough times until somebody kind of hits that right formula. But I'm not, I mean, Sarah, I got to be honest, I'm not optimistic. Well, I got to tell you, for all of our disagreements, it sounds like you and I do agree that the only way out of this is through leadership, which has always been my yes. bag. The moral crumbling of the leadership in the Republican Party has been, to me, the is the main thing that's gone wrong. Like, there's lots of other things. There's the media. There's but like the way that people and and Ron DeSantis is a perfect example of that right now. People who know better, who had ideals, just dropped them so that they could yes. fall in favor. Like to me, that is the fundamental problem. The only way out of it is for somebody to say, "I'm going to tell you the truth." And people think Donald Trump is telling them the truth. It's what's so funny. I hear it in the groups all the time. They'll be like, yeah, I know Donald Trump, like he lies about stuff, but like he's telling the truth because people felt like he talked to them like they mattered and like they could understand them and not just talking points. Somebody is going to have to emerge that is willing to tell voters the truth and has the sort of charisma and smarts and ability that they believe them. That's it. That's the only way we're going to get out of this. I think you're absolutely right that this abject moral cowardice and collapse of leadership on the part of the Republicans. We need to say to them, you know better, but I, I just think we have to add to that, turning to the voters as well and say, and so do you. Deep down, you know better than this. You are better people than this. And you used to be, and you can be again. Tom Nichols, thank you so much for joining us. Thank and you, thanks Sarah. to all of you for listening to the Focus Group podcast. Please go rate and subscribe over wherever you listen to your podcasts. This is going to be our last episode for this season. We're just going to take a couple months hiatus here until we get deeper into the primary. I wasn't even going to do this episode. We were going to end on the culture wars, but I just kept hearing so much Ukraine stuff. I really wanted to make you listen, Tom, to what these voters were saying. So I appreciate you doing this sort of bonus episode with me. And uh, I will let everybody know when we're back probably around May or June. See ya.